Thank you so much for your kind attendance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for very much, uh, Dr. Moon. So we are behind the schedule. So please go to the lobby uh, section uh, and then you know the, there are some questions and then uh, Dr. Moon can answer the questions from the audience. So our next speaker, I will introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Go, Yun Go. So Dr. Yun uh, uh, Go is a professor of otorhinolaryngology and thyroid cancer clinic at Yonsei University uh, College of Medicine, Seoul, Korea. He is also director of international affairs at the Korean Society of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, and also chair of the international affairs at the Korean Society of Head and Neck Surgery. So he has a substantial contribution in developing minimally invasive head and neck surgery and thyroid surgery with retroauricular approach. Uh, he has written more than 100 articles and book chapters regarding uh, endoscopic and robotic thyroid and head and neck surgery. So today he's going to give a talk about the future of head and neck robotic surgery. So uh, please Dr. Go. Okay, thank you, Professor Ba. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to uh, this kind of wonderful uh, symposium. So today I'm going to talk about future uh, technology and future robotic head and neck surgery. So nothing to disclose uh, in this topic. Uh, let me start. Uh, my talk with uh, introducing uh, the, a kind of uh, scenario of future the head and neck cancer management. Uh, let's imagine now is the 20 years later, the so in 2030. So this patient uh, will visit my clinic in 2030. So 30 years old, the young female patient. Uh, will visit my clinic uh, with, uh, harboring the left side ulceration and tongue mass. So before taking the tongue biopsy sample, uh, we uh, could apply, we, we can apply the molecular imaging, pulp imaging technique with the uh, uh, autoprolence. So before uh, receiving permanent pathology, we could uh, discriminate this is a uh, uh, oral tongue cancer, squamous carcinoma. Also on the same day, uh, uh, neck MRI scan and PET-CT scan will be taken and our radiologist uh, will uh, conclude the diagnosis based on artificial intelligence. So this lady uh, has a tongue cancer, clinically T3 and 0 M0. So uh, I will e explain to the patient and her family. So we're gonna take out the primary tongue tumor. Also, we're gonna uh, conduct elective neck dissection, but uh, retroregular neck dissection with a new uh, technology like this. So uh, in this case, uh, we may use, we will use a new Korean surgical robot uh, flexible robot, K-flex robot, so we can do uh, successfully dissection of uh, level one, two, and three. During neck dissection, we can do we can do molecular imaging technology to discriminate it, where is the uh, metastatic lymph node and where is the normal lymph node. Uh, bearing uh, area. After finishing neck dissection, uh, we have to do the primary tumor dissection, but uh, this time uh, we can use eye knife. Eye knife is uh, discriminate uh, healthy tissue from the pre-malignant or overt malignant 
uh, tongue cancer with high accuracy. And this eye knife uh, can improve oncology outcome with the general surgical margin without the sending pathology uh, to see the frozen uh, uh, pathology. So after taking out tumor, before taking out tumor, we can simulate and pre-op uh, planning. So we can make the 3D printing like this. And then we have to, we can decide how much normal tongue tissue would be resected during surgery. And then we can plan uh, to reconstruct the surgical defect with ALT pre-plan. This is a surgical outcome. So nobody noticed her operation history. So only retroauricular, postauricular uh, skin region would be visible. So most of patients, this lady would be happy with surgical outcome and oncological safety. And also uh, in future, so precision medicine technology uh, with the genetic profile, we may decide the whether post-op adjuvant therapy would be needed or not. Unfortunately, this scenario is not today. So some of the technology cannot be accomplished in this day, but I hope in 2030, in our practice, uh, most of the technology would be accomplished very safely and successfully, we hope. We are the surgeon and the quite near future, we must cope with untacked error. Everybody knows the, the error of before Corona is quite different from that of after Corona. So we have to prepare. So probably I believe sort of technology, modern technology and uh, flexible robotic system, artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, big data analysis and molecular imaging, including advanced imaging and deep learning and machine learning and virtual reality and augmented reality will be used in a single robotic system. Let me introduce another example. Uh, she have visit my clinic, has visited my clinic uh, harboring the right side protein tumor. Outside finding the aspiration biopsy, uh, suspect the root out facial of shibanoma. But based on pre-op MRI imaging, our radiologist told me, you don't need to worry about facial lobe shibanoma. Obviously, this kind of tumor would be pleomorphic adenoma arising from protein gland. So we plan to perform protein surgery using Da Vinci single pole system, but we don't need to use the conventional player, modified player incision only post-auricular incision would be needed. This is a surgical video, the same patient. So this is the facial lobe trunk. Right side, the protein gland is uh, dissected with the preserving facial lobe branch. So very interesting, but we already uh, expect the deep lobe origin uh, primary adenoma. So even during surgery, I didn't suspect any evidence of neurogenic tumor or a shibanoma arising from facial nerve. So looks like primary adenoma. This is a facial lobe trunk. Someday in future, we can easily discriminate where is the facial lobe, where is the vein, where is the artery. 
This is a surgical view. Immediate post op, no facial low palsy. So, patient would be happy with that. But permanent pathology, very interestingly, uh, revealed the Shibanoma, but not arising from facial love, probably sympathetic or parasympathetic uh, nerve origin, urinary tumor, uh, quite suspected. Let me introduce another example. So this is the surgical video, how to conduct modified radical dissection with Da Vinci single pole system. So actually in my practice, Da Vinci single pole system is widely used uh, through, through the entire head and neck surgical field. Not only transfer robotic surgery, but the neck dissection, thyroid surgery, and some mandibular gland excision and proctidectomy. So, wide field of head and neck surgery uh, would be uh, done with the with WG Singapore system. It's a quite perfect, uh, currently, currently quite perfect uh, surgical system for head and neck surgeon, I believe. So this is another interesting case. Take a look at this uh, picture together. So most of head and neck surgeon would suspect a carotid body tumor. It's a, a high uh, blood tendency. So we have to be careful. So this case probably I used the uh, Da Vinci XI system, uh, but during surgery, uh, intravenous ICG injection would be utilized to uh, discriminate where is carotid artery, where is the carotid body tumor. So you can see very easily and very clearly. So where is the, the carotid artery and where is the paraganglioma carotid body tumor here? So post op, uh, uh, post -op will show you uh, no uh, uh, disfiguring uh, a scar in her neck. So only post auricular uh, small incision would be would remain. So in some day, uh, for primary tumor resection and lymph node resection, in our practice, uh, commonly intraoperative real-time navigation technology using multimodal bioimaging. So will be uh, accomplished very the smart surgery and very clean and oncologically a safe surgery would be achieved. So this is my uh, imagination and my expectation. In 2030, when we turn on some smart uh, endoscope imaging, we can verify where is the nerve, where is artery, where is vein, even where is a metastatic lymph node. So we can easily uh, differentiate or discriminate it from the normal tissue and any other tubular structure. This is another example, hypopharyngeal cancer arising from piriform sinus. Even uh, piriform sinus cancer would be resected uh, using David Singapore system, but uh, we cannot imagine doing the 3M surgery with the Da Vinci XI system or SI system. The single port system could give us the opportunity, the 3M surgery. So 3M is the, um, can give us the opportunity to uh, make the traction and counter traction force. So very easy dissection would be achieved during surgery. This is a the piriform sinus, medial wall, and anterior and lateral wall uh, could be dissected very uh, safely. But in future, 
we can do uh, the simulate the this kind of surgery uh, before uh, operation operating. So this is a virtual reality technique. Another virtual reality technique, this one. Intuitive Surgical Company, as well as another digital company, already they are making new technology. We can plan the precision surgery. So we can discuss with the patient and family, uh, people operating room. This is another single post surgery. So let me introduce quite the recent surgery. So in the world, uh, quite popular transoral, uh, robotic and endoscopic thyroid surgery. This is uh, my technique. So in my technique, I never use the CO2 gas in supplation. So uh, another big difference from the current transoral, robotic and endoscopic uh, surgery uh, would be the uh, port of uh, incision. I use uh, 3CM single incision and uh, I will use periosteal flap elevation and then I will apply the uh, new design uh, self-retaining retractor like this. And then I type uh, a single post system with the two robotic arm will be uh, dug into the patient mouth. This is a paratracheal lymph node on left side. So left side recurrent pharyngeal love will uh, visualize very clearly, but we needed some experience because of this uh, te technique, uh, only two robotic arms would be available. Uh, so without the third arm, so uh, in the beginning, uh, we have to experience the learning curve. So anyway, after overcoming learning curve, we can uh, practice, we can uh, conduct transoral robotic surgery without gas insufflation. So this is a superior thyroid artery and vein would be ligated. And then I'm looking for recurrent laryngeal nerve from superior to inferior direction. Yeah, eventually, uh, right side recurrent writing gel uh, would be visualized very clearly. So we must control uh, perithyroid better, and we have to identify superior parathyroid gland as well. So far, I could accomplish uh, around uh, 80 cases Gasless transoral robotic thyroid surgery. This is a if left side uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this is a track here. This is a post of view. Uh, very interestingly, uh, without the uh, gas insufflation, 3 dm incision uh, only would be needed, uh, and uh, most of patient would be satisfied with uh, recovery of uh, sensation of submental area. So direct vision, uh, through direct vision, we could visualize the mental of branch here. So when uh, we do uh, make a working space, so we can preserve more easily uh, branch of mental love. So that's the uh, tip of uh, to preserve the mental uh, uh, sensation of mental area, so mental area. This is uh, my conclusion. In 2030, probably 2020, we may utilize all of the technology in our operation theater uh, in the single robotic system. So as a head and neck surgeon, so 20 years later when I was resident, I never expect uh, this kind of robotic surgery will be uh, perform in our practice. But uh, now, uh, 
we are doing very actively a uh, search of uh, lower head and neck surgery, but nobody knows 20 years later what's happening in our operation theater. So as a head and neck surgeon, so we must to prepare our future. We must to reframe our future for next generation uh, uh, head and neck uh, uh, surgeon. That's the, my conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ko. And we have uh, 10 minutes uh, for the discussion. So uh, I think may, may the audience uh, uh, write down uh, questions in Q&A session, and then I will uh, ask him uh, for you. And during waiting any questions, you know, uh, when I was a resident, there was uh, no uh, robotic surgeries. And regarding the neck dissections, there might be different technique for the conventional open uh, neck dissection versus uh, robotic uh, neck dissection. So what is the major difference in doing neck dissection in your uh, ways? Can you tell the difference? Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, very, very important uh, question. Thank you, uh, Professor Park. But in my uh, experience and in my opinion, no difference between robotic neck dissection and conventional neck dissection. So I obviously, I recommend, I do not recommend uh, youngest uh, head and neck surgeon uh, to do robotic surgery first. So I mean, after accumulating experience of conventional neck dissection and conventional head and neck surgery, he or she move on, move to the robotic head and neck surgery. Without experiencing the conventional head and neck surgery, so I don't, I never recommend to do robotic surgery first. So uh, it means the, no difference no difference between robotic and uh, conventional head and neck surgery and neck dissection. Only we are using different instruments mm -hmm. uh, yeah. from two uh, different uh, surgery. Yeah, and I think that there should be lots of difference in quality of life after surgery during, you know, between the, you know, conventional uh, head and neck open type surgery versus uh, robotic surgeries. So what's the major difference uh, in the change, uh, difference of the uh, quality of life? You know, is there any advantage in preserving uh, function or regarding the aesthetic uh, aspect and yes. regarding the yes. quality of life? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Pro Professor Park said so you uh, pointed out the very important thing. So, so actually, we must we must verify the advantage regarding quality of life uh, between two groups. Yeah. So, robotic group and uh, conventional group. But through my experience, very little difference uh, quality of life or the functional uh, 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 aspect. So it means when we started the robotic head and neck surgery, everybody insist and insist on the minimal invasive surgery or scalis surgery. But through my humble experience about the uh, 1,000, uh, uh, 500 robotic head and neck surgery, I totally changed my point. So robotic head and neck surgery should be focused on, I should focus on precision surgery, not mm -hmm. scarlet surgery. So we, we shouldn't focus on cosmetic surgery, limb to access surgery, minimal invasive surgery, and the uh, Limit, uh, yeah. So, most important thing aspect would be precision. 
during operate, operation and uh, after operation. Uh, that's the, my point. I totally changed my concept regarding robotic head and neck surgery. So someday, 10 years later, 20 years later, in our operation theater, so probably we may use the robotic system, but we may use a transverse same incision with the conventional head and neck surgery, but we can use the, the robotic system like a microscope as a autologic surgeon. Yeah, actually I'm pretty, uh, you know, familiar with the microscopic, you know, uh, imaging surgery. So, you know, I, I'm an autologist and using the microscope. So I do not see the tissue directly. I just see the tissue through the microscope. And it looks like the, you know, the robotic surgery is just seems to be same because that you are not seeing the tissue directly. Right. And then, so do you think that the, the precision means that the surgical uh, precision or you, know, you think that the robotic uh, hyperpower uh, means something compared to the conventional open type surgery? So I mean, the, just the, uh, the uh, uh, trauma filtering instrument mm -hmm. and at the same time 3D robotic arm uh, could be utilized during my surgery. This is the another one, uh, uh, another advantage and main advantage would be 10 times magnification and 3D, 3D HD vision. But in future, in the near future, we may utilize molecular imaging to discriminate the metastatic node and normal lymph yeah. node and discriminated uh, neural tissue and vascular uh, tubular structure. Uh, that's the, the uh, one of the point uh, for the precision surgery. Yeah, great. So it, it was very uh, fascinating to see the, you know, the, the image AI can discriminate the, the normal tissue and, you know, pathologic tissue. It was very interesting. So, you know, uh, you. We have a next a few minutes, so I'd like to ask you about the, what you uh, you will do for the future robotic surgeries improvement, and what can you do in a near future? Uh, yeah, actually, currently uh, I'm uh, in, uh, developing uh, together with the robotic uh, professor uh, mechanical uh, team in Korea, so. Uh, in few years later, uh, so we may uh, utilize, we can utilize Korean made uh, flex robot system instead of Da Vinci SP. So hopefully uh, uh, in five years later or 10 years later, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, are expecting the Korean made the new uh, the, the novel uh, soft tissue, uh, soft instrument robotic system. So that's the my the, uh, current uh, uh, work. So that's uh, one other thing is so I focus on as well the molecular imaging technology together mm -hmm. with our professor. So, but it's a long way <laughs> to use to be used. Yeah. So thank you for your nice presentation. I think that you know, we. It's better to have a multiple uh, companies developing the robotic surgery uh, facilities because that you know, they have uh, their own advantages and features, and then oh, many you know doctors are you know in, uh, collaborate to develop a new systems, and then that will be the you know more advanced in uh, operative facilities, and also the yeah. imaging technique. I hope. You know, as you mentioned, the, the AI, you know, there are lots of you know, facilities and, and field should collaborate each other to give a better result. So I, I wish you a very good success in the near future and thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, let me thank uh, you, close this session. Yeah, thank you thank very much. Thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Dr.
Thank you, Dr. Park, for moderating this session. We're, we're now going to move on to hour two. Uh, this hour will be led by super moderator, Dr. Edward Kwan from UC Irvine. Uh, in addition, we have Dr. Christian Betz from the University Medical Center of Hamburg-Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany, who will be our moderator. Uh, Dr. Betz, if you may Hello. please introduce our first speaker. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello and good morning from Hamburg. Um, we are back on online, uh, so to say. So Europe uh, is just waking up. As you can see from my eyes, a um, little bit sleepy still, um, but we have a full day of, of great and interesting talks ahead of us. Um, I think we're, uh, we're still um, in, in, in a good time for, for Asia um, and, and the United States might, might just go to sleep, um, especially the, the West Coast. So um, yeah, the, I, will, I will moderate the first hour of this, um, of this session um or the the middle hour of this session actually um and the first speaker um is going to be lance Marin. um he is um uh an ent doctor in private practice in uh, in johannesburg south africa and he has made himself a, a a good name um with regards to his multidisciplinary uh voice and swallowing center that he that he built up um and he will speak to us on uh, diagnostics and voice disorders, and I'm very, very, um, uh, very interested in in uh, in what you have to say. Thank you. I'm Lance Marin. I'm an ENT in Johannesburg, South Africa, and for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss diagnostics and voice disorders. So thank you for sharing your time with me. Voice is the sound that the listener perceives when the true vocal folds of the human larynx are adducted, that is, meet in the midline effectively and efficiently, closing the glottis, so that the stream of air that passes from the pulmonary system below drives the vocal folds to vibrate. For this to occur, the vocal folds must be pliable, as normal vibratory function is critical to be able to produce a loud, clear voice. There are several approaches for assessing the various aspects of voice production. They include auditory perceptual assessment of voice quality, acoustic measures of sound, aerodynamic measures of subglottal pressure and glottal airflow rates, and the endoscopic evaluation of the vocal tract and vocal fold tissue vibration. Auditory perceptual assessment of voice begins with a consultation when we hear our patients speak for the very first time. When the sunlight strikes, raindrops in the hair. When the sunlight strikes, raindrops in the hair. They act like a prism and yeah. form a rainbow. They act like a prism and form a rainbow. Mm -hmm. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. The trained ear starts to formulate a differential diagnosis from the moment we hear our patients speak. And as the history taking continues, we are able to obtain relevant information from our patients about previous medical illnesses and surgical procedures that may have caused, or in the very least, have exacerbated our patients' voice problems. Standardized scales that rate voice quality have been plagued by listener reliability issues and differing subjective perceptual judgments of voice quality from one listener to the next. The Consensus Auditory Perceptual Evaluation of Voice, or CAPE-V, is a reliable, and valid instrument developed for the perceptual analysis of voice. Although every patient who presents to our clinic will receive a thorough and complete assessment, sometimes the diagnosis is made on the basis of the perceptual assessment, as was the case with this patient with adductor spasmodic dysphonia, whose voice pre and post Botox therapy simply tells the whole story. Today is 26 August. You can hear my voice is so but strangled. Spasms aren't that bad. And after both of Hey, Dr. Moran, I just want to say thank you very, very, very much. As you can hear, my voice is a lot better. The voice tells it all. Acoustic measures of sound and aerodynamic measures of subglottal pressure and glottal airflow rates fall within the domain of the speech pathologist. And I would like to concentrate more on the laryngologist's role in the diagnosis of our patient's voice disorders and describe in more detail 
the endoscopic evaluation of the vocal tract and vocal cord tissue vibration. The ability of the human larynx to produce sound when the true vocal folds vibrate became more clearly understood when Gerardo described the layered microstructure of the true vocal folds, which with the viscoelastic properties of the superficial layer of lamina propria allows the epithelium to glide over the vocalis muscle, producing the mucosal wave. Our improved understanding of the mechanisms of vibration and importance of vocal fold pliability have led to the development of sophisticated and innovative endoscopic diagnostic techniques, the most significant of which surely must be video stroboscopy. A strobe light passed through a rigid or flexible scope is synchronized to the frequency of vocal fold vibration at a slightly slower speed, allowing the observer to view the vocal fold vibration during sound production in an apparent slow motion way. There are two ways in which we perform endoscopy with stroboscopy. They are fiber optic, flexible nasendoscopy and rigid endoscopy. Let's take a look and compare these two. Flexible nasendoscopy, which is performed through the nose, is useful in that it bypasses the gag reflex. It allows a global assessment of the vocal tract and allows us to look at the nasal passage, post-nasal space, palate, oropharynx, as well as the larynx. We can also perform bronchoscopy in patients where this becomes necessary. Flexible endoscopy also allows the assessment of connected speech and other tasks like singing. We are able to view the larynx from behind and there is the addition of narrowband imaging or light filters, which make subtle pathology obvious that wouldn't normally be seen under normal strobe light. In comparison, rigid endoscopy is performed through the mouth. It's often not well tolerated by some of our patients, and it allows simply an assessment of the oropharynx and larynx with simple basic phonation. We are viewing the larynx only from above without the opportunity of seeing it from behind. And although we can vary light intensity and zoom closer to the vocal folds, we do not have the addition of narrow band imaging or light filters. Although rigid endoscopy is somewhat more limiting than the flexible examination, what it fails to provide in terms of the global view of the vocal tract and the ability to perform various connected speech tasks, it makes up for in the superior quality image with incredible high definition and detail it provides when examining the vibratory behavior of the true vocal folds. For this reason, every patient in our clinic is examined using both flexible and rigid endoscopes at their initial evaluation. And when they return for follow-up assessment, the appropriate method of examination can be chosen at that particular time. Before we even start, it's important that we explain the procedure to the patient to alleviate anxiety, gain trust, and cooperation. We anesthetize our patients with a combination of oxymetazoline and lignocaine, which effectively decongests the nose and anesthetizes the nose and vocal tract to allow us to produce a better tolerance for the procedure. Positioning of the patient and the doctor are important to obtain the best results. And then we follow a methodical checklist to ensure a thorough and complete assessment. As we watch the demonstration in the video, we see that the flexible endoscope examination starts with an examination of the nasal passage, the septum, the turbinate, and the antra, so that we can look for any evidence of rhinosinusitis or acute allergic rhinitis. As we reach the back of the nose, we examine the postnasal space and adenoid pad and the palate, which we pass over and then get a view of the base of tongue and the supraglottis. The larynx is then viewed at rest, looking for any obvious abnormalities. And then we begin to initiate voicing. At this time, we can assess any supraglottic hyperactivity that might be present, for example, in our patients with muscle tension dysphonia. We get the patients to sniff and say E providing us with a neurological assessment of adduction and abduction and the performing of a pitch glide of glissando. These maneuvers allow us to evaluate the recurrent and superior laryngeal nerves. It's important that we fatigue the larynx because often these subtle pathologies or weaknesses are only evident in the latter part of the examination when the patient's voice becomes tired. 
and asking a patient to whistle can sometimes highlight certain uh, weaknesses in the vocal cords. Turning the scope around, we get to view the larynx from behind. This affords us a good view into the anterior commissure, the ventricles, and the subglottis. And it also allows us to appreciate vertical height asymmetry that might be present and go completely unnoticed when viewing the larynx simply from above. As discussed previously, the flexible scope examination allows us to perform connected speech and more difficult tasks like singing and the performing of scales. Here's an example of a patient who playing the lead in Phantom of the Opera presented to our clinic complaining of vocal fatigue and instability in the higher register. So let's watch him sing. In what looks like in a somewhat normal larynx, when he begins to tire out the larynx and perform scales, it becomes clear that there is a weakness of the right side, suggesting the paresis of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. This clinical suspicion was confirmed on a laryngeal electromyography examination. After examining the vocal tract, we then move on to assess the integrity of the mucosal wave, which is best done by the rigid endoscope placed through the mouth. As, as you can see, the patient is sitting in the correct position, reaching forward with his chin, so as to provide a good image of the larynx. We ask the patient to perform a sustained E to assess the integrity of the mucosal wave, looking at vibratory behavior, which must be assessed at various different pitches because it's important to note that some pathology is only evident in the higher register. We look at closure patterns and evidence of glottal incompetence. We can also look at the extent of lateral displacement of the vocal fold, known as amplitude. And then a fine examination of that vocal fold edge, looking for any irregularities or differential elasticity or areas of stiffness. Another important speech task that can be performed with rigid endoscopy is inhalation phonation, as seen in this stroke, which demonstrates a somewhat normal looking larynx, that when the patient begins to inhale, I like when you breathe in, shows clearly that there is a deep sulcus running almost the full length of the left vocal fold. We then get the patient to phonate in a higher register. And where by comparison in the low register, vocal fold vibration seems symmetrical. In the higher register, there is definitely differential elasticity with stiffness of the left vocal fold edge. And in the high register, the patient becomes somewhat more dysphonic. The ability to record and to play back strobe examinations is a valuable tool. The examination can be viewed by the whole multidisciplinary team with careful evaluation of the findings in even further slow motion. It affords the opportunity to explain the findings to the patient and provides visual feedback which can be helpful in offloading compensatory vocal gestures which can occur in conditions such as muscle tension dysphonia. In the case of singers, it can assist in helping them to better understand issues related to poor vocal technique. It also enables us to efficiently evaluate our patient's response to treatment and also help guide future management and post-operative rehabilitation of patients who've undergone laryngeal surgery. Video stroboscopy is the gold standard in diagnostic evaluation of voice disorders and is the most practical and useful tool for assessing the causal wave. It is vital to the laryngologist to diagnose and treat voice disorders more precisely. This is a costly investment, but every effort should be made not to be tempted to purchase cheaper systems that compromise on quality of image, as that can adversely affect one's diagnostic capabilities. Stroboscopy provides an averaged view of the vibration pattern. So it is not capable of detailing tissue motion of individual vibratory cycles. And this is where high-speed video comes in at high speed. High-speed digital camera systems have become available 
with adequate light sensitivity and recording speeds able to capture up to 10,000 high resolution color images per second through a transoral endoscope. This can provide new insights into the relationship between vocal fold tissue motion and sound production. And more specifically, what causes pitch breaks and diplophonia with changes in pitch and volume. In the future, high-speed digital color imaging may supplement or even replace stroboscopy in the assessment of vocal fold vibration. But this can only occur once we have found ways to interpret the massive amounts of imaging data that is generated by these systems to make this technology clinically viable. In the American Journal of Speech and Language Pathology in November of 2016, Powell et al. published an article that compared video stroboscopy to simulated stroboscopy that was derived from high-speed video for patients with vocal fold mass lesions. The purpose of the study was to determine the reliability of the simulated stroboscopy relative to video stroboscopy. Simulated stroboscopy extracts the phase of the glottal cycle directly from the changing glottal area in the high-speed video imaging sequence. Their findings suggested that simulated stroboscopy derived from high-speed imaging is a promising improvement over current video stroboscopy systems. Simulated stroboscopy had fewer asynchronous image sequences and vibratory outcomes were able to be computed for more patients. Raters demonstrated better inter-rater reliability. A discussion on the diagnostics in voice disorder would not be complete if we didn't mention some of the investigations that are available to us to help us to extract the etiology of our patients' voice disorders. These include a hematological work for relevant systemic disorders, for example, in autoimmune conditions, maybe allergy. Radiological investigations can be performed, such as x-rays, swallowing studies, CAT and MRI scans in patients with tumors or mass lesions. And these radiological images can be reconstructed into 3D images that can be very useful for detailing certain pathology, for example, in laryngeal trauma. A GIT examination is often required in our patients complaining of gastroesophageal or laryngopharyngeal reflux. This includes transnasal esophagoscopy, or even possibly a form of gastroscopy performed by the gastroenterologists, and 24-hour pH impedance manometry testing in patients with complex problems. Laryngeal electromyography evaluates the integrity of the neuromuscular system. By placing a small needle into the intrinsic muscles of the larynx and asking a patient to phonate, we are able to record motor unit action potentials during voluntary contraction. This helps us to differentiate between disorders of nerve, muscle, and joints. It also helps to prognosticate and guide the management of patients with recurrent and superior laryngeal nerve injuries. It's important that electromyography is only considered an extension of the physical examination and must always be interpreted within the context of the clinical picture. And no treatment decisions should be made purely on the basis of the EMG findings. Here is an EMG tracing showing the normal motor unit action potential. And by contrast, here is an EMG tracing of a patient who had a right-sided superior laryngeal nerve palsy, where there is an obvious reduced recruitment and polyphasic motor unit action potentials. So in summary, the human instrument is a complex organ that begins at the tip of the nose and finishes in the stomach as well as requiring the successful integration of the respiratory system and muscles of the abdomen and diaphragm. The clinical assessment of a patient with a voice complaint requires a thorough evaluation of all the various anatomical systems that interplay to produce a healthy voice. So it's important that we don't only concentrate on the larynx. But once we've completed this assessment of all of these different systems, we must then concentrate on the larynx as the source of sound this assessment is best performed in a methodical fashion by a multidisciplinary team possessing the experience and expertise required to meet this enormously difficult challenge. Because accurate diagnosis is vital to the correct and successful management of voice disorders.
Thank you very much, Dr. Maron. Um, I heard that you are going to, um, to show us a live um, uh, investigation of a patient now. Um, that is going to be uh, great if that's happening. Um, um, otherwise, we would, we would continue with the discussion. Uh, good morning. Yes, can you hear me, Christian? Yes. Uh, good morning from South, uh, from South Africa, and uh, I would like to just take this opportunity to, to thank you for the introduction and also the panelists and organizers for having me be a part of this uh, groundbreaking CME event. Yes, you're very welcome. Your talk was great, actually. I think you, you, have, a, um, you have a rhetorical gift. Um, you, you talk like a book. It's perfect. <laughs> thank you. So yes, I did have a, a quick case that I wanted to share because of how brilliantly it, it okay. illustrates our diagnostic capabilities. I'm gonna just quickly uh, share the screen. Perfect. Um, and let's play that. So uh, this is a case presentation of a 43 year old female who presented to my, my clinic. Uh, I was asked to give a second opinion on a patient uh, who I'd not treated previously, who'd been diagnosed with laryngeal papilloma during a gastroscope in 2017. Uh, several surgical procedures were performed thereafter and uh, the problem became a little bit more uh, concerning where she started to experience difficulty with breathing towards the end of the following year. And that's when tracheal papilloma were confirmed. Uh, during the debulking procedure, a tracheotomy had to be performed uh, apparently as a result of some excessive bleeding. Uh, thereafter, several debulking uh, laser procedures were performed. And unfortunately, at the last procedure, there was an airway fire when the endotracheal tube ignited. The patient was ventilated for 10 days in ICU. And uh, just to add to it, after this, she has received uh, several doses of intravenous Avastin and also the Gardasil vaccine. So if we take a look at the uh, video, it begins with obviously the examination of the nasal passage, but straight uh, onto the laryngeal examination, one sees quite a significant uh, uh, subglottic glottic stenosis um, that uh, you're able to view at rest. Patients finding phonation somewhat difficult as a result of the stenosis, and you, it's, you're able to see the uh, tracheostomy tube in situ just below uh, the vocal folds themselves. Uh, at this time, you can see I'm introducing a 2% solution of uh, lignocaine or lidocaine through the side port of the scope. And then I've now entered the uh, tracheostomy tube with a flexible scope to examine the trachea. And one then sees that there is a mid-tracheal stenosis with a significant amount of uh, crusting and inflammation. I'm able to push the scope beyond that point to examine the distal part of the trachea looking at the carina and the uh, left and right main bronchus. And after making this global assessment of the uh, vocal tract and the trachea, I then want to concentrate on uh, looking at what type of function I'm able to uh, produce of the larynx. And also my concern is uh, what type of um, effective uh, result they've gained from the intravenous Avastin therapy. So first of all, here we still have the tracheostomy tube in situ. I've pushed the uh, scope through because the patient's uh, well anesthetized and I'm able to look around and see that there are evidence of papilloma, or little clusters of papilloma sitting around the tracheostomy tube. And I'm using my uh, light filters to better enhance those areas so I can see with detail where those small clusters of papilloma sit. We'll move on a little bit uh, just for time's sake. I'm now able to push the uh, scopes right through the uh, vocal cords having removed the tracheostomy tube. And this gives me a really good appreciation of those flat clusters of papilloma that still remain uh, all along the length of the tracheal walls, right down to the level of that uh, tracheal stenosis. So this gives us a really good uh, situation where we're able to do such a thorough evaluation with a patient in the chair 
as they were concerned that this patient would have to go to the OR or to theater to have a general anesthetic for this examination. But the entire process was completed sitting in the chair and uh, I was able to give them a good uh, evaluation of the patient's problems. So I think that outlines very nicely, once again, just the incredible diagnostic capabilities that we have uh, in our rooms uh, without even having to go to the uh, OR. Perfect. Thanks so much for the for sharing this uh, very interesting um, case as well. Um, I have a few questions myself, so um, uh, and I will I would like to ask the attendees um, to 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 send send in some questions as well. My questions I, I would like to start out with a case um, that you showed in the end. Um, the first is um, in, in I like to use. Um, narrowband imaging for, for looking at papillomas um, because they, <clears throat> uh, it, it helps me to differentiate um, small uh, patches of papilloma from, from, from scarred or, or healthy mucosa. Um, do you use that as well? Do you find that helpful? So uh, the uh, capabilities that I have with the equipment that we have available to us uh, only affords us the light filters, which okay. I think certainly is not uh, as as uh, good as narrowband imaging. Mm -hmm. But as one could see in that video, when you get really close up to those papilloma, I think I agree, you're definitely able to establish the difference between those clusters of papilloma with their increased vascularity mm -hmm. versus areas that are just uh, hypervascular as a result of excessive previous surgical procedures yeah. that would probably just be uh, reactive scar tissue. Okay. Um, one further question from my side is the, the Avestin. Is that covered by by insurances in, in South Africa, do you need to do you need a special um, um, do you need to to um, to to ask the so insurances because it, because uh, it's a very good question because it's off label use. Um, it's certainly in this particular situation, the patient would have had to apply for what we call a Section Twenty One registration uh, with the Medical Control Council to be allowed to use this medication off label. Um, and there does often become concerns in terms of cost because some of the uh, uh, insurance companies would not recognize this as an accepted form of treatment and would not want to uh, therefore fund the actual treatment. Yeah. And it can become quite costly. Okay, thanks. So I'm sure this is a concern that many of us share. Yeah, okay. There's now lots of questions coming in actually. Um, so uh, I will start um, with... Uh, with one um, here, um, how to well anesthetize um, the trachea to examine safely in the office? So uh, once again, if one would go back and look at the video, you could see that through the side port of that flexible scope, it affords us the opportunity to place a syringe containing mm -hmm. a 2% solution of uh, lignocaine. The patient's asked to cough and phonate and the entire vocal tract, the base of tongue, epiglottis, the uh, true vocal folds are then bathed with this lignocaine solution. Mm -hmm. uh, once that is nicely anesthetized, you're able to comfortably pass through the true vocal folds and into the trachea. And you can, once again, with a patient coughing, introduce a, a small amount of that solution, which I think is effective mm -hmm. enough to give uh, a local uh, effect and make it comfortable for the patient to tolerate the examination. Yeah. In this particular yeah. instance, we also have the opportunity of going through the stoma but in a patient that doesn't have a stoma, you're also able to take a, a syringe with a needle, uh, place it through the cricothyroid membrane, and instill a small amount of solution through that area as well, just to bathe the trachea in local anesthetic. Yeah. Uh, concerning your, your local anesthesia, I was, I was wondering, I was always told that, that it's not so good to use decongestants as well as uh, anesthetic sol solution um, because the decongestants can can uh, can interfere with a with a functional assessment of of voice and especially swallowing, um, and you said you use you use a combination for the nose, but some might also drip back down. So, do you see a problem in that? So, absolutely, it's a very good point, Christian. Uh, and uh, what what I did fail to mention is that. What one of the procedures we do perform is functional endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate in those patients that we ask them to tolerate the procedure 
without any local anesthetic at all, because you're, you're absolutely correct. We don't want to numb any of their sensation so that we get an effective evaluation of the sensory uh, aspect of their swallowing problems. Yeah. Thanks so much. I think we had a great discussion as well. Um, there's more questions to come. So I would ask you, um, Lance, if, if that's possible, as well as, as those that are interested uh, in, in more discussions, to, to go to our side room, more or less, uh, via the link that is provided in the chat um, and, and have, have some more questions answered. Thanks so much for this great talk. It was, it was very, very good, uh, rhetorically perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank you very much. I will, I will introduce the next speaker. Um, that's uh, Dr. Robert Berkowitz. Um, he is with us from Melbourne in, in Australia and he, um, he, he's a pediatric otolaryngologist um, and he has been head of the, uh, the pediatric otolaryngology department at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne for a long time and is now um, and has appointments at different other hospitals like the Royal Women's Hospital um, and the University of Melbourne Hospital. Um, and he's, um, he's also a clinical advisor to surgery to the Australian health regulator. Um, and his clinical interest is mostly in pediatric airways. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in your talk uh, and, and to hear what you have to say. Hi, um, want to send greetings from Melbourne, Australia to you all. And uh, it's a lovely warm summer's day here. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk and very grateful to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to give this speech today and particularly on one of my very favourite topics about congenital bilateral vocal fold paralysis. Now, what motivated me to give this talk was I was put in a paper which got rejected fairly quickly. It wasn't a great paper, but what upset me was the, was the reviewer wrote that um, in regard to this paper on congenital bilateral vocal cord paralysis that he felt that this is usually caused, or he or she, I wasn't sure who it was, but uh, they felt that it was usually caused by a nerve injury that innervates the intrinsic laryngeal muscle, which was surprising that this was really what this expert thought, because we published a paper in 1996, which identified congenital bilateral vocal fold paralysis as not being due to a peripheral laryngeal or recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, but due to a central problem related to incoordination of the respiratory control mechanism and how that was transmitted to the laryngeal motor neurons. So what I want to do today is just give you a bit of background and understanding as to what the nature of congenital bilateral vocal cord polaralysis is all about. So let's start with the laryngeal motor neuron. Now, Laryngeal motor neurons have two forms of activity. They have basic respiratory related activity, which is what we're going to talk about today. But just for completeness, I'm going to mention tonic activity, which you're not going to talk about, but you're all familiar that tonic activity can occur during vocalization, um, swallowing, or as a reflex to stimulation or hypoxia. Now, it all starts where the respiratory rhythm is generated. And there are a group of pacemaker cells that have an intrinsic rhythm. And that rhythm is modified by peripheral inputs. And altogether that creates uh, and initiates and terminates inspiratory and expiratory activity. And this respiratory activity is transmitted um, to both the respiratory pump muscles and also the airway control muscles. And clearly there's no point your respiratory pump muscles being activated if your airway isn't open at the same time. And that's why coordination is so critical. And this is a, a slide we produced many years ago. It's from an intracellular recording from a posterior cricoarotenoid motor neuron. And that's shown by the arrow and the arrow heads indicate phrenic nerve activity. And as you can see, the posterior cricoarotenoid motor neuron 
which enables the larynx to open actually is activated just before the onset of inspiration. And that's just the way you'd expect the system to work. And as you know, we have two forms of laryngeal motor neurons. We have the abductor motor neuron that opens the larynx, and that's the posterior cricarotenoid. And of course, it opens the larynx to allow air to enter the lungs. Now, the adductor motor neurons are made up of the thyroarotenoid, the lateral cricoarotenoid, and the interarotenoid motor neurons. And they are active during expiration. And what they do is in partially closing the glottis, they limit air escape and that prevents alveolar collapse. But both sets of motor neurons have a characteristic basic activity that is essential to the role that they play. Now, as you, as you remember from your physiology studies in pre-med, um, laryngeal motor neuron activity is controlled by neurotransmitter inputs. And there are both excitatory inputs, which is predominantly glutamate, and there are inhibitory neurotransmitter inputs, which in the brain is predominantly GABA and glycine. And they act together to form a specific type of firing pattern for that motor neuron. By the way, the reason I'm telling you all this is because is because when the neurotransmission is not normal, uh, that is what's responsible for creating the lack of coordination and the clinical picture of congenital bilateral vocal cord paralysis. When we talk about this condition, I just want to just get for completeness, divide this up into two forms. There is the classic form which is the abductive form, which is, which is the abductive process, which is in fact what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're not going to talk about the very rare form of adductive paralysis, where the laryngeal adductor muscles do not function. Um, that's very rare. We actually reported a series of three children, and of course these children present with aspiration, but it's not particularly relevant to today's talk. Now, as we suggested, the mechanism of congenital bilateral vocal, cord, vocal fault paralysis is there is failure of transmission of respiratory activity to the laryngeal motor neurons. And that is to both the, either the PCA or to the laryngeal adductors. So when you see a child who's got bilateral vocal, cord, vocal fault paralysis, it could be due to either dysfunction of the posterior cricarotenoid muscle or the laryngeal adductor muscles. The posterior cricarotenoid motor neurons fire in inspiration. And the reason they fire in inspiration is because they receive excitation in that phase and, and they receive inhibitory uh, inputs during expiration. When that situation is reversed, that can obviously cause the clinical features of bilateral vocal cord paralysis. Similarly, when you look at the laryngeal adductor motor neurons that fire in expiration, the reason that occurs is because during inspiration, these laryngeal motor neurons receive a gather mediated inhibition. And when that inhibition is released, there is a rebound excitation. So again, when that neurotransmitter input is altered, then the firing pattern may well alter, may alter. Again, that could be another explanation for bilateral vocal cord paralysis. The reason this is terribly important, is because if we can understand the altered neurochemistry, then that raises the possibility of actually providing some drug treatment for this condition, which we've actually tried in the past, but without much success. Now, what's the pathogenesis? Well, we do, well, in terms of the laryngeal uh, adductor motor neurons, we do know that if you, uh, if, if uh, the brain is subject to hypoxia, we know that the respiratory neurons that normally fire during expiration, in fact, fire during inspiration. So one can postulate that maybe there was some local 
local um, hypoxia in the developing brain during the embryonic period that led to this misfiring of the laryngeal constrictor motor neurons as one example of as to how bilateral vocal cord paralysis can come about. Now, this now getting to something a little bit more clinical. So hopefully, hopefully you've stayed awake till now. <laughs> Most people have fallen asleep <laughs> at this point. But uh, obviously recognising the causes is very important because that helps us in terms of determining what tests are necessary. Um, and the most important cause is idiopathic, which, which accounts for 50% of the cases. Um, the other cases include birth trauma. Now birth trauma is actually a, a good cause because most of the children with birth trauma, these are usually very large babies that have a traumatic delivery, um, suffer a bit of head compression, a bit of neck twisting, um, their symptoms resolve within a few weeks to months. So that's a good one to have. Obviously, birth hypoxia can cause bilateral vocal cord paralysis as part of a more generalized uh, encephalopathy. Um, there are the structural causes, particularly the anal carry malformation that you're all familiar with. There are also a range of neuromuscular causes to consider. And we actually reported a few of these, and they include congenital myasthenia, spinal muscular atrophy. It's important because the congenital vocal cord paralysis presents at birth. And in fact, um, you can actually make the neuromuscular diagnosis before all the other symptoms um, have, de have uh, developed. Uh, there's also a group that are familial, and, you, and, and uh, you, we've, all, we've got a number, well, a few families where, where there is a where this uh, bilateral vocal cord paralysis has traveled over a few generations. And also the condition can be occasionally associated with chromosomal abnormality. Now, uh, presentation, as you know, is inspiratory strider from birth. And whenever you get a call from your resident to see that your baby's got inspiratory strider, the, the differential is also always between bilateral vocal cord paralysis and laryngomalacia. But you can very easily tell the two apart just on the nature of the stridor. Firstly, bilateral vocal cord paralysis has got the classic high pitched stridor. Secondly, the stridor increases when the baby is under stress. And thirdly, the work of breathing is often more prominent than the stridor with bilateral vocal cord paralysis, but with laryng laryngomalacia, it's the other way around. Um, one of the way, as you know, the, the way to diagnose this condition is by flexible laryngoscopy. I just want to suggest to you that when you do flexible laryngoscopy and you want to differentiate between laryngomalacia and vocal cord paralysis, you can usually do it with your eyes closed because since the baby becomes more stressed uh, uh, with, the, with the flexible laryngoscopy, the stridor becomes worse with bilateral vocal cord paralysis. But in a child with with laryngomalacia, the neuromuscular tone goes up and therefore the stridor gets less. So you don't necessarily have to have, to have your eyes open when you do it, but it's probably recommended that you do it. Um, there are a number of pitfalls in doing flexible laryngoscopy in this condition. The first one is when you scope the baby, as you know, they're often crying. A crying baby is a baby who's constantly phonating and, and, and therefore, Therefore, that baby's um, vocal cords will be will be closed, and you could you could in fact uh, misdiagnose that as bilateral vocal cord paralysis. Also, uh, breath holding hypoxia, um, and the cords react to both of those situations by slamming shut. So again, that could be another false diagnosis. You, asymmetry sometimes occurs when the degree of vocal cord paralysis doesn't look the same. And you wonder whether uh, it's really only a unilateral vocal cord paralysis. The truth of the matter is, if they've got stridor, it's going to be bilateral, but it could be unequal. And the other thing to consider is other cords adducted and not abducting because they are fixed due to either congenital cricoarotenoid fixation or due to an interarotenoid band. Well, to be honest with you, in over 30 years of being attending, I've never seen that apart from the situation where a child has been previously intubated and the scar has resulted in previous intubation. But in the absence of intubation, a 
I didn't really see it in general fixation, but nonetheless, it is still something you need to consider. In terms of the investigations, we, we published a paper a few years ago looking at MRI, and the advantage of getting an MRI in the, in the newborns is obviously doesn't require the general anaesthetic, and we found that about a third of the babies had some evidence of non-specific um, head trauma, which supported what we were asking about our argument that there may have been some hypoxic or local hypoxic cause for the incoordination of, uh, of, of transmission of the respiratory control. Um, Microangoscopy and bronchoscopy, tumors, we, we hardly do that. Uh, we don't feel that this is routinely necessary. I mean, that's the, I'm not sure that's the way in the States, but certainly in Australia, we don't routinely do that. If we get a good view on flexible laryngoscopy, um, obviously, if there are other symptoms or the symptoms are inconsistent with our diagnosis, then of course you take them to the theatre. But as a general rule, we don't automatically do that. And the other investigation to consider is respiration related laryngeal EMG, which we have tried to promote. And if you look at the literature, you'll see no one's actually, except for us, has shown any interest in this. But we feel it's a very useful test in a, in a child who has, a, who has congenital bilateral vocal cord paralysis. So what we do, we're not just recording from the laryngeal muscles, we're also recording from the intercostal muscles at the same time. That allows us to time the activity that we're recording in the, in the laryngeal muscles and, and identify whether they are occurring at the correct phase of respiration or at the incorrect phase. So it is something that is can be useful. And so, uh, so I think the three reasons to do it are firstly, because it does, as I said, it allows us potentially to identify the nature of the incoordination, which muscle is firing incorrectly at what time. It may be a benefit for prognosis. The small number of cases we've done this in, we have had one or two where the timing was actually correct and there was no incoordination, despite the fact that there was bilateral vocal cord paralysis. And the one or two of these kids we did actually got better very quickly. So it may well be that this is a good test for prognosis. And finally, and again, this is pure speculation, it may open the possibility for selectively altering brain neurochemistry. Um, we said we have tried this in the past uh, unsuccessfully, but I still think it's something that may be worth looking at in the future. Now, just a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, as much as we're keen on uh, laryngeal EMGs, um, they're done under general anesthesia. And as you know, that, that obviously uh, will, will depress respiratory activity. And that depression is most marked in the cranial motor neuron. Uh, so I think that whenever you're doing an EMG under anesthesia, you have to ask yourself really, is what I'm seeing the result of the anesthetic or is it a result of the pathology? So I think you have to be careful in the way one interprets this. And we all know, we've all done bronchoscopies and airway assessments and we see the cords doing funny things. Well, you know, we just simply say, well, that's the anesthetic. So if I don't think you don't think you should get too carried away uh, with laryngeal EMG, but it is a useful test. And what I want to say to you is as keen as we are on, on respiratory-related laryngeal EMG, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, if you uh, if you look closely at the at the actual flexible laryngoscopy itself, then you'll find that you will be able to actually make the diagnosis without having to. As you do the EMG, let me just show you if I can get this up. Let me show you a video of a child who has congenital bilateral vocal cord paralysis. Now, if you'll see what's happening here. What you can see is you will be able to see soon. You see in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. So what's what we can't ask questions at school because unfortunately we're not live. But um, um, what you can see is the cords are closing on inspiration and they're sort of relaxing. Uh, they're sort of relaxing during expiration. So if I asked you uh, what's happening here, you'd say to me, well, 
reports are closing on inspiration must be at the laryngeal constrictor um, adductor motor neurons are active in inspiration rather than expiration. And I'd agree with you. And I'd say to you, well, there's probably no need to document that by laryngeal EMG, but it just reinforces how important it is to look very closely at the vocal cord movement when you make the diagnosis on flexible laryngoscopy. In case you are interested in uh, respiratory related um, um, EMGs and doing these in your department, um, we never, we don't do this as a standalone procedure. We only do it if we do tracheostomies and we do it after the tracheostomy is inserted, but then we're in a position to lighten the anaesthetic. And therefore, the anaesthetic has as little impact as possible on laryngeal function. Um, the, we do the procedure in the same way as we perform laryngeal EMG. We individually test from the thyroarotenoid and posterior cricarotenoid. But at the same time, we're also, we're also recording from the uh, from the intercostal muscles, so we can, can we can basically superimpose the phrenic nerve activity onto the laryngeal activity and identify in which phase the laryngeal muscle is active. And this is um, from some of our one of our published reports. Uh, this is a right and a left thyroarotenoid muscle. And the uh, the tracing below the B tracing is phrenic nerve, and the tracing A is from the from the thyroarotenoid. And you can see clearly that the thyroarotenoid muscle is active during expiration, which is exactly what you expect it to do. However, when you look at this trace, this is from the right and left posterior cricoarotenoid, which is the abductor muscle. And you can see that the tracing looks like we've just cheated and just relayed the same place, but we didn't cheat. Now, this is this is actually showing you that the PCA muscle on both sides uh, was active during active during expiration. But therefore, there was no there was no in, 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 uh, no inspiratory activity. Hence, the child's cords were not were not abducting on expiration. And it's a very nice way of documenting exactly. Um, what the problem is. Um, going, getting back to saying about management of prognosis, if you're going to manage the patient, you want to know what the prognosis is. Firstly, the prognosis depends on, on the underlying cause. Um, so, so if a child has, um, has has um, a structural neurologic problem or a neuromuscular problem, then obviously that needs to be addressed and that will impact on the improvement or otherwise of the cord function. When it comes to the idiopathic um, cases, um, we found that those requiring tracheostomy, we found that a small number um, were decannulated by 12 months, but every other patient was decannulated by six years of age. So, although this has been the interest of mine for many years, I've never actually done any major reconstructive surgery on the, these children. Because once you explain the prognosis to the parents, and once they're used to tracheostomy, you know, you can guarantee it's going to come out then uh, with it, you know, around about the time they start school, most parents will accept that. Uh, so there must be some process of neurochemical maturation that does occur. And the other thing to notice is, is the children who need tracheostomies, although they get decannulated, it doesn't seem to dissolve fully. And they've also always got some degree of impaired exercise tolerance because they can't have, they don't seem to be able to have maximum vertical fold uh, uh, abduction. Um, in terms of the the management approach. I think it's important to appreciate that the first four to six weeks, uh, the role is to provide support to that child. Once that period has come and gone and the child it hasn't improved, then the choice is either to go ahead with a tracheostomy, that's time, and consider surgery subsequent to that if either the parents aren't willing to wait a number of years or there's no evidence of spontaneous improvement. We found our tracheostomy rate was 25 to 30%. It's certainly not as high as the literature would suggest. The alternative would be to 
undertake surgery at 46 weeks of age um, as a, um, to actually avoid the need for tracheostomy. And um, that's really a matter of discussion between the parents and the and the surgeon as to what is the correct approach. But um, either is a reasonable thing to consider. In terms of the supportive measures, I mean, the child needs airway support, um, which can involve some high flow CPAP or a period of intratracheal intubation. If you're considering intubating the child, I just warn you about not letting that go for too long because we've had one child who was intubated for a little bit longer than they should have, and they developed uh, adhesions out of the tips of the vocal process. And because the vocal cords were adducted, uh, they developed a dense scar. So be careful about the period of incubation. Um, secondly, is nutritional support with um, involving speech therapists is very helpful in terms of improving feeding strategies, also considering nasogastric tube feeding. And while you're doing that, it's obviously important to monitor the child, monitor the dexymmetry, possibly get a sleep, uh, get a polysomnography, and also look at um, uh, document that their weight gain has been satisfactory. In terms of the surgical options, there's a range of options. Um, Botox has been suggested, and the most promising one is the one that Sam Daniel, their paper he wrote on Botox, the cricothyroid muscle, which seems to help a little bit and not do any great harm. I don't have any personal experience with that. I have done a few posterior chordotomies. Again, the advantage of that is it doesn't do a great deal of harm, but it also doesn't do a great deal of good. And I find that the benefits of posterior chordotomy probably only last uh, six to eight weeks. And when you re-examine them after that period of time, uh, it looks like you haven't done any surgery. So it, it, it will buy you some time. Um, local fold lateralization procedures with a suture well, when you do that, you either get a big granuloma and the, and the suture cutting out, or you get a child who aspirates. So it's not, I don't think it's a great operation. Arotenoidectomy is probably more useful in an older child because there's more bulk of the arotenoid when the child is older than when they're younger. And of course, the current uh, popular procedure is a, is a posterior cartilage graft, um, which does work. The problem with that is if you've done a number of laryngotracheoplasties, you know, you sometimes wind up with a worse situation than you start off with. So I wouldn't be rushing into a posterior cartilage graft because there is, there is, if it's not done well uh, and it's not done by experienced hands, then uh, you, may, you may get a, a very bad result. So you can probably see with my pessimistic view on life. Um, sometimes encouraging the parents to hang in there for a few years and then eventually getting into that is a very, very reasonable option. And that's, that's the one we tend to do. But if the younger surgeons come in for our department, they're obviously keen on trying something more aggressive. They're probably correct in doing that. So I just want to thank you all for listening to me. And um, I hope that, uh, that um, if you review me, my papers on vocal cord paralysis, uh, you won't write back the same thing that the initial reviewer did write. But thank you all. And uh, again, uh, best wishes from Australia. Bye-bye. Well, thanks a lot for your, for your very interesting talk. Um, there have been a few questions. We're a little bit um, uh, over time. So we have two minutes for talks now. And um, all the other questions can be, uh, can be um, solved, I guess, in the uh, in the breakout room, where I would ask Dr. Berkowitz to to join as well. Um, I would I would ask a few of those que uh, of the questions that came in. Uh, one is, I think, very important and interesting. Based on flexible laryngos laryngoscopy, can you differentiate uh, a cricoarytenoid fixation and a bilateral vocal cord paralysis? And and if yes, how? What signs to look for? Thanks. That's a great question. I think, firstly, um, it's a relatively um, under-recognized condition in uh, in neonates. Secondly, it tends to occur 
only I've only seen it in a quiet situation. I've never seen it in a congenital situation. Mm -hmm. How could I differentiate between the two? If I can identify, as we showed you that that uh, flexible scope, when you can actually see what the aberration in vocal fold movement is, where you can see the closure is occurring at the wrong phase of respiration or opening is failing to occur at the right time, then you can be certain of the diagnosis. In the absence of that, if you see cords that are trying to move but are not moving, I think you'd have to consider that possibility. But again, I wouldn't be taking a child to theatre to assess their vocal cords uh, unless they had clinical symptoms that were, were at the severe end. So bottom line is you can't tell with certain, certainty, but I think it's, I've never, in, in over 30 years, I've never had a case. So I think unless, that's, unless there's a acquired stenosis, I don't think you really need to consider it. But one, one further point is that's why you never want to intubate a child with bilateral vocal cord paralysis for any length of time, because what you're going to do is you're going to cause scarring and the cords are going to be opposed and then you're going to, then you're going to be in trouble. So I think the key thing is don't cause posterior, don't, don't cause cricoid fixation by intubating them for too long. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think we have to move on. Please, uh, uh, for all those who are interested in, in, uh, in asking more questions, join us for the breakout room and Dr. Berkowitz would be great if you could do so as well. I will hand over to Professor Yongju Yang, uh, pronunciation is probably not right, still not right, um, yes, to, um, okay. it's good. <laughs> to introduce uh, Professor Lund. Okay, um, it gives me immense pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, Professor Valerie Lund. Uh, she is a true giant in rhinology. She inspired many young rhinologists throughout the whole world. Uh, she is now uh, serving as the um, Professor Emeritus of the <clears throat> University College of London. Uh, um, I invite her to give insight and uh, his, her experience on the uh, management of the epistaxis and uh, HHT. Thank you. Please join me welcoming Professor Balali Lund. Hi there, thank you very much. I'm delighted to join you. And um, I'm very pleased to be able to say a few words about one of my favorite subjects, which is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Hi there, I'm Valerie Lund, and I'm extremely pleased to have been invited to join you for these 48 hours of otolaryngology as a live webinar. Um, I see that when it started uh, some years ago, it was held in Hawaii, and I would much have preferred to have been in Hawaii face to face with you all uh, than at a distance in a very uh, rainy uh, London. But nonetheless, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about epistaxis in hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Now, this is something that I've been inter interested in for many years, and as a consequence, I've uh, got quite a large number of patients with this problem who have come to me from all over the UK and abroad. And uh, of those uh, 546, as you would expect from an autosomal dominant non-sex linked condition, the numbers are fairly evenly sp uh, spaced between men and women. The underlying problem, as you know, is uh, the telangiectasia, which are small lesions in which the endothelial layer is deficient in muscle or elastic tissue. And this makes them very fragile uh, if they are damaged in any uh, way, however minor. They don't have the capacity to constrict down, and so the bleeding continues until the clotting takes place. Sometimes you hear HHT referred to as Osler-Rendu Weber disease, but it was probably described earlier than even uh, Dr. Rendu uh, by Sutton and Babington in the UK. It's an interesting condition because the frequency does vary around the world and there are certain hotspots, but overall it's about uh, 12 to 15 per 100,000 of the population affected. There are quite a range of genetic mutations that are involved in HHT, uh, all related to abnormal development of the blood vessels. And uh, we tend to categorize them into HHT 1 to 4 uh, related to these many mutations. HHT1 is the commonest uh, associated with epistaxis at a younger age and also with pulmonary and cerebral uh, AVMs. 
Now, as you might expect, um, if you have HHT, um, you have a worse uh, chance of uh, deep vein thrombosis, of pulmonary hypertension, and of an increased mortality in pregnancy. And my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Shovlin at the Hammersmith Hospital has done a lot of work on this. However, there are some benefits from having HHT, surprisingly, uh, and colleagues in Denmark have shown that the risk of cancer and of heart attacks are also reduced if you have HHT. In fact, if the condition is appropriately treated these days, the lifespan is uh, essentially unchanged. Now, the lesions can occur anywhere in the body, on the skin, conjunctiva, mucosal surfaces, and just about any organ. And you see uh, some examples in these clinical photographs. Now, instead of a Hawaii criteria, we've got Kurosawa criteria here, uh, put together under the leadership of uh, Dr. Shovlin. And this looks at the uh, different um, uh, criteria that are required for a definite possible or unlikely diagnosis of HHT. And you can see that the presence of epistaxis is the number one criterion here, uh, the presence of telangiectasia in the nose, and obviously a family history of a first degree relative. Now, uh, obviously, as a, a nose doctor, most of the patients I see with HHT have actually got uh, nosebleeds, uh, but any part of the body, as I've said, can be affected. You can see arteriovenous malformations in the liver and lung, and also lesions in the skin and GI tract. And it's thought that about 10% of patients at least have lesions in the brain. That means that most of the patients are getting nosebleeds to some degree, but they can bleed out from elsewhere. Uh, the periods can be heavy in women. They can cough up blood from the AVMs. And of course, sadly, they can uh, suffer a stroke um, in the brain. Now, the bleeding can be started by any number of uh, factors. Uh, for most of our patients, they bleed on a daily basis and they bleed more than once, usually um, three or more times a day. And quite minor things can set them off, changes in temperature, changes in humidity, particularly dry air, uh, doing quite minor things, bending, coughing, even having a cup of tea or putting a jumper on can start the nosebleed. So it's a real problem uh, for carry on normal life. And a third of the patients uh, suggest that stress can be a factor as well. Now, most of the patients start with their nosebleeds in childhood or their teens and early 20s, but it is quite a wide age range. And I've even had a few patients in their 60s who have their first nosebleeds at that late age. So don't dismiss HHT as part of a diagnostic um, algorithm if you're dealing with an elderly patient who starts getting nas nosebleeds out of the blue. Now, I mentioned the PAVM. Um, they, they can be quite a problem. They're more common in the HHT1 group and um, they can produce quite significant symptoms, but they can also be asymptomatic. And they're important because they're associated with quite a lot of comorbidities, notably uh, stroke and brain abscess. And uh, this can be related to the right to left shunting that occurs with the AVM. What's most important to know is that it, the presence of these things is not related to the severity of the epistaxis. You can have quite mild nosebleeds, but still have quite significant PAVMs. And they don't get better with time. So it's always uh, worth doing a screening uh, check with a CT of the chest uh, to make sure that they don't have any significant lesions. Um, and certainly they require antibiotic prophylaxis for any dental work or a general anesthesia if they're present. So we do check all the patients uh, with a CT chest. And if they have any with feeding vessels greater than three millimeters in diameter, uh, they go to uh, my colleague, Dr. Shoveling, where the, um, they are embolized by the interventional radiologist. Now, obviously we can see these patients in the acute situation. And the important thing there is to remember the lesions are extremely fragile. So it's best to avoid conventional packing and use something that's atraumatic or dissolvable. And fortunately, we do have a number of items that can be used these days, uh, which can be put in the nose, flow seal, nasopore, et cetera. I found the oral tranexamic acid can be very helpful. Patients can have these with them all the time and take them um, when they need to, and that will very rapidly reduce the bleeding. Uh, 
Um, it's better to, as I say, avoid packing if you can. Um, and I'd also say that whilst interventional radiology and embolization or ligation of the major feeding vessels can, and, and we certainly have used them in an extreme situation, because this is an end organ disease, it's not possible to completely stop all blood supply to the uh, lesions. And with time due to collateral circulation, um, the bleeding will start again. So these sort of interventions are okay in an emergency emergency, but they don't offer long-term solutions. Now, if you look at all the patients, I've divided up the various treatments uh, specific to the nose, apart from the general uh, systemic correction of anemia, etc. And we have uh, the use of a laser, some medical treatments, grafting the nose uh, and closing the nose, as well as uh, some uh, other strategies such as avoiding things that might increase the bleeding in the diet or uh, medicines such as aspirin. This shows those options in a little bit more detail, uh, and I'm going to uh, concentrate on the things that are uh, in red uh, print uh, in this short lecture. As far as the lasers are concerned, we, what we want is a coagulating laser, something uh, with uh, a light beam in the uh, red-green um, range so that it's absorbed by the actual red lesion. And things like CO2 or holmium YAG are not so useful because they uh, cut the lesions and unfortunately uh, can make the bleeding worse. So we've tended to use a KTP laser, although I have used argon, and you can see here we uh, don't actually touch the lesion, but we allow the uh, beam of the laser just to be absorbed by the uh, uh, telangiectasia, uh, blanching it. And um, these uh, work, this sort of treatment works extremely well. We tend to do it under a short general anaesthetic. Um, uh, but of course, the uh, lesions have a, a natural history. And so with time, new ones will grow and therefore the treatment will need to be repeated. So I offer patients uh, uh, recurrent uh, treatments. They simply uh, ring in uh, when they need to have it done again as the bleeding starts to recur. And there really isn't any limit to the number of times the lasering can be done. Um, there's very minimal uh, collateral damage. So um, I can honestly say I've not seen any septal perforations as a result of using this treatment, even though we do do it on both sides of the nose. And there really aren't any uh, complications. But obviously the laser will only work for the smaller lesions, those under a couple of millimeters in diameter. So it works well for the milder cases, but it's not a long-term strategy for the more severe. In those cases where things are not doing so well with the laser, one can think of combining the laser uh, with a septodermaplasty. Um, this has been around for quite a long time and there are various uh, materials you can use to graft the nose. Uh, we tend to use fenestrated split skin taken from the thigh. It is possible to do both sides of the septum, but I would recommend that you do them on two separate occasions, because if you do them both at the same time, then you will uh, occasionally end up with a septal perforation. So I do one side, usually the worst side first, and then the second a few months later. Um, you need to make an incision from the front, from the mucocutaneous junction, as far back as level with the front end of the middle turbinate. Then you need to dissect the uh, mucosa off, um, either with a freer or with a sharp dissection with scissors, as you see me doing here. The idea is to leave behind a layer of mucoperichondrium, which is always easier to do than uh, to say than to do uh, in, in real life. But it's best to leave some uh, of the soft tissue behind to act as a bed for your split skin graft. And you can see here I'm putting this in using a little piece of gelinet just to support it. Um, you can see the fenestrations and we just lay that on, use a little bit of bioglue to hold it in place and some uh, gel foam on top, which will dissolve away uh, with time. Now that uh, generally takes very well, it heals well, um, and uh, it, uh, it is something which uh, many of the patients find helpful, um, as you see uh, in the next slide here. Um, the uh, area uh, can also be uh, removed uh, with a micro debrider. Um, this is uh, much quicker uh, and still leaves behind the mucoperichondrium, um, but also has the advantage of, of suctioning away the blood at the same time um, as you are removing the uh, mucosal lining. But then the actual uh, operation is exactly the same. So, as I said, a majority of patients uh, find this helpful. I've, I've done it in 121 individuals. Um, but unfortunately, like all skin grafts, it tends to contract with time. And so it's not, again, a long-term strategy. 
most patients get months or years of benefit, but eventually um, the problem does uh, get worse. And you can see here in the upper uh, photograph, a um, graph that had been done eight years earlier and uh, then revised. And you can see that the telangiectasia have recurred around the edge of the graph. They rarely um, come through the graft, um, but you do see them uh, in association. So it is possible to revise the septodermoplasty. I've certainly done it um, uh, twice and occasionally three times. Um, however, the skin is not a mucosal surface and therefore you do get some crusting on the graft as you can see in the lower photographs. You will get lesions in front of the graft on the uh, junction with the skin and certainly um, it's not possible uh, usually to graft the side wall of the nose uh, very well. I have done it. Um, it is possible to take away some of the mucosa and the turbinates, but it's never quite as successful as uh, grafting the septum. Is it worth doing? Well, we did a study some years ago, uh, Richard Harvey and I looked at uh, over 300 procedures on over 130 of my patients who had had KTP laser and then uh, 33 of them had also gone on to have a septodermoplasty. And we looked at the interval between the two lasers or lasers that they were having and then between um, the septodermoplasty and the subsequent laser because most of them did go on to require more laser treatment in due course. But what it showed, as I've already mentioned, is that after having a septodermoplasty, there was a 57% reduction in the need for a subsequent laser within the five year study period. So it does prolong um, the intervals for needing further treatment. And I would say that on balance, it's a very worthwhile procedure. Now, some people have used um, oral hormones in these patients um, since the observations that um, there are uh, alterations in the incidence of epistaxis in association with the menstrual cycle and taking um, hormones such as the contraceptive pill. And it has been suggested that the hormones create uh, a protective layer of squamous metaplasia over the lesions. So uh, there was a Vogue, and I certainly used it in some patients in the uh, 80s, 70s and 80s, with uh, giving oral ethanol estradiol. But you have to give it in quite large doses to get the effect. And whilst for many uh, ladies of a certain age, it wasn't a big problem, if you give it to young men, of course, the feminizing effects are quite uh, unpleasant. And if you use it long term, there is the potential uh, for cardiovascular effects and even uh, carcinogenesis. So we've uh, tended to move away from using uh, oral estrogens to using tamoxifen. Now, as you know, this is an estrogen receptor antagonist. It um, can be used in both men and women. It does have some potential side effects, which I've listed here. But as I'll show you, the reality is that the vast majority of patients have no side effects at all. And they, um, there have been several randomized controlled trials, particularly done in Israel, showing significant improvement in bleeding and quality of life um, with the use of tamoxifen. So we tend to give uh, 20 milligrams a day um, to patients. Uh, I ask them to take it for three months and to keep a diary to see if there is any improvement. And then they can carry on with it if they wish to. Up to uh, around five years is the recommended duration. We've got 84 patients on tamoxifen at the present time, and it has proved effective in the vast majority. A few have not found it effective and have stopped, and a couple have stopped through, due to some minimal side effects. But it is an option for for patients if they uh, are willing to consider it. Uh, raloxifen is an alternative possibly for tamoxifen uh, and the reason for considering it is that it can be used for longer than five years and has some similar uh, effects um, as tamoxifen. So that may well be uh, something for the future. And of course, you do have the option of using estrogens in cream in the nose. However, the studies rather suggest that their effectiveness, if any, is just due to lubrication. And the same applies to the use of uh, triple ointment regimes. Uh, we sometimes give patients mupiracin, fusidic acid and neomycin, either as ointments or creams. Uh, but I think if they work, they only work by protecting the telangiectasia um, as a lubricant. And of course, can even create a, a nosebleed if in patients who have severe uh, HHT. There are a few commercial things available now and some patients like uh, nasal gel, uh, which is produced by the same people as uh, Sterimar, and this contains aloe vera and can be quite soothing. 
Another drug that I've been uh, using more in recent years is tranexamic acid, and this can certainly be taken as a tablet uh, when the patient is uh, going to do something where they don't want to have any nosebleeds, or indeed in an acute situation. Topical sprays of uh, tranexamic acid can be used, but of course you've got to be able to get it into the nose, so it isn't so useful in an acute bleeding situation. Of course, it's always a balance between controlling uh, the bleeding, uh, but also not causing uh, excessive clotting. So they can't take the tranexamic acid as well as tamoxifen, um, because both of these could obviously uh, increase your chances of having a, a side effect from the increased clotting time. Now, what about Avastin? This has been around now for some time. It's certainly got properties that might make it very helpful in HHT. It's been used intravenously uh, for particularly uh, for hepat uh, hepatatic uh, um, AVMs, and it has been used topically in the nose uh, in conjunction with laser treatment. Um, there are potential side effects, certainly used intravenously. Uh, there have been septal perforations reported, and there have been a number of trials, though, in fact, um, only four were randomized control trials with um, over 350 patients. But a, a relatively recent systematic review did not show any evidence of benefit over and above the other treatments that were being used uh, in conjunction with the Avastin. I've not used it myself. We tried to do a trial, um, but the company were very reluctant to um, support it. And I always uh, find that a little bit suspicious. So I am not able to advise you one way or another on this, except to say, um, so far, the evidence is not persuasive. Now, finally, what about those patients who are really very severely affected, for whom the other treatments I've mentioned are simply not sufficient? Well, um, back in the uh, 1990s, I heard Jack Gluckman speak about closing the nose in three patients with HHT. One of them um, opened it themselves with their finger, another asked him to reopen the nose, and the third patient actually kept the nose closed. And um, by doing so, he was able to stop the nosebleeds. Now, why would that work? Well, the, the little lesions are very fragile. Even airflow can actually create bleeding. And therefore, if you stop the airflow, you will stop the bleeding. But that stopping of airflow has to be complete. You cannot even have a tiny pinhole allowing air to get in. So it must be complete closure of the nose. And if you can achieve that, then you can stop the bleeding completely. Now, how do we do it? Well, Young um, described an operation for atrophic uh, rhinitis back in the 1950s, in which he described uh, raising two flaps of skin, which were closed together down the, the midline. But that leaves you with a little hole at the top and a little hole at the bottom. So I modified this by the addition of a small flap in the uh, lower part of the nasal vestibule. And that gives you a sort of a, a trefoil appearance, which my registrar pointed out uh, looked like a Mercedes badge, which is um, a good one for me as I have always had a Mercedes car. <laughs> And this just shows you how to do the operation. You make a circumferential incision at the myocutaneous junction. Now you have to do this extremely carefully. These patients are the worst patients. They bleed if you look at them. And so you have to be extremely gentle and very careful when you do this. So does the anesthetist when they put them under general anesthesia. And having made that circumferential incision, you then make uh, three incisions uh, from the uh, 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 circumferential incision towards uh, the uh, edge of the uh, uh, nares at 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock. Now the nose will be full of old clot, the patient can't breathe anyway because their nose is blocked with um, old uh, congealed blood. Do not try and remove that congealed blood, just leave it, it will gradually disappear with time. And then we retrogradely raise the flaps, uh, leaving ideally the cartilage behind. If you include the lateral, uh, lateral cartilage or the cartilage is coming down onto the um, uh, front of the septum there, you will end up with a flap that doesn't sit so well. Um, so try and leave those behind. Obviously, be very careful not to make a hole in the uh, flap. And at the end, you want to be very uh, generous with your mobilization and the size of the flap. So the flaps come together and sit uh, very loosely. Uh, so when they're stitched, there is no tension between them. You don't want to have any uh, tension in the repair, as you see here. 
Now, what I do is very carefully put some little cubes of um, gel foam into the nose, soaked in a little bit of adrenaline or a little bit of antibiotic solution. And they're there just to support the flaps a little bit. I'm going to stitch the flaps with uh, some dissolvable suture material, usually a 5-0. And you will see here that um, this has to be done very meticulously. Um, take This probably takes the longest part of the operation. And uh, particularly at the sort of three point turn in the middle, you need to get it absolutely airtight and watertight. So it takes a little bit of time. I usually do some mattress sutures. And again, you need to be really very uh, careful at the um, superior part of the incision. Um, and as I say, at this sort of three point turn in the middle. Now you'll see here that I'm doing both sides of the nose. I usually uh, do both sides in most of the patients when they're this severe. But as I'll show you with the results, occasionally um, we do do one side, particularly if the patient is a bit concerned about having both sides done, or if they have one side which is significantly worse for bleeding than the other. And it's certainly possible to do one side as long as the patient does not have a septal perforation, because if they have a septal perforation, then there will be airflow from one side into the other and the operation won't work. So here you see at the end of the operation, being very careful that it's completely closed and putting a little bit of um, uh, antibiotic cream there just to protect it from the patient sort of touching it. We tell them not to do anything at all to the nose. Don't try and uh, take the scab away. Don't clean it. Just wait till the sutures just dissolve and come away. And here you see uh, the end result. Now, at this point, it's very obvious that the patient has had something done to the nose uh, and uh, patients need to be reassured that uh, with time, what will happen is the flaps and the skin will contract. And within a few months, it will be impossible to see that the nose has been closed from the outside. The only giveaway is the fact that the patient is now breathing through their mouth. So this is an operation that I've done in 105 patients. As I've said, most of them have had both sides done. I've done a unilateral closure on 20 if there's no septal perforation. Six of those went on to have the other side closed after a few months. And there have been a few where I've needed to do some revisions because a tiny pinhole opened. In eight, it was possible to close that primarily. In two, I needed nasolabial flaps. So if we look at 85 of the patients who had, who had bilateral closure, I was able to get complete closure in 83 of those, that was 98% of them, and in those, nine, 81 of those 83 had no further epistaxis at all. Now, of course, the problem is that you have to keep it closed. If you reopen it, then the bleeding will start again. I haven't time to entertain you with various stories about this, but be assured that once it's closed, although it can be technically reopened, it has to remain closed for life. If we look at the group as a whole, um, many of the patients have had multiple therapies. Um, obviously, they um, have to um, consider whether they what they want to go for first, but some start with a laser, then go on to a graft and finally have a nasal closure. And you can see, therefore, that laser is the most common treatment for these patients. Some have had additional medical therapy, about a, a fifth of them. Uh, nearly a quarter have had septodermoplasty. And as you've seen, about a fifth have had their nose closed. We've done quite a few studies looking at the effects of the treatment. This was a study looking at the epistaxis grading score uh, before and after treatment. As you'd expect, the KTP laser didn't have a, a significant effect in the long term because they had repeated treatments. But septodermoplasty certainly reduced the baseline epistaxis score um, from 6.1 to 3.7 at a year, which was significant, though some of them did still require um, blood uh, transfusions. And here we see uh, the uh, nasal closure group at the bottom in pink with a score approaching the maximum score. Maximum score is 10. They on average scored 9.3 at the start. And then it plummeted after the closure to naught and one up to 12 months in uh, the 50 uh, patients in the study. So this was highly significant and none of them required blood transfusions um, thereafter. Of course, they do have some side effects. Uh, the majority um, noticed, uh, sorry, 40% of them noticed um, decrease in sense of smell or taste. But overall, the side effects are very minor. And you have to remember that these patients have life threatening disease. They can't go out except to go to the hospital for a blood transfusion. They um, have a blood 
uh, hemoglobin of about six, um, and they are extremely sick and can succumb from their disease. So we only do this when the situation is absolutely desperate. And really, the uh, I think the test is, I asked in this particular study, uh, how many of you would be prepared to undergo the procedure again? And 100% scored the maximum score that they would be prepared to have it done again. And similarly, they would recommend it to another patient in the same situation. Now, obviously, it's a strange thing to do to patients. Some of them are concerned. And I always get uh, some of our patients who've already had the operation uh, to talk to uh, prospective patients who are thinking of undergoing a nasal closure because they will describe all the pros and cons and that is a much more powerful message coming from a patient who's had it done than from me um, who might be trying to persuade them that it's the thing they should have. So finally, if I can share this algorithm with you, you can see that we can divide the patients broadly into those who require blood transfusions and those who don't. Blood transfusions for their nosebleeds, and that in turn allows us to divide them up into mild, severe, with a sort of moderate case in the middle. The mild case do well with uh, coagulating laser, as I've shown you. The uh, more severe cases who require regular blood transfusions uh, do best with nasal closure. It's not a, it's not a cure, but it is the only treatment I know at the moment that can stop the bleeding completely and really gives the patients their lives back. And then in the middle, you have a group who, for whom the septodermoplasty or some of the medical treatments uh, can be helpful. So um, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and um, hope that we'll be able to um, have some questions. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lund, uh, thank you so much for such an enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure that there are many questions for this master, but um, because of the further interest of time, I think we have to move to the next talk. Here's one thing for you. Uh, we have a separate Zoom link. Uh, you can go to the chatting and you can have, uh, you can access to the separate Zoom link where you can enjoy discussion with um, many participants. Thank you again. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I will do that. Bye bye. Bye bye. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Pretorius. Uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, would you uh, introduce the next speaker yeah. and then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Hello. Hello. Uh, I, uh, I am Yang Wo Zhang, head and surgeon, mm. professor of Asa Medical Center. It is a great honor for me to introduce this, this excellent clinician. Mark, Dr. Mark Protarius is uh, chief of the Division of Autonomous at the University Medical Center of Hamburg, Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, we are very great, grateful to have him speak today. The title is uh, Overview for Implantable Options in Patients with Sensitive Neural Hearing Loss. Dr. Fratarius, uh, please start your talk. Dear colleagues, I'd like to give you in the next uh, 18 odd minutes an overview for implantable options in patients with sensory neural hearing loss. And uh, for the busy of uh, you takeaway in advance, um, my points are that at 65 dB presentation level and you have less than 80% speech discrimination in monosyllables, consider hearing aids. And uh, if you have hearing aids in the patient and they have a speech discrimination of 60% or less monosyllables, consider cochlear implant diagnostics for treatment options down the road. Also, the chronological age is not the determining factor for the result of hearing in cochlear implantees. Also, if there's a partial hearing loss, uh, 
affecting the high frequencies that can be taken care of with implants too. So looking at uh, the frequency range where we need to perceive sound in order to have uh, speech discrimination, we can see that in the uh, elderly, the uh, higher frequencies get worse and that is uh, actually affecting speech discrimination quite a bit, especially if we have the sounds and vowels here presented in the same banana shape, um, we get all those high frequency parts uh, then for those uh, people affected um, being lost and thus uh, losing their speech discrimination abilities and uh, also um, the uh, participation in um, social activities. Of course, we uh, can give for the uh, people with um, sensory neuronal hearing loss, also the um, if there's um, part of a um, conductive uh, hearing loss, uh, as in autosclerosis, we can uh, provide them with um, passive implants in order to optimize the uh, transmission of sound and so that the uh, um, that the, the sensory neuronal part is um, uh, the only one here can a uh, um, titanium clip prosthesis be seen in place at the incus. Also other um, passive implants like this um, total ossicular replacement prosthesis um, seen here in a no, no glare mode under the microscope in place can also um, lift the hearing threshold into a region where a hearing aid later on can be sufficient. So if there is a chance to improve the conductive hearing loss part beforehand, one uh, should probably opt to do so. There's a vast um, range of possibilities in order to uh, provide patients with um, um, suitable options, and I'd like to highlight a few of them. First of all, it's not always a surgical option. Um, so if we have the uh, conventional hearing aids uh, coupled on the skin with a headband um, that is not really bone anchored, but is uh, the same type of um, um, hearing aid that can be worn with um, this um, um, head um, band in a even in a more childlike uh, flower uh, pattern or the uh, adhere that can be um, it has an adhesive band-aid type of um, socket to the skin those are fine solutions however they are not really for sensory neuronal hearing loss and any kind of a um, substantial extent. So uh, 25 dB should be the threshold for those. If we attach them straight to the skull bone, there, so we have the percutaneous solutions that are, according to the manufacturers, uh, have the names either the Baja or the Ponto. So for them, we have a range that is uh, um, sufficient in uh, uh, the area where we can actually um, supply here thresholds up to 35 in the simple version, 45, 45 in the 
um, more powerful and then the most powerful 55 dB. So these are the real audiologic thresholds that can be aided. Um, the manufacturers usually add an optimistic 10 dBs to this um, threshold. The application is uh, indeed quite simple with a um, skin incision and placing of the, the bone anchor and a uh, few sutures, something that can actually be done in under local anesthesia uh, quite well. That is a, has been a further development as um, beforehand you had to actually thin the skin here um, to the maximum thinness and have uh, basically the, the screw here on the, on the bone level. Now with uh, the, uh, the, the abutments have been redesigned so that they can actually penetrate through the skin. If one is not comfortable in uh, placing um, this through the intact skin, it can also be um, implemented into the suture. The uh, thresholds can be um, also um, really close to um, the um, bone uh, conductive um, threshold and uh, be. Uh, this is a, a good solution in um, cases of a normal inner ear and if the outer ear has some malfunction, um, but also it can, as, uh, as shown in the previous slides, um, the, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, power left if there is um, impairment of the bone conduction too. If we have the transcutaneous um, part that is um, active, we uh, come to the bone bridge that has been redesigned so that the, uh, the depth that needs to be drilled out has become less than five millimeters, which um, seems to be better appropriate for the bone thickness that's usually available. And here we get into also the 35 dB range. And we uh, can see here the, the difference between the, uh, the older design that uh, has been uh, lifted here in this uh, young boy's skull and the new one that lifts basically itself by the new design. Um, those are MRI compatible up to 1.5 Tesla. Also here it can be seen that the uh, that it actually works here with uh, um, the uh, combined hearing loss and it's a, um, a slight overclosure in the main speech uh, frequencies and uh, the, uh, the hearing threshold and speech perception gets into quite nice ranges with this. If we look at um, the uh, passive transcutaneous transmission. I'd like to point out the Sophono uh, product that um, can be supplied here through intact skin. And uh, also here we have a generous indication that is probably up to 30, 35 and uh, can also be used from um, the fifth birthday onwards and is uh, MRI compatible. Here you have to drill um, two um, footprints for the, the, the magnet, but there's also basically an, an upside down method where this is not uh, needed. And uh, there's um, the, uh, the space where this gets attached. For active transcutaneous uh, solutions, um, we uh, have on the one side the sound bridge that has basically a conventional uh, application and an enhanced application. The conventional is um, with the uh, um, ossicular chain usually intact and moving. 
while the enhanced one uh, looks just at the um, bone conduction threshold um, with no regards to the ossicular chain whatsoever. We have plenty of options in order to attach that via the round window, which would be the enhanced one, um, or to the um, long process of the incus, which would be the uh, um, conventional one here with a newly developed attachment clip. Um, also, for less drilling, the short process attachment has been developed so that uh, there's no need for posterior tympanotomy and no risk for the cord or the facial nerve, where with a specialized clip, this can be quite easily applied into the antrum. However, care must be taken that the ossicular chain is uh, never uh, touched with the drill, which uh, is um, sometimes in this approach also a quite, a, quite a challenge in itself. Here we have this um, um, combined hearing loss in a patient where a round window attachment here with a, a soft coupler for the round window has been uh, done. And uh, here we have a nice overclosure in the main speech frequencies for that patient. So this is a really powerful and very versatile tool that we have in the otology practice. Then for um, nearly lost cases of uh, combined hearing loss, we have the DAX solution, or rather I should say we had the DAX solution that I regardless would like to show here as a potential option. It is um, placed here in a region where the, the bone conduction is um, quite impaired and the uh, um, air threshold uh, doesn't matter basically. And it's placed between the cochlear implants and the conventional hearing aids. So in the, um, that part, we uh, have a, a double procedure, basically. We uh, implant um, an actuator that is screwed in a notch in the skull. And we place a new incus into the middle ear where we eventually place, um, after producing a hole into the stapes foot plate, a stapes uh, piston prosthesis that is um, basically mechanized and uh, applies tremendous amounts of uh, pressure, of sound pressure levels into the inner ear. So this is way in the three digit ranges. So for this, we can see a, a patient that has from the speech perception and from the audiogram, basically a cochlear implant um, candidacy. And with the um, DAX in place, we get an overclosure here still into definitely not a very good hearing uh, thresholds, as we can see here. However, this is basically instantaneous and is still um, something that doesn't need um, rehab for relearning the hearing. So patients that experience this gain actually do have a, a really um, high level of satisfaction that can be seen. So summarizing, I'd like to point out that we have plentiful options to treat the hearing loss of the sensory neural kind. We uh, definitely try to uh, get the speech perception comparable at the 65 dB level. And uh, 
we uh, can use conventional hearing aids, optimize the middle ear function, and have implantable options. However, if they should fail to provide um, a speech understanding in satisfactory um, extent, we always can consider also a cochlear implant as a solution. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Fratarios. Yeah, it is great uh, lecture. Yeah, it was a very good lecture. It was uh, easy to understand. Uh, just even for just uh, like a uh, pathetic surgeon <laughs> like me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is no uh, question suggested and, and now. Let me ask you some question. Okay. Yeah. And now, actually, you suggested many uh, surgical options for a sensory or hearing loss. If there, if, if there is the bilateral cases, what is the best option for implanta implantable options? The bilateral cases are um, basically mm -hmm do not really differ from um, um, and they are actually the, the the cases that can be better served because if the if you have a, a single sided um, um, sensory neuronal hearing loss that uh, needs is still in the range of the um, acoustic or uh, like vibratory um, enhancement uh, options then uh, you can easily get basically the, the better ear involved in this too. And you uh, don't benefit just from the one side as much as it uh, could be. So it's, uh, it's, well, from the perspective of serving, it's easier if it's a bilateral case. Of course, for the patient, it's better if there's still one good ear available uh, regardless. And then there is a, a one, one more question. Why do why do you use docs if the patient is a candidate for CI? Well, the the first answer could be because you can. And um, I think the uh, the uh, acoustic um, hearing abilities are still way closer to the ones that are, we are used to. And the, the, the impression of the sound or the sound um, perceived is um, for sure closer to the sound that we um, are used to than the ones that even uh, the most modern um, cochlear implant um, strategies provide. So um, you have basically an, an instant gain in your speech perception um, and not something that has to build slowly during uh, a rehab process. Mm -hmm. So the, from that uh, perspective, it's a very handy, or it had been a very handy solution. Okay, actually there is a more question and then for congenital profound spiroidal sensory hearing loss, a, is bone anchored hearing aid still an option? Meaning a, yeah, congenital the, the profound here, um, Yeah, yeah this, uh, this, um... Bone I anchored hearing aid that is just this. glued. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that um, has uh, needs definitely a, um, an inner ear function that is very very close to normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if this works, um, of course, uh, other um, bone conductive uh, implantable um, options um, have a very good predicted outcome. Okay. 
And the, the other question is, is there any implantable devices on vidrier structure for sensory heroes that mentioned in your lecture that didn't mention in your lecture? Absolutely, I didn't go through the whole uh, history of uh, implants <laughs> that would start with the Tika 3001. Mm -hmm. And um, also uh, the, uh, the Carina device or the Autologix device that has been around, but are at, at, at some point not readily available anymore, at least in the, in the German market that I overlook. Okay. And then the, the last one is, uh, uh, do you have experience with AD here? Do you think it provides a better experience than bone conduction hearing it, hear, hair band? It uh, may be a good solution um, because it's um, sticking uh, to the skin, but however, this, uh, this may be um, troublesome too. It, it uh, has no um, headband, that's uh, for sure an advantage, but it's uh, not as stable, of course, as uh, any headband solution. So in the very young population, um, I would probably still go for the um, headband. Okay. And then the last one is, uh, does it predict the outcome where on bone conduction implant surgery? Yeah, this is a, a kind of a long-term um, test um, device, basically. So if this uh, works out nicely, then an implantable solution, regardless if it's uh, the Baja, the Ponto, or the Bone Bridge, might have a, a very good outcome, yeah. Okay. Okay, you answered for every questions, and thank you for your nice lectures. And, and, then, and then we can move on to next lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good. I think then it is my turn. I think, um, um, can I, sorry. Um, I think we are still a little bit early um, and there may be, there may be attendees coming in just for, for, for the talk at, at the right time. So, if we do have any uh, any uh, intermittent um, uh, commercials or or news from from our sponsors, I think that would be that would be a good time now. Sorry, Dr. Beer, but um, we we should be on time. Otherwise, it's it's difficult to switch on and off. Thank you. Of course. Stealth Station ENT, the advanced image guidance system for the full range of navigated ENT procedures. Engineered with you in mind, based on decades of scientific, clinical, and engineering expertise, we're expanding what was previously possible with image-guided surgery. Flexible and elegantly designed, Stealth Station okay. ENT streamlines the workflow so you can maintain um, focus. And the flat under the head emitter allows for an efficient setup. For, um, for any, its design any allows gets, for a large uh, EM field. I, I guess we should probably get going. So, uh, Dr. Beer, I will, Easily I will find your patient's you. exam through a variety of network options. Okay, so I think the commercial is um, done. And uh, we go ahead with the next speaker. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Kvetz from Kiel University, uh, who is well known for his famous work in nasal reconstructive surgery. He's trained in ENT and facial plastics and has authored numerous publications on nasal surgery. I'm very honored. Um, Dr. Kreitz, to introduce you for your talk on nasal reconstruction. Hello. Hello. Please go ahead. 
So it's a pre-recorded um, lecture. I guess you, you just push the button. Dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that I've been invited to talk about subtotal and total nasal reconstruction. And I've limited this lecture to more or less the last 30 years because lots of things have changed in this period. I'm very sorry I can't see you and you can't see me either for some technical reasons uh, that will, will be solved until next time. I have no conflict of interests and all patients have agreed to be shown to professional audience. I'd like to use the term rhino neoplastic that has been introduced by Jak Josef. And I'd like to split the lecture in three parts. The first one looking backwards on 200 years, three big steps. The next one looking on the influence of Burgett and Menick, B and M, just abbreviations of their names, demonstrating three examples from their famous book. And then looking on three subtotal and total nasal reconstructions in my place in the last decade, maybe demonstrating the influence of Burgett and Manick and showing some further developments. Three big steps in 200 years. I guess you all know these famous pictures demonstrating the arrival of the Indian flap in London published in the beginning of the 19th century. But what about the lining and what about the framework? I'm quite sure that this perfect post-operative early result didn't last very long. The next huge step was taken by Jak Josef almost 100 years later by introducing the buco nasale lappen, the buco nasal flap for repair of the lining. And he introduced the oblique forehead flap for more length to reach the columella area easily, but still. What about the subsurface framework? From today's view, we would strongly recommend not to use oblique forehead flaps because many of the vertical vessels are destroyed and an actual pattern is turned to a random pattern flap. And please, don't use nasolabial flaps in the first place for repair of the lining because in at least 10% of subtotal and total nasal repair, you will need them to mend minor or major complications. The next big step forward was less than 100 years later when the book of Burgett and Manick Aesthetic Reconstruction of the Nose appeared on the market in 1993. Let's have a quick look into the book. Just looking at three examples out of many, many others. The first example is about the paramedian forehead flap compared to the oblique forehead flap. I've put these sketches onto the drawing from the book. And by putting the vessels of the original drawing onto this picture, it becomes obvious that many vertical vessels are destroyed thus turning an actual pattern flap to a random pattern flap. So don't do it this way.
one of those wonderful drawings from the book showing all the details of how to harvest a paramedian forehead flap. The second example is the septal pivot flap or the septal rotation flap, a very robust and solid foundation of a subtotal or total nasal reconstruction. I have animated the picture starting with a little cartilaginous wedge that's taken out to make this septum rotatable. And when it's completely detached from the surrounding frame, just preserving the mucosal bridges around the spine area, a double pedicled three-layered flap can be rotated, can be pivoted out of the nasal cave and thus building this solid foundation, the neoseptum of the new nose. Another drawing from the book showing the septal pivot flap that has been detached from the rhino basis with the straight scissors, has been loosened from the dorsal part and now has to be detached from the pre-maxilla area. Now a two pedicled three-layered flap is created. The supralabial arteries are running into this flap and the width of the pedicles have to be 10 or rather 15 millimeters on both sides. The patient on the table, an expanded paramedian forehead flap on the right side will be harvested later on. The remnants of the old nose are prepared to contribute some inner lining as turn over or turn in flaps and the septal pivot flap has been completely detached from its inner septum. Just the two mucosal bridges of about 12 millimeter have been prepared and now a guiding suture is pulling and a single prone hook is pushing from behind and the septum is rotated outside and fingers can do a very good job to pull out gently the last centimeter so the septum is completely rotated outside foundation of the new nose and the mucosa has already been prepared and will contribute an enormous amount of lining to the new nose. The third and last example, the template for total nasal reconstruction, a drawing and a photo one to one in the book. I copied it and you can copy it. It is such a valuable and helpful tool. I would never go into the operating room without my sterile template. And I would always mold it this way. You see it on the right side. And even in subtotal or smaller cases, I would then cut it down to the size I need in this special case. So never without. I'd like to use the next 10 minutes
on demonstrating the advances of the last 10 years, presenting three big cases, meaning subtotal and total nasal repair. Three middle-aged ladies. On the left side, a subtotal defect after squamous cell carcinoma. In the middle, a subtotal defect after a dog bite, a bit bigger than it looks like. And on the right side, a total defect again after a squamous cell carcinoma. First, the subtotal defect after squamous cell carcinoma, demonstrating the traditional three-stage procedure almost 10 years ago with the first step septal rotation, if available, then restoring of the lining and the paramedian forehead flap. It starts with a septal rotation flap that's rotated outside and helps pulling up the tip into the original position and it adds some mucosa to the lining. The rest of the lining in this case could be reconstructed by remnants of the old nose as turn in or turn over flaps. On the right side, the complete lining could be restored this way. The paramedian forehead flap from the right side as a full thickness flap is harvested and rotated downwards. The harvesting defect reduced by tension sutures at about one third and the flap will be now connected to the lining. After about four weeks or a bit later, maybe six weeks, the second step is performed, re-elevation and thinning of the paramedian forehead flap and restoring reconstruction of the subsurface framework. The flap has been re-elevated and carefully thinned very conservatively in the tip area and in the most distal portion of the new nostril of the ala base. The framework, the subsurface framework has been reconstructed by rib cartilage on the left side and on the right side details and dead spaces have been filled up and refined with diced cartilage, with cartilaginous chips, with some perichondrium and all the material has been soaked in advance in gentamicin. After about six to eight weeks, the last step can be taken, division of the pedicle and maybe minor revisions. At that time, the nose should be in the final, in a good or even perfect shape if not, the division of the pedicle should be postponed and an intermediate revision should be taken for aesthetic and functional refinement. The patient one week after division of the pedicle, the skin of, of the short pedicle has been used to cover the lower part of the harvesting defect, which is not covered by the shadow, not camouflaged by the shadow of the hairdo. The side view, little swelling because there have been quite a long time between the second and the last step, three quarter view.
the patient one year later, you might say that the nose is a bit overprojected, but it's very close to the nose that she had lost. And you should see the noses here in northern Germany. That's quite normal. Subtotal defect after a dog bite. I had the chance to operate on her myself right after the accident and I connected the outside skin of the right side to the inner septum on the left side, planning to use the skin later on as a turn over flap for lining on the left side. Result after a couple of months for planning on screen, the picture, the photo has to be rotated in an absolutely horizontal position. And for the planning itself, I liked, like to use PowerPoint tools, starting with a with an rectangle positioned on one half of the nose, dotted half transparent, so you still can see the the photo below. The rectangle is copied and put to the other side. That gives a framework which allows to have full control about what you are doing right now. Outlining the more or less intact right side then mirroring this side to the other side, putting it into the box. And now you have a correct idea about the basis of the new ala and about the symmetry of the new half of the nose. Planning on screen is of utmost importance. This procedure has to be repeated for all the important views and has to be repeated after and before every single surgical step. Because of a low hairline, we had to use a skin expander. A hundred milliliter had been filled in in two and a half months. And the question is right now, do we have enough non-hair bearing skin? Is the pedicle long enough for total nasal repair? And again, PowerPoint tools are very helpful. The new nose is lined out and this contour is pushed upwards and spread out on the expander showing yes it's almost enough so it's uh, at the border of the hair that means we should expand a bit more let's say 120 milliliters and then she is ready for reconstruction skin expansion sorry a mistake Skin expansion is very useful in such cases. The surgical steps, the outside skin from the right side is now the lining of the left side. Before outlining the template onto the expanded skin, about 30% of the contents should be extracted to prevent unwanted shrinking. Then the flap is incised, comes down easily, no hair bearing skin. Primary closure of the forehead was almost possible and for little gaps like this one, there are always skin excisions on the table that can be filled in. 
the result a couple of weeks later the nose is now waiting for the next step re-elevation and reconstruction of the framework result after one year we suggested an aesthetic revision for removal of the little hump refinement of tip and columella and the left ala she agreed and is on the schedule for next year and that's what we tell our patients for subtotal and total nasal repair that they have to face five operations the first one skin expander the last one division of the pedicle and the fourth operation normally aesthetic revision in her case we do the aesthetic refinement after division of the pedicle last patient total nasal repair photos adjusted for the constructional drawings skin expander filled with more than 100 milliliters and checked with the powerpoint tools lining out forehead and expanded skin rotating it downwards and yes it's uh, enough skin for total nasal repair permanent control of what has been achieved is of utmost importance i like to start with a private picture lining out the contour of the original nose and then lining up all the pictures before and after each surgical step side by side this way the photo on the right side doesn't show the final result of course it still has to undergo the final aesthetic revision before the pedicle will be divided The same procedure starts with a profile with a private picture and all the surgical steps lined up again with, in this case, the final result on the right side. And if you are experienced and lucky the patient likes the new nose as much as the old one or even more final result after one year patient and surgeon satisfied good breathing inconspicuous new nose take home messages for rhino neoplastic a decision for total nasal repair should be based on some photos showing your results perhaps not the best ones to keep expectations low and the patient has to know that she or he has to face about five operations at least the standard template should always be at hand sterile one for all analysis with standardized and adjusted photos on screen for example with powerpoint tools is 
of utmost importance for good for superior results. Skin expansion is in many cases necessary and in many other cases a wonderful tool for perfect results for more or less traceless reconstruction. The septal rotation flap seems to be very robust. We amazingly didn't lose any in more than 30 cases, so give it a try. The permanent follow-up of profile and frontal view by lining up the pre- and post-operative pictures is essential. And please divide the pedicle only when the nose is in the final, more or less perfect condition. Thank you so much for your attention and I do hope that we see again in the near future. Thank you very much, Dr. Kretz, for this uh, wonderful talk uh, on a very, um, very uh, um, difficult issue, nasal reconstruction. Um, we have some important or interesting questions. Um, so the first would be, how long do you think would you put the skin expander um, prior to reconstructive surgery in the patient? How long should it last? Sorry, can you um, uh, uh, can you put me on screen? It's uh, it says that I am blocked that you can't see me just for the moment. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Um, you should push the button to make me visible. <laughs> now, oh, yeah, it's now, you're visible. now it's yeah. now it's working. Um, now it's working. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just. <laughs> I was busy, busy with the technique. Could you please repeat the question? Of course. So here's the question. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. And how long would you put the skin expander um, in the patient prior to reconstructive surgery? Um, uh, first of all, uh, sorry, you couldn't see the video of the septal rotation. It just didn't move. So that was more or less the, had been the highlight of the of the lecture, but nevertheless, um, I would take two or even three months for the skin ex expansion. Uh, two months would be the normal uh, uh, time, expanding it up to 100 milliliter or 120 milliliters or so, so we, d we don't have hair bearing skin for on the nose. And a direct question to that, uh, how many times do you see the patient in between? Um, normally, the patients uh, come from elsewhere, so the, uh, the uh, expansion, the, the, the weekly injections, that's normally once a week, the injection is normally done by somebody else. Uh, the, the, the clinic, for example, who has, uh, who has sent the patient. Uh, if I do it myself, I see them just once a week uh, to give this little injection. The injection okay. amount would be uh, up to 10 milliliters per time, and then it goes down. Okay. And another question is, um, what do you do when you don't have anything left? So in, in cases where the whole nose is missing, also um, including the septum, what's your recommendation? How do you, do you then um, reconstruct the inner lining? Um, if there is really nothing left, no nasal bone, no cartilage, no inner septum. I would uh, put a big expander or two expanders for two paramedian forehead flaps. And then I would probably take about uh, three months to expand the two uh, flaps. And then I would put one paramedian flap on the inside and the other on the outside. Alternatively, uh, well, in, in previous years, I would uh, I would have done a, a, a forearm flap, 
but today I would rather expand and take two flaps at the same time, mm -hmm. which is quite comfortable. Okay. And another question from the audience is, what's your opinion or recommendation on cream lamination for inner lining and stability? Principally, I like this method. Um, that means you just pr cut uh, the, the typical shape of a total nasal repair or a segment out of this and put split screen, a, a split skin on the backside and, and put it with some suture points back to the forehead and then wait until a couple of weeks until the skin has, has been attached, has taken from the backside of the for, uh, for, uh, forehead flap. I personally feel a bit obstructed in, sculpt, in sculpturing the nose, give, given the final molding, the final nose. So I personally very rarely use this technique, but in principle, I think it's safe and it's a good way. Mm -hmm. And uh, a question from myself. So when you have patients who had um, um, uh, cell carcinoma of the nose, what do you think is the best time to start reconstructing? And what's your recommendation uh, for in between? So if, uh, in between uh, the, um, the resection of the, uh, the tumor and starting the reconstruction? That's a very good question because we used to uh, primarily uh, reconstruct um, patients after ablation of the nose. And this, uh, this from today's point of view, I would say it's a big mistake. You have to, for oncologic reasons, you have to wait one and a half up to two years. In dangerous cases, um, I would today wait full two years. And for the intermediate time, I would do a bone anchored uh, prosthesis. They, they can be perfect. And it's, it's a good way for the patient to find out if he want to undergo all the surgery or if he perhaps or she likes, uh, likes the uh, prosthesis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Quetz. I, unfortunately, we have to stop yes. now uh, because the time is running out. And I thank you very much. We can okay. go on uh, the discussion panel, as everybody know. You see the link in, in, uh, on the side. Please use it. And I would like to introduce the next speaker. It's Dr. Isham Mehana. He's the chair uh, of head and neck surgery at the University of Birmingham. He has a keen interest in clinical and translational research. His research has changed clinical practice around the world. And he's also a director uh, of the Institute of Head and Neck Studies and Education at the Institute of Cancer and Genomic Sciences. He's a head and neck and a thyroid surgeon with clinical interests in recurrence in thyroid and parathyroid surgery. So, uh, Professor Mehana, we are um, happy to have your talk now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be with you. Um, it's also pre-recorded, so I think it's going to start and then I'm happy to take questions after. Hello, my name is Professor Hisham Mahana. I'm the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Birmingham in the UK and the Director of the Institute of Head and Neck Studies and Education there. I'm speaking to you today on common crimes in surgical research. You may say, well, I'm a clinician. What's that got to do with me? Why is it important to do high quality research? Well, put simply, because it saves lives. And put more dramatically, because poor quality research actually kills patients. And I'll be demonstrating this to you over the next few minutes. So what are the common crimes of surgical research? Well, there are three main types. The effect of inadequate power, type two error, the effect of multiple analyses, the so-called type one error, and the over-interpretation of data. We'll go through each of these in turn. I want to first explain uh, the um, concept of sample size. For every effect that you wish to study in a certain population, it's difficult to study the whole population. So you take a sample to uh, estimate 
the effect size within the whole population. And that sample size, there's a set sample size to help ensure accurate estimation of the overall effect size. The sample size depends on the effect size that you're looking at, the frequency of the event in the population, but it does not depend on the size of the available population. What does that mean? Well, let's take an example. You want to look and study transoral surgery and see if it's better than chemoradiotherapy for oropharyngeal cancer patients. Well, the sample size depends on how big the effect size is. How much of a difference in survival are you looking to, to identify? Do you think transoral surgery will be 5% better survival, 10%, 20%, 50%? The higher the percentage, the smaller the sample size you will need. It will also depend on how common the event rate is, the death rate in this case. So what's the control, what's the mortality rate for patients having chemoradiotherapy? Is it 50% five-year mortality, or is it 20%, or is it 10%? The more, the more common the mortality, the higher the mortality, the smaller the sample size that you will require. However, the sample size in this case does not depend on the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer patients in the population. You could have 10 patients having oropharyngeal cancer, or 10 million, it won't affect the sample size. All it will affect is how quickly you can recruit and finish your study. So in pictorial terms, let's take a, a, a look. This is a population and it has patients who have events in yellow. And the event rate, as you can see here, is 30%, okay? Now, if I take a sample size, if I take a sample size of 20 patients out of this 100 patients, we count the event rate, it's still 30%. But actually, in, in reality, events don't happen in a regular fashion. They can happen haphazardly. So if I was to take the first 20 in this population, I would get an event rate of only 10%. It would underestimate the overall event rate, the overall um, uh, rate of, of uh, mortality, let's say, in this population. What I need to, in this small population, is take a much bigger sample size to get an accurate estimation of the true uh, event rate. So the first crime is what we call inadequate power, type 2 error, and having an insufficiently large sample size. So the sample size is not large enough to detect the true effect. And so that results in incorrectly missing a true effect when it actually is there. A bit like this situation. Let me give you an example from research and, in, and recent research. We know that elective neck dissection for early oral cancer for many years was based on these two randomized studies. One in 1980, one uh, a couple of decades later, which had shown that there was no difference between elective neck dissection and surveillance when it comes to survival. So as a result, people were offering patients either an elective neck dissection or surveillance, uh, but not pushing one or the other. But in 2015, uh, the Tata Memorial Blue Group, led by Anil de Cruz, published this randomized controlled trial in the New England Journal. And they randomized patients to an elective neck dissection or to watch and wait. And if the patient got um, a pathological node, um, then they did a therapeutic neck dissection at that point. And the result was astounding. There was a 12.5% absolute difference in absolute survival between the elective neck dissection group and the surveillance group. So why did these studies miss that effect? Well, as you can see here, the studies only had 75 patients each. They were not big enough they, to detect the true event rate. And therefore, they were underpowered 
And in underpowered studies, negative findings do not mean non-significance, do not mean that there is no effect. You just can't tell. Well, so you tell me, so what? Well, let's take, you know, extend this. Let's say, um, I think there are about 15,000 patients who have early oral cancer in the USA each year. Oral cancer incidence is about 10.5% uh, 10 10.5 per 100,000. Let's assume that half of those were getting surveillance. You know, uh, some people were suggesting surveillance, some people were suggesting neck dissection. So half of those got surveillance each year, seven and a half thousand patients. And as I told you, the study showed a difference in survival of 12 and a half percent at five years. So over five years, 4,688 patients would have died unnecessarily because they were being offered surveillance instead of an elective neck dissection. Or put more positively, almost 5,000 more oral cancer patients would have survived in the US over the next five years due to the Tata Memorial trial, high quality research, saving lives. I guess that's a, one of those oh shit moments where we sit there and think, could we have done better? The second crime is the effect of multiple analyses, the type one error. So again, I want to, to stop at the concept and talk about the p-value. What does the p-value mean? We use it a lot, but what does it mean? A p-value of 0 0.05, which is the most commonly used p-value, means that there's a 5% chance, a one in 20 chance, that the result that you have is an error. It's not true. So if you do 30 such analyses, the probability that one of them is not true is 78.5%, meaning that at least 78% chance that at least one of those results is incorrect. The problem is you don't know which one. So the effect of multiple analyses, the type one error, is that you can identify a significant a difference that doesn't actually exist. You find by mistake something that looks significant, but actually it's not really significant, it's an error. A little bit like this situation. So what do you do? Well, if you're going to do multiple analyses, you need to make the p-value more stringent to account for the multiple tests. So you need to reduce the p-value from 0 0.05 to 0 0.01, then 0 0.001. If you're going to do 30 analyses, at p equals 0 0.01, there's still a 26% chance that one of these findings is an error. At 0 0.001, there's only a 3% chance that one of those 30 analyses is wrong. And that's an acceptable rate. Another example from research. Uh, Paul Parol Sinha and Bruce Howey uh, did some excellent work on transoral surgery for HPV positive disease. And in their first paper, which is a single institution retrospective study, they found that surgical margins, involved surgical margins, had a really high effect on mortality. Almost five, almost six times more likely to die than those patients with negative uh, surgical margins. And it was, uh, as you can see here, uh, almost five times uh, more likely in, in multivariate analysis with a p value of 0 0.3. They then did a further study, a bigger study, multi center study. But in that study of 700 patients, they found that actually positive margins did not have a significant effect on uh, mortality. So why was there a difference between those two studies? Well, this is the table three from the first study. And as you can see, they had done multiple analyses. So it's possible that that finding was a chance error. Multiple analyses give you a high risk of type one error. And that can lead to an overestimation of the effect of the intervention. 
the so-called fishing exercise. The third crime is an, the over-interpretation of data. So let me give you an example. Um, we all know the excellent work by the late Kian Ang, uh, which resulted in uh, the categorization of oropharyngeal cancer into low, intermediate, and high risk. The low risk patients had a, a three-year overall survival of 93%. That led people to saying, well, are we over-treating them? Um, are we giving them too much treatment and risking too much toxicity? Can we reduce the intensity of treatment? So people started looking for possible treatments. Uh, cetuximab had been published in 2006 by um, James Jim Bonner and shown to be effective or more effective than radiotherapy alone. And also the results reported suggested that it was, didn't have much more toxicity than radiotherapy on its own. And a five-year update analysis suggested that the patients who really uh, benefited from cetuximab were those oropharyngeal T1, T3, N1, N3 patients, suggestive of HPV positive disease. So this resulted in many people thinking, well, cetuximab may be a less toxic de-escalation agent. We started trials, the de-escalate trial, the RTOG 1016 trial. But unfortunately, some clinicians, and in some countries, many clinicians, changed routine clinical management to cetuximab from cisplatin without waiting to, to, for high quality evidence. Then several years later in 2018, the RTOG 1016 study was published and so was our study, the de-escalate study. We randomized patients into cisplatin and radiotherapy or cetuximab and radiotherapy. And these were HPV positive patients with oropharyngeal cancer. And the results were somewhat shocking, I have to say. In terms of toxicity, there was no difference between cetuximab and cisplatin, whether it was for severe, acute or late toxicities or all grade uh, toxicity. But the real surprise was in survival. Survival was significantly worse with cetuximab compared to cisplatin. There was a 7.5% difference in overall survival at two years, a hazards ratio of four, and adjusted hazards ratio of five, meaning that patients were five more times more likely to, to die if they had cetuximab. The real statistic that, that shocked me was the, uh, the numbers needed to treat for harm. That was 13. Out of every 13 patients, one died unnecessarily if they were treated with cetuximab compared to had they been treated with cisplatin. So what do you say? Well, let's look at this on the ground. Let's say that there were 100,000 patients who received cetuximab in the US and Europe instead of cisplatin over a 10 year period. The number needed to harm was 13. And therefore this translates into 7,900 and sorry, 7,692 patients who may have been alive if they hadn't been treated with cetuximab and had been treated with cisplatin instead. We're talking thousands of patients. Another one of those moments, I would say. But there has been progress. In 2010, uh, Drew Ridge, he likes to be called Drew from Andrew, Drew Ridge uh, gave the American Head and Neck Society presidential address. He called it, we show pictures, they show curves. And he bemoaned in it the fact that um, surgeons up till that point were you know, giving presentations, showing operations, showing how to do operations, et cetera, pictures of operations, whereas the oncologists were doing randomized trials and producing um, high quality data. And the data set, you know, supports his, his premise. Between 2001 and 2010, there were seven practice changing randomized trials published in the New England Journal and the Lancet, the two top um, clinical journals in the world. Seven trials. Those seven trials were first authored by 
four medical oncologists and three radiation oncologists. There were no surgeons first authoring any of those papers. But I'm really pleased to say that things have changed. Between 2011 and 2019, there have been also seven practice-changing randomized trials published in the New England Journal and Lancet for head and neck surgery. This time, however, they were first authored by two medical oncologists, one radiation oncologist, and four surgical oncologists. I think we've seen the rise of the head and neck surgeon scientist. The paper is by Anil de Cruz, our paper on pet neck, pet CT uh, from Birmingham, uh, the paper on nivalumab, uh, you know, an oncological paper first authored by a surgeon who's an immunologist, uh, Bob Ferris, and our paper, again from Birmingham, on de-escalate. So things have really improved for surgeons. We're now leading seminal trials. We're recruiting and supporting recruitment into trials, but we still need to do better. And the reason is that we're doing this where the trials don't impinge on our decision-making. So if you look at the ECOG 3311 study for transoral surgery, it recruited very quickly because the surgeons did the surgery and then they randomized into different types of radiotherapy. That was fine. But our COMPARE trial, where we were randomizing into surgery or chemoradiotherapy, did not recruit well, and we had to stop the surgical arm because our surgeon said, look, you know, we don't want to randomize because we'll lose patients and we want to still do more um, surgery. And therefore, we still need to do more when it comes to that. We need, we have a lack of equipoise regarding surgical interventions, and we need to do more trials uh, and participate more in those types of trials. So there are exciting times ahead, but there's still more to do. In conclusion, please be careful about over-interpreting small, underpowered, retrospective studies with multiple analyses. These are nothing more than hypothesis generating. You cannot change your practice according to those trials or those studies. There are exciting developments in trials and research, but surgeons need to do more to overcome their bias and lack of equipoise. Poor quality research kills patients. Please keep that in mind. When you're doing it, when you're interpreting studies, when your juniors are wanting to do studies, only high quality research. And don't change your management without level one evidence. You need good quality research before you change your management because I've shown you how poor research can actually kill patients. I'd like to thank all the team back at BASE. They do a lot of this work and I get the pleasure of talking to, to you about it. And I'm gonna leave you uh, with um, a little video that suggests that you should always maintain healthy skepticism, especially when you see research and when you read it. Don't believe all that you hear. Thank you very much uh, for listening.
and take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, Professor Mehana, for this excellent talk. I think um, this is a topic that uh, needs an own meeting at the end because there are so, so many um, issues about it. And um, let me ask you one first question. So what do you think, what can we do better internationally concerning uh, planning studies and so on? Uh, thank you very much. Um, if the um, uh, technical support, could you uh, allow me to start the video, my video, please? Um, I hope that uh, my uh, colleagues... Uh, there we go. We, they, yeah, there we go. That's great. So, um, of course, we, we can do a lot better um, and a lot more, um, but it's not easy. Uh, you know, as we're getting more and more specific about the treatments that we're doing, Uh, you know, we're, we're treating not just, let's, let's give you an example, HPV uh, or pharyngeal cancer. So we're, we're treating HPV positive or pharyngeal cancer and HPV negative or pharyngeal cancer, but not just that. HPV positive or pharyngeal cancer can be low risk and then there's intermediate risk. And then, you know, so as you become more and more specific, <clears throat> the, and that's what we should be, The, the population gets smaller and smaller. And so being able to do these studies, you know, uh, de-escalate required 300 patients. Um, RTOG 1016 required um, 800 and something patients. These take a long time <clears throat> to recruit if you're going for very specific groups. And therefore the way around it is to collaborate and collaborate internationally. But of course that's easier said than done because You know, you have to work across boundaries, across regulatory boundaries, uh, financial boundaries. You have to find finance uh, funding for the study in each of the countries, which can take a long time. Um, so that's, you know, we, but we need to do more of that. Uh, I also think that there is a role for uh, prospective, well-designed registries. They're easier to do uh, internationally, and we could be doing more of that. And it's, and it's a, you know, where we can't get randomized control trials done, then we should be thinking about prospective registries with, um, <clears throat> that are well-designed to allow to adjust for uh, the different uh, factors and the different dis differences. They don't give you the same quality of data as randomized controlled trials, but it's the next best thing, rather than doing a small study uh, in your own country uh, and, and getting it underpowered and then not, uh, not getting the right result. Yeah. Thank you. So an, another question is, um, what literature or textbook can you recommend for medical statistics, research papers, guides, so on? Do you have um, yeah. some, some good literature? For us? In, in all honesty, um, Uh, I find statistics papers very difficult, uh, statistics books very difficult to read, okay? And, and I've, I've, I've had a, a, the, the number of people who, after reading, uh, hearing the, this um, talk, have come to me, and very senior people saying, you need to write this up, you need to write it, so, you know, because this, this has made it clear, write it up. Uh, I've just not got around to it, but um, uh, one of my... Um, Uh, juniors is is doing a book at the moment called the 50 best or the 50 most important papers in otorhinolaryngology and i think that's going to be a really interesting book because it's, okay. it, it at least puts the the evidence together for otorhinolaryngology uh, it's it's difficult i i honestly i've i've um, just spent time thinking about it and then talking to statisticians i find that actually when you talk to statisticians they can explain it better than when it's in a book, because the books are uh, tend to become very statistical, very mathematical, and I find that difficult. Thank you. Uh, another question is, um, so uh, what do you think will get to concerning the escalation of treatment in HPV positive tumors? Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> I've got a, a whole uh, hour, hour talk on that. Um, Uh, my conclusion is that two things. One, we've got to be very, very, very careful about de-escalation. Look, I was one of the first people to, to talk about uh, and espouse de-escalation for low-risk HPV-positive disease. I, you know, I built a career on it. I spoke around the, you know, the world. Um, and, and I designed the study not thinking 
or the, the, the results that came out were going to be what, what came out. But we were, we were shocked by the results of the Escalate. We were shocked by the results of 1016, showing that actually cetuximab is worse. I thought, you know, at best, cetuximab will be the same as cisplatin. It may show a benefit for toxicity. It may not. Fine. But actually, it's, it's worse. So, um, so we've got to be very careful because we currently have very, very good, uh, very effective treatment. And we've got to be very careful when we are um, looking at different treatments. I would love for us to do a, um, a study that compares um, chemoradiotherapy to surgery and adjuvant treatment. Remember, it's not just surgery, it's surgery and adjuvant treatment. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's, that's going to be, you know, but, but it seems like it's a very, very difficult study. We've tried, uh, not been successful. Um, but I think that is one thing that we need to think about. The second is actually, we talk a lot about de-escalation, but we forget that for the intermediate risk group, they have a 70% three-year survival. So about a third of them die within three years. And they're HPV positive patients. And the HPV negatives, you know, it's 50% uh, uh, mortality in three years, right? So, um, so we need to do better for those patients. And actually, we've got evidence to suggest that that is where surgery is going to be most effective, that adding surgery to chemoradiotherapy improves outcomes for those two groups of patients. We've, we've done a 10-year study on um, developing a biomarker that selects those patients that should get surgery, and who we've shown consistently now in three different um, uh, groups internationally, um, uh, you know, uh, cohorts of patients internationally, uh, including a prospective cohort, that adding surgery to high-risk patients actually improves their survival. Mm -hmm. and it's it's okay. over chemoradiotherapy. And I think that's where the role of surgery is going to come, not so much in de-escalation. Professor Mehana, we are very happy to have you here. And uh, unfortunately, the time is running out again. So I would like to um, uh, point out the breakout rooms. Uh, please use, the, use this frequently, all of you. And um, thank you very much again for your great talk and the discussion. I would like to um, introduce um, the next moderator. It's Yoon Se Lee. And I give the word to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Beer. Next uh, speaker would be uh, uh, Professor Cesar Piazza. Uh, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Piazza is a professor and chief of the Department of Rhino Laryngology, head and neck surgery of the University of Brescia, Italy. Uh, his practice focuses on the head and neck oncology, airway, and microvascular reconstructive surgery. He has authored over 160 publications and is a current member of the border of the current opinion in otorolaryngology, head and neck surgery, frontiers in oncology, frontiers in otorolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and acta otorolaryngology italica journals. We are very fortunate to have him here with us today. So please welcome Dr. Piazza. Dear colleagues, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and discuss with you the uh, new uh, things in surgical management of glottic cancer. The index of this presentation will be essentially devoted to uh, uh, the concept of standardization of transoral laser microsurgery with the introduction of uh, uh, new uh, so-called new anatomical concepts uh, description of the diagnostic advances in uh, endoscopy and uh, uh, radiologic imaging, uh, the way uh, we learned uh, to better predict uh, the, uh, and select our patient to be treated by uh, TLM on the basis of their laryngeal exposure, and some uh, uh, hints on the long-term outcomes obtainable by this kind of uh, surgical approach. So in, uh, um, just to, to start uh, from the uh, beginning, uh, the uh, transoral laser microsurgery 
has been um, as every uh, surgical technique uh, uh, introduced in the recent uh, decades uh, submitted to a process of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, evaluation and assessment uh, passing through at least these four uh, stages uh, from the beginning of the 70s uh, when it was introduced and uh, so that was the period of innovation uh, to the development when the uh, techniques, the instrumentation and the uh, first experience were developed to the uh, stage B or exploration, real assessment and I would say now after more or less uh, uh, four or five decades of history of TLM, we are in the stage four of long-term evaluation. I mean, the uh, technique is, is, is mature enough uh, to conclude if uh, in the long run uh, it represents a benefit uh, for whose, whom patients, uh, uh, with which indication, with which pros and cons, in comparison to other uh, non-surgical or surgical uh, techniques like, for example, radiation, or chemoradiation, open partial laryngectomies, and so on. Uh, this is all uh, aimed to avoid uh, what is, has been described as the Scott's parabola. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, starting from a promising idea uh, to through encouraging and early reports, strong media pressure and pub publishing, uh, standard treatment when uh, the uh, uh, treatment becomes uh, to be uh, widely available in the in the scientific community, with uh, some detractor and doubts creeping in, uh, creeping in, and uh, some uh, misconduct, some uh, unfortunate cases with uh, uh, medical legal issues and uh, uh, negative uh, uh, publicity on uh, on the on behalf of the media and therefore decline of the fortune of the technique and sometimes uh, complete uh, uh, forgotten. To avoid this in the period of uh, a standardization of a given surgical technique like we are uh, nowadays with the TLM, uh, the scientific community should be able to um, uh, at least uh, uh, rule out some bad indication and uh, stress out the good uh, pros of, of a given uh, approach in order to uh, find the correct niche of this kind of, uh, of uh, treatment, for example, uh, for the right kind of patients and tumors in order to not to lose uh, the, uh, the advantages of this uh, approach uh, in comparison to all uh, the other techniques and all the other uh, possible approaches. For sure, we are not. We are no more in the phase of the machoism or uh, the single surgeon uh, expertise, or sometimes delirium uh, of, 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 of power. Um, uh, we are definitely in, in a phase in which uh, a lot of surgeon, a lot of uh, um, institution have embraced this kind of uh, of technique. Uh, with the and we are in the phase in which we have to standardize its indication in order to favor its uh, worldwide reproducibility for the uh, better of our patients. Uh, just to make a short example of what I mean as a standardization and avoiding uh, uh, anecdotal experience like in the first uh, 10 or 20 years of history of the TLM, uh, one uh, typical example is the treatment of tumors infiltrating the thyroid cartilage, uh, T3 and T4, uh, um, that in the past, uh, from some schools, uh, like for example, Göttingen, were believed to be uh, fully resectable by a transural approach. Uh, due to some uh, anecdotal uh, good uh, experience but the, that are no more reproducible uh, as demonstrated recently by the school uh, um, from uh, uh, Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Michaelini, uh, in a show in a, a small uh, group of uh, Patients demonstrated that uh, most of uh, uh, outcomes, uh, either from the oncological as well as from the functional point of view, in tumors infiltrating the, the thyroid cartilage resected by a transural approach, um, uh, are against its uh, uh, worldwide application since uh, it's uh, much more oncologically reproducible and safe to reject this kind of tumor from an open neck approach or uh, by other kind of non-surgical approach. 
All this is based on new anatomical concepts that are not new at all, but are some, and are, uh, some uh, are, are more, more or less revision of uh, uh, well-known concepts that in, in, uh, can be seen under a different line and different perspective if you look uh, the anatomy of the larynx through uh, a transoral uh, approach. And you realize that the anterior commissure, for example, is no more a point or a plane like uh, um, uh, you could consider it from a geometrical point of view. It's uh, more similar to a 3D space in which the epiglottis from above, the uh, false and true vocal folds from lateral, and the conus elasticus from below uh, 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 meet in a, a really complicated uh, three-dimensional space in which the tumor can grow uh, both on, on a horizontal plane from one vocal fold to the contralateral, still maintaining a, a, a bidimensional or nearly bidimensional uh, uh, extent, uh, like in T1 uh, growing to T1B um, um, tumors, or it can grow uh, spreading towards the supra and or subglottis, becoming a T2 uh, uh, superficial tumor, or even infiltrating the uh, petiolus of the epiglottis, the inferior part of the pre-epiglottis space, growing towards the supraglottis, growing anteriorly and infiltrating the inner perichondrium of the thyroid cartilage and therefore becoming a, a T3 or even a T4 uh, uh, glottic cancer, or spreading through the subglottis in between uh, the thyroid and cricoid cartilage and extending in the extra laryngeal soft tissues and becoming anti 4 uh, subglottic cancer. All these pathways of spread can be endoscopically appreciated as the same tumor. I mean, you can just see endoscopically an horizontal tumor, uh, so a T1B a glottic cancer that if confirmed radiologically to be a T1B, can be uh, treated uh, by a, a transoral approach with a very good outcome. Or uh, uh, endoscopically, again, you may just see a transcommissural T2 uh, uh, supraglottic and or subglottic tumor that can be managed by um, TLM uh, if you rule out uh, its uh, deep infiltration of the uh, pre-epiglottic space, thyroid cartilage, and or subglottic uh, extension uh, to, through the cricothyroid membrane. So this is a much more complicated tumor to be treated by a uh, transoral approach, either for a usually unfavorable or suboptimal laryngeal exposure. So in the best case scenario, you may reach at 75% uh, local control. But again, it's a tumor that you have to study very well by an imaging, uh, CT or MRI, as I will show you in a moment, just to rule out uh, its uh, real uh, uh, more problematic extension uh, towards the uh, laryngeal framework in a T3 or even T4 laryngeal tumor, which clearly is not a tumor that you may be able to control by a purely uh, TLM approach. So this concept uh, nowadays must be uh, in the um, uh, back, uh, mind, back of your mind when you are dealing with a paracommissural tumor. Otherwise, your local control and your, and your oncological outcome will be definitely less favorable than those described in the literature. The same is true when you are dealing with the tumors extending to the paraglottic space. Uh, and again, the paraglottic space must be considered very complicated the visual spaces coming from the uh, glottic level to the supraglottic level. And even more uh, uh, intri intriguingly, uh, when uh, you consider the anterior paraglottic space, which is limited uh, in its uh, uh, extension to a plane in front of the vocal uh, uh, process of the arterial cartilage in which the um, uh, vocal muscle re represents the most important volume of the space and the paraglottic fat pad is very subtle 
while in the posterior part of the paraglottic space uh, behind the uh, vocal process of the arytenoid, the so-called cricotyroarytenoid space, the fat pad is more, much more abundant, but unfortunately, uh, this space uh, is a contraindication to uh, transural laser microsurgery and represents a potential pathway of spread of the tumor towards the um, piriform sinus or extralaryngeal space around the posterior border of the thyroid lamina. And so the cricothyroid space uh, or posterior paraglottic space should be always looked with the big suspicious from the uh, uh, transoral point of view uh, and tumors uh, uh, reaching this area are uh, indeed a contraindication to TLM and also a relative contraindication even to other open partial uh, laryngectomy uh, sparing approach um, uh, as demonstrated by this paper published by our institution in which even open partial laryngectomy has got a suboptimal local control when dealing with the posterior paraglottic space uh, tumors. Um, all these, um, uh, I would say, new uh, anatomical uh, details uh, are um, uh, controllable or evaluable in the preoperative setting thanks to the recent diagnostic advances um, and future uh, diagnostic advances uh, about which I briefly talk in this uh, uh, part of the, of the talk, um, which are essentially divided into two big families, uh, those uh, endoscopically uh, speaking in terms of bioendoscopy and optical biopsy techniques, uh, uh, which are um, uh, uh, nowadays available in very different uh, and numerous tastes. In my, uh, in my view, one of the best of these uh, techniques is uh, for sure the narrowband imaging or SPICE, which are both techniques that filters the wavelengths of the white light, selecting and cutting out the, uh, the range of the orange and red and yellow lights uh, that uh, allows you just to have a, a better definition, uh, el eliminating the scattering effect due to the white light and selecting the green and blue wavelengths, you also have a, a better depiction of the uh, uh, vascular network uh, con uh, within the uh, submucosal layer of the tissues. In, uh, in this way, you have got a better definition of the neangiogenetic patterns of uh, uh, vascularization, and you may uh, distinguish between these uh, uh, patterns of vascularization, the normal one, I would say the uh, physiological uh, vascularization or inflammatory vascularization, which is uh, uh, defined as the longitudinal uh, vascular pattern, which is normal or nearly normal in terms of inflammation. And from the uh, perpendicular pattern of uh, vascularization, in which the uh, neonzygenetic patterns this, the, um, uh, um, uh, behaves differently from uh, the longitudinal ones, going into the third dimension and uh, pushing the uh, growth of the tumor uh, in uh, uh, towards the surface uh, of the, uh, for example, vocal cords, and in the same way into the depth of the um, tumor uh, and, the, uh, and the underlying uh, vocal ligaments and vo uh, vocal muscle. Um, so this technique nowadays allows you to, to get a 90% accuracy um, in uh, depicting, in, in, in giving the nature of what you're looking at uh, just without any sampling and any uh, real histopathologic examination of, of your uh, lesion and just using uh, an optical biopsy technique, which is also uh, of big help in deciding uh, during uh, transural laser market surgery where to put your one, two, or when you're lucky, three millimeters free surgical margins uh, from the edge of the tumor. Uh, since uh, at the uh, under the microscopic control, these uh, bioendoscopic techniques are, uh, as already demonstrated by several authors, uh, are able to uh, decrease in a very significant way the number of positive surgical margin that you may incur in uh, by uh, these ultra-narrow free margin surgical techniques. And this is, again, the future, uh, perhaps in a, in a, in a range of uh, 10 years or so, 
we will be able to uh, to to grasp uh, the uh, l the high end being the fruit of the application of artificial intelligence to this field of uh, um, of diagnostics, uh, which is called the videomics. Um, uh, the low hanging fruit would be to make automatic or semi-automatic the uh, optical biopsy approach of recognizing a tumor from non-tumor uh, tissue by means of uh, uh, this kind of approach. By, but the, uh, for sure, the much more uh, uh, ambitious uh, uh, idea is to, uh, up, uh, in the future, to, to use this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, um, deep learning approach to recognize the margin in between uh, healthy tissue and tumor, uh, not only on the uh, surface of, uh, of uh, uh, larynx or other organs, but also in the depth, uh, looking in the third dimension, like we are able to do today um, by MRI, for example, or CT scan, and to get some adjunctive prognostic uh, information, like, for example, grade of differentiation, perineural lymphovascular invasion, or talking about other kind of tumors like ABV uh, related or HPV related tumors in the nasopharynx or oropharynx. This is the future, and but for sure we are working in that direction and we will be able in uh, years or decades to see significant uh, advances in this field. For sure, we are already now in, 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 in a era in which uh, surface coil MR, for example, are able to depict some uh, information that I already uh, mentioned you before in the real life in vivo, uh, making uh, this kind of uh, imaging uh, that allows you to uh, distinguish in between the um, epithelium, the underlying vocal ligament, or tumor infiltrating the vocal muscle and the paraglottic space, reaching the inner perichondrium or not of the thyroid cartilage, or like in this case, infiltrating the uh, inner portion of the thyroid cartilage up to the external perichondrium and or uh, extra laryngeal soft tissues. And making those uh, differentiation that I uh, mentioned before in between anterior paraglottic space and posterior par paraglottic space no more uh, clinical impression due to uh, hypo, uh, uh, hypomobility of the vocal cord or fixation of the arytenoid cartilage, but uh, a, a true um, and objective quantification of uh, uh, precise tumor extension. And again, with the application of radiomics to this field of uh, uh, imaging, we are already uh, much better than, for example, 10 years ago in uh, distinguishing this uh, specific cricoterroritinate space involvement as uh, uh, a contraindication, for example, to TLM and sometimes even to open partial laryngectomy approaches. Um, and again, uh, uh, with this kind of surface coil um, imaging, you are always today able to depict uh, by uh, this kind of imaging the extra laryngeal uh, involvement of soft tissue uh, of the neck through the cricoterial membrane or again into the um, posterior corner of the uh, tidal space into the um, uh, submucosa of the, uh, of the hypopharynx, in particular the uh, piriform sinus. Or again, where the CT scan just suggests uh, an erosion of the uh, uh, anterior commissure and uh, uh, anterior angle of the thyroid cartilage without any clear uh, clue on the uh, extra laryngeal extent of the tumor, the, this kind of imaging uh, clearly uh, confirmed the uh, uh, thyroid, car thyroid cartilage massive erosion, if not uh, uh, extrusion uh, through uh, the laryngeal framework into the soft tissues of the neck. And again, going towards a better selection of our patient even means that today we are able to select beforehand when you are, we are in the office, which are the ideal candidates for trying to resect the T2, T3 very large glottic tumors because they have got a fantastic ideal laryngeal exposure 
and from those that have got um, a, a suboptimal laryngeal exposure and therefore should be um, uh, uh, contraindicated as patient uh, uh, to be treated by this kind of approach. Um, since there are different kind of uh, um, laryngeal exposure going from the ideal one or class zero to the uh, good class one, reasonable class two, difficult laryngeal exposure like class three in which you can reject small tumors, but for sure not larger ones to the class one, class four in which every kind of transoral approach is definitely impossible. There are different ways of trying to predict this kind of uh, uh, different degrees of exposure. For example, in 2014, we published these uh, um, 11 items uh, um, laryngoscore that give, give, gave you a, a, a zero to 17 score uh, in which uh, uh, a score less than six is always a good uh, indication. Uh, a score less more than nine is always a suboptimal TLM indication. But again, you see many of these uh, parameters are based on the surgeon experience uh, like evaluation of macroglossia, micrognatia, uh, degree of neck flexion extension, and so on, and therefore are not uh, uh, very clearly uh, cut, uh, cut out and uh, um, allows you to um, have sometimes a suboptimal uh, exposure. In, for this reason, we recently published a simplified version of this uh, uh, score that we called the mini laryngo score. It's based on just three parameters, the inter incisor gap, uh, less or, or more than four centimeter, the tyromental distance, uh, uh, less or more than 6.5 or six centimeter, and the upper jaw dental status. These very easy and very objective uh, uh, parameters can be scored, giving you a, 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 a score from zero to four. If you have got a mini laryngo score of zero, nearly always you will have a very good exposure. If you will have a mini laryngo score of three or four, you will have a good exposure in less than one fifth of your patient. So these are very good uh, indication to select uh, your kind of patient before this, this type of treatment. To conclude, the long-term outcomes of um, uh, this kind of approach are now available in different series in the literature. This is our experience be based on more than 30 years of uh, uh, follow-up on uh, more than 1,100 patients uh, treated for T, uh, TS, T1 and T2 glottic squamous cell cancer never uh, irradiated or operated before. Uh, apart from the uh, uh, distribution of tumors that, uh, and the incidence of tumors uh, uh, that are very similar to other uh, series, the most interesting uh, point from my uh, perspective is that this kind of approach is nowadays uh, um, uh, um, suggestible even from uh, the long-term outcome point of view. If you see our results at more than 20 years of follow-up, the disease-specific survival and organ preservation rate for accurately selected patients is uh, always uh, above 90%. Clearly, there are differences in between um, uh, TIS, T1A, T1B, and T2 cancers. Uh, but again, for every uh, uh, T category, the 10 and 20 year disease specific survival are always above uh, 90%. Uh, and for organ preservation rate, uh, for T2, they become less than 90%. But uh, in the realm of uh, 86, 84 percent, at even uh, at a 20 year, so therefore, uh, uh, obviously, uh, well comparable, uh, if not better, to those uh, to the outcomes uh, reported by uh, competing uh, treatment uh, approaches like uh, radiation or chemo radiation. Uh, even uh, especially if you consider that. Uh, 91% uh, of these patients were treated by laser alone, and just 9% of these patients needed uh, adjunctive uh, uh, treatment like radiation, uh, chemo radiation, open partial laryngectomy, or total laryngectomy, that in the follow up were needed in a, a small minority of patients. 
Another concept that uh, these uh, long-term outcomes allowed us to uh, uh, modify uh, from our first uh, impressions is that uh, TLM, for example, is uh, repeatable whenever you want. It's not completely true. In, 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 indeed, uh, when you uh, make more than two uh, TLMs for uh, the same tumor, uh, it means that um, you are probably uh, underestimating the real extent of the tumor or the field cancerization is taking advantage of a uh, compromised uh, mucosal field. And therefore, for example, um, the, both the disease specific survival and organ preservation rate uh, starts decreasing uh, uh, in a significant way. Uh, uh, while, for example, uh, another interesting idea is that uh, coming out from this uh, uh, series is that um, TLM is the ideal surgical approach for very elderly people. In this uh, selected uh, patient population of uh, uh, above 75 years of age with a mean age of eight years. Um, uh, we observed very good uh, recurrent free survival and organ preservation rate, as you can see, um, uh, always above 80%, even for uh, T2 and T3 uh, tumors, uh, where obviously the overall survival and the laryngoesophageal dysfunction free survival were impacted negatively by the advanced age of this patient, frequently dying for other causes. But again, I want to stress like the last concept, in these patients, uh, you are frequently forced to jump from a transoral laser approach to a total laryngectomy approach, the, uh, talking, about, uh, laryngect uh, the, talking about surgery. And from a non-surgical point of view, you are frequently forced to use just radiation. You cannot uh, apply uh, organ preservation protocol based on chemo radiation due to obvious uh, um, comorbidity reasons. And therefore, in this special population, I would say the TLM has, got, uh, the, has demonstrated in the recent years an adjunctive role. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Piazza. Uh, you just showed us uh, you just showed us the future of the TLM for the growth cancer. Unfortunately, the time is running out. So uh, I have one quick question. So uh, lots of groups are working on computer-aided differentiation of regions. Do you believe that this will become a common tool in the near future for all of us? Sorry, there was a, a, a noise. I didn't uh, fully understood your, your question. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. So I think it's better to move on to the uh, next topic. So uh, if you have any question, I, I'm now talking to the, the audience. Uh, we have a link to, uh, to discuss more about uh, the uh, futuristic the management with uh, Dr. Piazza. So I think it's better to move on the, the, uh, follow the link. Thank you, Piazza. Hi, see you again. Thank you. So uh, now it's time to uh, the introduce the next speakers. Uh, uh, Professor Herman Launich. Dr. Rauni is a specialist in auricular surgeries and works in the Spital and the Drug Hospital in Katrina, uh, Austria. He runs his own specialist practice and developed a new method of gentle auricular surgeries. His focus has been on developing and refining techniques for autoplastic surgeries for treatment of autologic abnormalities and congenital anomalies. I'm happy to introduce him today, so please welcome Dr. Rauni. Dear colleagues, my name is Hermann Raunig. I'm a specialist for ENT, and it's a pleasure for me to share with you my experience in autoplasty, to share with you my tips and tricks for a successful outcome. I have no conflict of interest, but I would like to say thank you to Dr. Milos Kovacevic for inviting me to this meeting. 
If someone tells you autoplasty is easy, please don't believe. Autoplasty is not easy. It's a challenging procedure, but it makes you create happy faces between smart operated ears. You can start very early. You can start with newborn babies. And by the way, the question is, can you correct baby's ears at all? Of course you can. You can, it's, it's not difficult. And the best time to correct baby's ears is right after birth. It goes up to six, eight weeks postpartum. But um, well, in the beginning, the oracle is very soft and moldable. The standard malformation that you can find in newborn babies is an underdeveloped antihedix, superior cruise, and a protruding lobule. You tape it for three weeks, then you take the tape off, and seven months later, the oracle will look like this. Two strips that can change your life. It's not difficult, the V shape. Now look at the video, how you do this in real time. See the, un the underdeveloped antihelix and the concave superior cruise. By taping the first strip, you see the superior cruise has become convex again, and also the lobule is improved, but it becomes better if you also tape it to the mastoid. The best time to do this in babies is when they are breastfed and when they are full, don't cry, they are sleepy and they don't, don't cry when you tape their ears. But when you see this, um, the following pictures, I recommend you not to start with the complicated baby's ears because some time ago, I got an email with a picture of a baby with a, with a, well, microsa. You, you can't say it in a nicer way. It's a microsa. The lobule was, was really deformed. And after taping for, let's say, four, four, five weeks, the result was like you can see on the right, on the right side. It was not really encouraging. But when the, patient came and with the age of five years, that was, that was what he presented in, before the operation. So there was cartilage available. That was, gave me confidence that I can, can get some, some structure out of it. And when you open the structure, you see, that was the, uh, the helical rim. That also was the helical rim, but they go upside down and Anyway, it took two operations to get the result like this, all of autologous cartilage, all of auricular cartilage. And another tip, for instance, is when there is um, a hypertrophic overdeveloped concrete cavity, you can, you can excise a strip of cartilage to reconstruct this helical rim. But this is only available if there is enough cartilage uh, on the malformation. Another tip is that you tell your female patients about the possible treatment of newborn's ears, because this will go mouth to mouth to word. And then by the time you can build up your autoplasty practice. Another tip is that you get informed and see what is possible. For instance, I typed in my name up here in PubMed and also at Autoplasty. This is what you get. And so you can find all the topics that you would like. But now when it comes to surgical autoplasty, we have to have a goal where we are. What are we going to? what is our ideal shape of oracle? For me, the ideal shape is what you can see here. Rather symmetric, the helical rim presents lateral in the 
in the upper third and the middle third, the, the antihelix is the most lateral part and the lobule has to follow the line from helix, antihelix and lobule to the face. It's like a frame over the face. Now look when you artificial or surgical change. There's enough auricular space. The cartilage is movable, flexible. You don't see any uh, permanent sutures because I don't use permanent sutures, but we talk later about it. Now look here. That was the boy 15 years earlier. Now there's a big difference. And this is what you can, what you can get with a presented tips, tricks, and technique. It can get a good long-term result. And the advantages of this presented techniques are that I don't use antibiotics. I don't use permanent sutures. We talk later about it. I create hardly visible scars. I'll show you with the antihelix plasty that I incise in the scaphoid groove. This technique is safe to the cartilage. I do not cut the Cart the cartilage. It is less invasive. I make a tunnel and operate on the cartilage itself. And as it is a um, biomechanical technique, there are refinements possible in the post-operative time. So up to, let's say, one month, you can either um, put the ears further back or get them more of the head. For instance, when you have a girl with long hair, you can put the hair behind the ear and the ears, um, well, they put, start protruding more if they are overcorrected. On the other hand, if you have an ideal operated result, you recommend the children or especially the girls with long hair that they should not put uh, the hair behind the ears within the time of three months to preserve the shape. If you start operating the malformation, they usually, these malformations include the antihelix, conchal cavity, and lobule, inferior cruise too, but that's later. Um, what we're talking about, you start with antihelix plastic because when the antihelix is, is already um, bent, it's curved, then you can estimate about the amount of concha reduction, conquer correction. I, for conquer reduction, I do the preserving conquer reduction. That means I preserve conquer reduction, though I'm setting the oracle um, back, but I um, hide the medial conquer, uh, the medial conquer cavity that was incised, flattened with, by scoring and hidden in a, in a soft tissue pocket so that I can use this cartilage decades later for rhinoplasty. And the third step is the lobuloplasty. After that, I suture the superior crews. And for suturing, I use 4 OPDS for cartilage sutures and 5-O polyglactin rapid acid for uh, skin closure. For me, it's essential that I, that I have an overview from one ear to the other. I think this is really a good tip if you want to go for symmetry. And I do really careful disinfection. If you want to get a smooth antihelix, you have to use a smooth technique. The smooth technique is done, as I told you before, in the hidden way, when you, inc when you incise in the scaphoid groove, you incise skin and cartilage at one cut. Next step is that you make a subcutaneous tunnel behind the superior cruise uh, up to where the inferior cruise um, joins to the superior cruise. This is to create scarring post-operatively and help preserving the shape of the, of the auricle. When you have um, reach the subperichondrious layer. It's easy to 
to do the hydro dissection. Of course, I do the local infiltration before, otherwise it would bleed like hell. And you spread the scissors that you get enough space for the diamond coated file where you do the filing along the antihelix, antihelical body, and upwards to the superior cruise. You always have to do it in a, in a C-shaped way because that looks more natural than a straight antihelix. Now look how the cartilage was looking before. Before it, there was a spring and after filing, it moved slowly. Can you see this? Once again, you bend it and it, it bends ahead or anteriorly very slowly. Show you another kind of cartilage. This cartilage is very, very rigid and like a, a metal a feather, that uh, strong spring jumps up. And after filing, when you look at the inferior picture, you can see that the cartilage contains the, the desired shape and comes back very slowly. That was also done on, in the, the inferior cruise was corrected. Look here, the, there was a gap between helix and inferior cruise. Here it is gone. I will show you later on how you can get it. To address the inferior cruise, you have to prolong the incision in the scaphoid groove to the inferior cruise. Next, you have to prepare also subperichondrously along the helical edge, the, sorry, the, uh, the edge of the inferior cruise. Go down to the concrete cavity and then you do the incision because the inferior cruise is the only sharp edged, sharp edged structure in the oracle. And that's why you can make this incision right way sharp edged. Other structures always have to be smooth and curved. This piece of cartilage is abundant and has to be cut off. So the inferior crews will, will close the gap between the scaphoid groove and the helical rim. Now compare, you compare, this is the gap what I was talking about, the gap between inferior cruise and helical rim. When there is a gap, that's a sign or a mark that there is an underdeveloped inferior cruise. If this is the situation after infiltration, here only the superior cruise and antihelical body was addressed with, um, with a fighting technique. You see, it is set back, but it doesn't really look like a normal oracle. And the reason is why? Because there's no inferior cruise. Compare number two to number three. When you address the inferior cruise, as I demonstrated before, and then close the skin, compare number two to number four. This is what, what I like to have a a good result and what makes people happy. At the end of the procedure, that's a normal look. Now look at this result, 11 years post-op. That means long-term results are not only possible, but show the good quality of this technique. The lateral view is inconspicuous, looks very nice, very smart. And when you compare it, the Pre-up uh, situs 11 years before is a big difference. Now it comes to the overdeveloped concrete cavity. But um, if I would go into all details, you can see here the, the paper I wrote about this. If I would go into all details, it would exceed the time that uh, I have for this presentation. So I leave this media concrete cartilage uh, I prepare it and hide it in the soft tissue pocket. I leave this concrete cartilage and I can use it decades later for rhinoplasty if needed. But I show you some results of hypertrophic concrete cavity. You see that's a very big 
hypertrophic concrete cavity, more on the left side than on the right side. And the post-op result is here better than on this side, but the front view is very symmetric. It's very often that there is an asymmetric skull that the posterior view looks different to the front view. Another option, strong hypertrophic concrete cavity on both sides. You see this, uh, this result five years post-op, the same boy from the front view, turning around, you see the cartilage is still flexible. It's like a normal ear and patients don't present uh, an operated look. And this is four years uh, before the operation. It's a very different look. Now let's come to the correction of the lobule. Just for, for demonstration, I show you where you can expect the, where you can expect the helical tail to find. You excise some skin, an oval shaped, or if it is not that much, you don't need to excise skin. Here you see the edge of the, of the helical tail. You do the undermining of the lobule because there is a difference, you can, you can read in the paper about, there's a difference between the anterior side of the lobule to the posterior side. There's a shortage on the, on the anterior side. So you have to bend the, the lobule back. That means that you have to shift the two layers of skin. Next is that you soften the helical tail And then it's so important that you do the suture very uh, correctly. That means subcutaneously, it really means underneath the skin. The second bite goes into the conchal cartilage and you will see, you will see how the lobule moves with that technique. I know it's not easy to get a, a nice setback. I open it just for demonstration so that you can see it from the front view, or sorry, lateral view, how the cartilage is set back. See, it looks normal, inconspicuous, and that's the main goal. Show you another example, how much it is set back. It can be set back easily if you do the proper preparation. You have to check for symmetry before you close the skin. Only at the very end, I, I fix the superior cruise with PDS, but these are all details. If, if there would be a course, we would go into every detail, but that would last longer. So I skip over that. Don't forget about the post-operative care. That's a biomechanic technique. So that means that you have to have a bandage on for one week, take it off only if, it is, if there is some bleeding or some pain. After the use of a head bend, after the week you use a head bend for two weeks. The bandage uh, is only for one week, then another two weeks with a head bend. And you have to use that overnight and over day. And use it longer if, if it is not set back enough or less longer, shorter, if it is already perfect in the shape. Beware, beware of over and under correction. This technique is only a tool. That's why I, I want to show you what else you can do with this technique. For instance, a cut beard type one, well, it can be easily changed over to that shape. It that would take you only, let's say, not even five minutes more than a normal antihelix plasty to get this result. But cut beard type two, that's really difficult. I show you an example of this malformed oracle. You see that the uh, uh, antihelix goes a different way than the inferior cruise. There's a double antihelical body. But at the end of the procedure, the oracle was set back quite normally. And four years post-op, you see, this was the result. The patient liked it and I was very proud of it. Show you another cup here. 
with the constriction of the helical rim of the anterior side, the underdeveloped inferior cruise, there is some, some concrete cavity, the antihelical body goes that way. Now look at six years post-op. If you're specialized in, in looking at oracles, you see there is a cup here, but it looks much better than this way. And I could show you lots of really bad results of copious because it's not an easy, uh, an easy procedure. To choose the suitable technique is your choice. It can make your life easier and makes you sleep better. So I want to encourage you to pick up the ideas and maybe you will improve your technique. And by the way, you enjoy the results of your autoplasty. This is the place where I live. A few weeks ago, we had plenty of snow. And so I say goodbye from, from Winterly, Austria. Bye-bye. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Launig. Uh, I appreciate your impressive video clips showing the, the best post-operative visuals. So here we have a question about that. Uh, what about the metaphor? Uh, I think it's the, the correct the auto, uh, auto, uh, to, to correct the, the deformity of the oracle, I think. Dr. Launi, can you hear me? Uh, you, I think it's better to turn on, on your yeah. mic. Yeah. yeah, the microphone is on now. I can okay. hear you. So you're yeah. welcome. Is there any so, question? Yeah, the, the audience just asked that, uh, what about the metaphor? I think it's a question about the, the splint after post, uh, the operation. Uh, I think there is a misunderstanding. I'm, I'm not using metaphor. And I'm not using splints, only using tapes. This okay. is um, a soft dish, just a medical tape, micropore. It's the name from Johnson & Johnson that is used to tape the oracle. Or for babies, you can use a different one. Okay, I have a question about the bandage after surgery. The, I think the compression dressing sometimes, I think, the, can make another deformity after uh, operation. I think the persistent bruise or, or the incorrect uh, compression will be related to another deformity. What about that? Yeah, absolutely right. The problem with, um, with a bandage after autoplasty is that there could be a hematoma and whenever there is pain, and this is, and with this technique, is it's extremely rare that there is a pain. Only maybe in the concrete cavity if, if, the, pavement, if the patient takes out the the packing that is out of cotton wool that's hardened with hydrogen peroxide, peroxide. And when sometimes he feels that it's too hard, they take it off, but I tell them not to do that. Then you can have a hematoma, otherwise you don't have. But if you have the pain underneath the bandage, you have to take the bandage off immediately and check if there is any problem. Up to now, I didn't have. Okay, I have another question about the timing of a canal oplasty. Sometimes the patient who have the auricular deformity have a, uh, the, another problem in the, uh, canal, canal stenosis or the canal atresia. What do you think about the timing of the canal oplasty with the autoplasty? Uh, you mean the auditory canal? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the patient, yeah, the baby yeah, has a. Uh, I would I would like to uh, to do it at the same time at the at birth. Sorry, it's my watch. It's midday <laughs> here in Austria. <laughs> uh, nice bell. And, huh? and uh, you can try it. Uh, but I tell you, I don't have experience with atresia or uh, stenosis of the auditory canal. The patients presented to me only had auricular deformities. And it depends on the midwives that they refer the patient or the babies to you. If if the midwives in a uh, uh, um, surgery or in a medical unit, if they don't know about that, that you can do it, um, they, they will not refer it. So it's important that you have contact to them and tell them, if there is a baby with malformation, please call me. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, you have a question from the Q&A. Uh, I think he, you already uh, uh, replied. Uh, so what type of tape is suggested for the taping of the newborn baby ears? I think they are concerning about uh, the, the newborn baby has a uh, very thin skin, is uh, easily injured by a, by the simple taping. No, what do you say? no, not at all. Babies are very tough. They survive <laughs> nine months of pregnancy. So uh, oh, when they okay. are delivered, they are have a they have a healthy skin unless you you uh, treat them badly. The only thing as I presented here in the video is that I use a medical tape that is called, um, um, well, just um, from also from a firm that's available in the hospital. That's a long-term um, taping, it, it lasts for 10 days. Then if you, if you have to take it off, you, can, you have to use medical benzene uh, to remove it without any pain so that the babies even don't notice when you take it off. It is okay. called Leukosan strip. I don't know if you, uh, if I, I might need to write it down. Leukosan strip. Yeah, okay. Here is uh, another uh, question from the Q&A. At what age would you do the surgical autoplasty? Would it affect the future growth? Yeah. Uh, any any sur auricular surgery, I start um, before the children go to school to avoid mobbing. And uh, so that's about the age of six years, five years, six years, but not earlier. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last question. Uh, what your comment about the mustard uh, technique and when you will use it? Yeah, that's a good question. But um, mustard technique uses non-absorbable sutures. I'm doing this technique now since 20 years and I'm very satisfied with the results. Before, of course, I tried and used a mustardi technique because it's very easy for beginners that have no experience. Um, the problem is this permanent sutures um, can come out. They are extruding, they are uh, making abscesses of, even after years, long, even five, six years afterwards, even in adults, when they have a permanent sutures in autoplasty, the sutures come out. So I am avoiding this problem with, with avoiding uh, non-absorbable sutures. Oh, thank you, Dr. Launich. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, the time is running out. Yeah, so thank you for the to... great presentations here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's time to move to the next session. Okay, if you have any question or more discussion, I think it's better to follow the, the uh, another link. Uh, and I will introduce the, the next moderator, Dr. Arne Bircher from uh, UKE. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everybody, again uh, from Hamburg. I hope all of you have had an uh, enjoyable morning. Um, I would like to introduce you uh, to the the next speaker, uh, which is um, Wilke Fokken. Uh, she's a full professor at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, she is a president of the European uh, Rhinologic Society, amongst other uh, multiple functions. And her main field of interest is sinus and skull based surgery and mucosal pathology of the upper and lower airways. And um, she will give us a talk on uh, the EPOS 2020 and how it can guide practice. Dear friends and colleagues, it's a real pleasure to give you this webinar on EPOS 2020, the new classification and how it can guide your daily practice in the otolaryngology updates, 48 hours of live webinar. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you. Uh, this is pre-recorded, but I'm very happy to give the lecture. In this webinar, I would like to discuss with you a little bit of what is EPOS 2020, uh, the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis, where a division is made between primary versus secondary CRS, and what are the consequences for treatment. I'll show you the new integrated care pathways in chronic rhinosinusitis in the light of this new classification, and 
a little bit on the new treatment options with biologicals. EPOS has started in 2005, the European Position Paper on Rhinosinusitis and Nasal Polyps. And after versions in 7 and 12, the newest version came out last year uh, with all the data up till uh, the end of 2019. EPOS is a large group of uh, key opinion leaders and experts. Uh, here you see uh, part of the EPOS 2020 steering group, but uh, apart from this steering group, a large group of colleagues from all over the world reviewed the whole paper and helped to disseminate in their own country. EPOS 2020 is uh, uh, almost 500 pages and of course impossible to summarize in 25 minutes, so I would like to highlight a few relevant things. I'm sure you're all aware of this clinical, clinical definition of chronic rhinosinusitis in animals. Inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinuses, uh, characterized by at least nasal blockage and or rhinorrhea, combined with facial pain pressure or reduction of loss or loss of smell, and either endoscopic signs of disease and or CT uh, changes, and these symptoms are present for more than 12 weeks. And you see here the cartoon on the right side, where the total left is uh, the normal population and the other groups are increasingly severe groups of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with and without nasal polyps. And you see that in all these groups, the cardinal symptoms of CRS are highly prevalent. For many years, we used phenotyping of chronic rhinosinusitis to decide on our management schemes. And for a long time, we divided chronic rhinosinusitis in patients with nasal polyps and patients without nasal polyps. Of course, we were all aware that, was, that that was an enormous oversimplification of the truth. We all know that nasal polyps and eosinophilic uh, in eosinophilic disease is totally different from nasal polyps in cystic fibrosis, for example, totally different from fungal disease. And also in chronic rhinosinusitis, there is a big difference between a simple uh, uh, odontogenic chronic rhinosinusitis versus a patient with severe biofilm formation. So we knew phenotyping of chronic rhinosinusitis was not an ideal way uh, to uh, decide on our management schemes. And for that reason, in EPOS 2020, we made a new classification. It was proposed by Professor Richard Harvey from Sydney, and uh, the whole EPOS group was very enthusiastic about it. It first starts to divide chronic rhinosinusitis in primary versus secondary CRS. Well, what is secondary CRS? That is chronic rhinosinusitis in a number of different diseases where the uh, general systemic disease is the main problem and the CRS secondary to that. You can think, of, for example, of patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia, uh, immuno immunoglobulin disorders, vasculitis. In all these diseases, Chronic rhinosinusitis is secondary to another disease. In all other patients, we talk about primary CRS. One part of this classification is this important differentiation between primary and secondary CRS. A second part of this uh, important part of this classification is the endotyping of disease. Chronic rhinosinusitis can have very different endotypes. There can be different forms of inflammation. Um, the environment and the host both play a role in the sort of endotype that uh, is found in a certain inf inflammation. And an important role play is played by the uh, uh, reduction in barrier penetration. When there is a certain endotype, a certain inflammation, uh, remodeling occurs, which eventually shows a certain phenotype, like having polyps, yes or no. 
Of course, we're all aware that chronic rhinosinusitis very often is a combined inflammation of the upper and lower airways, and we always think of the same endotype being present in the lower airways, for example, asthma. If we think of the different types of inflammation that can be found in chronic rhinosinusitis, we can uh, simplify the forms of inflammation by calling it type 1, type 2 or type 3 disease. For this presentation, especially the type 2 disease is extremely important, playing a role in eosinophilic and mast cell inflammation with the typical cytokines relevant for in that form of inflammation like IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13. But also type 1 inflammation where uh, IL-12 and ILC-1 and Th1 cells play an important role uh, um, is often present in chronic rhinosinusitis, especially in patients with um, non-polypoid disease. Here on the right cartoon, you see a depiction of the inflammatory process as what can be found in typically type 2 chronic rhinosinusitis. The epithelium is bombarded by, for, for example, allergens uh, or uh, bacteria, and um, give um, um, produce epithelial cytokines like TSLP, IL-25 and IL-33. In this way, IL-C2s are, uh, uh, are activated and also TH2, uh, type 2 uh, T cells, both resulting in attraction and activation of eosinophils, mast cells and IgE. If we now go back to the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis and then especially to the primary CRS, uh, the rhinosinusitis can be divided into localized disease or diffuse disease. Both the localized and the diffuse disease can then be divided into type 2 or non-type 2. A typical example, for example, of a non-type 2 localized primary CRS can be an isolated frontal, sin rhinos uh, frontal sinusitis, for example, iatrogenic or by another cause. Um, a typical as example of diffuse bilateral type 2 form of chronic rhinosinusitis can, for example, be chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or eCRS. These different, this new classification uh, results in phenotypes that have has consequences for the uh, management, and I will show you some examples of that. Here you see a typical unilateral allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. It is primary CRS. It is localized disease. It's type 2 disease, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Of course, in a situation like this, where there is a localized problem, very often surgery is the treatment of choice. Uh, perioperative, we can give systemic corticosteroids and maybe immunotherapy is an option. If in the, on the other hand, we have a localized non-type 2 problem, for example, like here, an isolated frontal sinusitis, where there is a closure here uh, of the uh, frontal recess. Of course, nobody will think of an anti-inflammatory treatment in a situation like this, but we will choose to do surgery and open up this right frontal sinus to um, solve the problem. On the other hand, if we have a patient with massive chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, here you see an example with mucosils, uh, bending of the uh, nasal bones and total opacification of the sinuses, we have a diffuse bilateral problem. It is type two, uh, and the phenotype is uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Here, 
we will choose surgery because there is a mucosal formation. We can go for systemic corticosteroids. However, if we only do that, the disease will come back. So around the treatment, we, we treat the patient with intranasal corticosteroids. And if the inflammation is very severe, we can choose to treat with biologicals or systemic corticosteroids for a longer period of time. I'll come back to that later. So the same way of classification can be done in secondary CRS. Also here, there is a localized versus a diffuse form of inflammation. And different forms of inflammation lead to very different endo and phenotypes with very different approaches to the disease. For example, a localized local problem with local pathology, for example, uh, a fungal ball or an odontogenic um, disease, needs a totally different approach from a diffuse problem with immunity, for example, a selective immunodeficiency. Here you see an example of a bilateral odontogenic chronic rhinosinusitis. You see here the uh, the tooth problem on this side and there was also a tooth problem on the other side of course if we treat the chronic rhinosinusitis without treating the underlying problem the problem will not be solved the tooth the teeth problem has to be solved first primary and the secondary crs can be uh, managed after that another example here an ANCA positive GPA, uh, in former times called Wegener disease, uh, serious chronic rhinosinusitis on both sides. Of course, we cannot uh, treat this disease with surgery or a local treatment. We need a systemic treatment of the disease. In this case, patient was treated with a tuximab and uh, the ENT surgeon helped with local ointments to get rid of the crust and uh, make them easier to rinse out of the nose. Another example here, a patient with a, an IgA deficiency and chronic rhinosinusitis. Of course, we can try to operate this patient to solve the problem, but very likely that will not work. So this patient was treated with long-term antibiotics to help the, uh, her immunity in um, solving the secondary chronic rhinosinusitis. Within EPOS 2020, you can find care pathways for chronic rhinosinusitis. And all these care pathways are built up the same way. You find self-care <coughs> uh, um, on the top of the uh, um, scheme, then the primary care, and then the secondary and tertiary care. Um, <clears throat> I will not go into this whole care pathway, but concentrate in this presentation on diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis. That is the disease we most often encounter in our daily practice. Um, but you can also... Uh, think of a localized unilateral chronic rhinosinusitis, like I showed you, where we make a CT scan uh, and do surgery, or no apparent chronic rhinosinusitis, where we sometimes do a CT scan to make the diagnosis more, uh, make it sure that there indeed is no chronic rhinosinusitis. But let's uh, concentrate on diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis. Here you see lar uh, uh, large differences compared to earlier treatment schemes. So we have diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis. We again check that there is primary disease and not a secondary problem. Then the patient is treated with appropriate medical treatment. Um, nasal steroids, saline rinsing. Um, educate the patient how to treat, uh, to, to use the treatment properly, uh, check the compliance, and uh, we consider um, oral corticosteroids. After a period of 6 to 12 weeks, we check the patient again to see whether the patient improves. If this is not the case, we now do an additional workup. 
we make a CT scan if we haven't done that before. We do skin pick testing. Now we always do laboratory evaluation to find out whether the disease is type 2 or not, because that is an important part of our classification and treatment decision. Uh, we, of course, again check treatable traits like smoking and compliance of the patient. With all these data, we decide whether the patient has non-type 2 or type 2 disease. In a typical type 2 patient, the main complaint is often uh, loss of smell. Uh, we check whether the patient has asthma, uh, whether there's allergy, uh, whether there is uh, NERD, um, uh, aspirin intolerance. With nasal endoscopy, we expect polyps or eosinophilic mucus. And in the lab, we find elevated IgE and or hyper eosinophilia. On the other hand, if the patient has non-type 2 disease, much more often the main complaint is facial pain or rhinorrhea. Less often we find asthma, less often there's atopy. If we do nasal endoscopy, we see purulence, red mucosa, but usually no polyps and no eosinophilic mu mucin. And in the blood, in the lab, we find a normal IgE and no eosinophilia. Both these diseases are first treated with appropriate medical treatment, as indicated before. But now, in the non-type 2, we can consider long-term antibiotics or do surgery. In the type 2, we consider uh, article, uh, oral corticos or systemic uh, uh, corticosteroids or we do surgery. Again, we check whether the patient improves. And now, in the very difficult patient, and of course that's often the patient we see, see in our daily practice, there is a big difference between non-type 2 and type 2 disease. In the non-type 2, we can uh, consider rinsing with xylitol, long-term antibiotics, or revision surgery. And additional, we want to do extra in investigations to consider whether it actually is a primary uh, diffuse CRS or that there is actually an underlying disease and it's secondary CRS. On the contrary, if it's type 2 disease, we now have additional treatment options. We can give biologicals, we can give aspirin uh, treatment after desensitization in patients with NERD, so aspirin treatment in aspirin uh, intolerant patients. We can give a taper with oral corticosteroids or we can do revision uh, surgery. So depending on whether it is type 2 or non-type non 2, there is a, a, a totally different approach to the disease. I pointed you already to the option of biologicals. And that is really the new kit on the block since about a year and a half, uh, at least in the, in the US and in Europe. I earlier said that the most important uh, inflammation found in chronic rhinosinusitis, and especially in patients with nasal polyps, is type 2 inflammation. In this inflammation, IL-5, IL-4, IL-13 and anti-IgE play an important role. And now all these important mediators and cytokines and uh, immunoglobulins have biologicals that oppose their activity. For NTL5, that it can be mepolizumab or reslizumab. For NTL4 and 13, dupilimab. And for anti-IG, omalizumab. I cannot go into uh, the, op the, the treatment with biologicals very, uh, uh, for a very long time because of the shortness of the presentation, but I just want to show you a few data. Here is an example of a study with dupilimab in patients with chronic rhinosinus uh, chronic rhinosinus with nasal polyps. And you see here the ef effect on the nasal polyp score. Uh, in the top cartoon here, you see the effect of dupilimab uh, for, uh, given for uh, 24 weeks. 
And then when you stop the dupilumab, what happens to the polyps afterwards? And you see there is a significant reduction uh, in the amount of nasal polyps during the treatment, but when the treatment is uh, stopped over another six months, uh, polyps slowly recur. In the lower cartoon, you see the same start. Patients were treated with 24, for 24 weeks with the pilumab twice a week, but then um, half the patient received half the dose, so one injection every four weeks for the next, and the other half received the full dose. And you see that halving the dose had uh, no effect on the contrary, the nasal polyps um, over the second half year even went down further. It's not only here you see a number of other biologicals, uh, dupilumab, mepolizumab and omalizumab, and the effect on the SNOP22, nasal congestion score and the nasal polyp score. And every time in these cartoons you see uh, the, the, the baseline score and then the score after treatment. And you can see that whether you choose dupilumab or mepolizumab or omalizumab, all these biologicals have a significant effect on these parameters. And very important, uh, the biologicals have a, a significant effect on loss of smell. Here you see the effect of uh, dupilumab, here the placebo, here uh, dupilumab in the different studies. And you see that small smell uh, is um, recovered in a significant part of the patients not only uh, the um, uh, subjective loss of smell, but here also measured with the upset smell score. And a little bit more, uh, uh, less impressive, but, but also you can see the same for mepolizumab and omalizumab. EPOS, uh, in combination with Euphoria, proposed uh, in which patients you can use a biological treatment. And we propose to use this treatment in the very severe patient with nasal polyps and type 2 disease, patients who had had surgery already uh, and a par uh, on top of the surgery have evidence of type 2 inflammation, need for systemic steroids or a contraindication to systemic steroid, significant impaired quality of life, significant loss of smell, and or a diagnosis of comorbid asthma. And we propose that three of these criteria are required to make the patient eligible for biological treatment. So to finalize, the new classification of EPOS 2020 um, gives new options to understand what is the underlying problem. Is it the primary or secondary CRS? Is it localized or diffuse disease and type 2 or non-type 2? And makes uh, this new classification into a new management scheme. If you want to read more um, on EPOS 2020, you're very welcome to download for free the whole document or the executive summary from the Rhinology website or the um, EPOS uh, 2020 website. Um, and I hope that this new classification will help you to manage your patients in, uh, in your daily life. Of course, giving a webinar this way is uh, far uh, inferior to meeting each other in person. And I sincerely hope that we can meet each other again this year in September in Thessaloniki during the ERS 2021, uh, uh, being from uh, September 26 to 30 in beautiful, sunny Greece. I hope to see many of you there uh, and for now wish you a, a very good meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, that was a, a nice pre-recorded uh, talk by Professor Fockens. Unfortunately, uh, she's not thoroughly available for um, any uh, question and answer discussions. Um, but fortunately, we uh, 
still have some other talks uh, to come dealing with a, a complex disease of nasal polyps and we got some internationally renowned experts uh, to come up. Um, we try to compensate this uh, small gap with some advertisement and we see us in a couple of minutes. My name is Lee Ophir. I am an attorney down here in South Florida. I've been living in Florida for just over 30 years. I have a, a wife and two kids, ages four and two. I suffer from uh, aggressive chronic uh, polyp growth in my sinus tissues and uh, sinus infections, along with uh, allergic breathing issues as well. Before I started experiencing these symptoms, my life was, it was different. I didn't have breathing issues that were associated with my sinus problems, and I didn't even know those could be related the cooking aspect of it and enjoying the love of, of food and sharing recipes. And I mean, that all changed as well because my sense of smell disappeared. I just started developing allergies and, and sinus issues that I've never had before. It was rather painful. I started developing chronic sinus infections and breathing issues that came along with it. I've gone through a variety of different treatments from oral steroids to nasal sprays and, and multiple surgeries. The problem is with the aggressive polyp growth that I have, the nasal sprays couldn't penetrate uh, deep enough, and the surgeries were just one after the other after the other. It was early 2018 when I went to see my ENT doctor, and at that point in time, he told me that my polyps had grown back at such an aggressive rate that it was either gonna be another painful surgery or he had a non-surgical option in Sinuva. Having Sinuva implanted was great. I did it right at my doctor's office. It took less than an hour to do. I did feel pressure, but other than that, I was back up and back to work in a couple of days. In fact, my appointment was on a Friday and I was back to work by Monday. Having been given Sinuva as an option for my treatment plan has really gone wonderfully. Having a low dose topical steroid delivered directly to the polyps as an alternative to oral steroids has been great for me. I was so happy to see how Sinuva helped with my ability to breathe easier and get my sense of smell back. Sinuva should not be used if you have a hypersensitivity to mometasone furate or other ingredients in Sinuva or if you have nasal ulcers or nasal trauma. The area where Sinuva is placed should be monitored by a physician for bleeding, irritation, infection, or perforation. Close monitoring by a physician is recommended for people with a change of vision or a history of increased intraocular pressure, glaucoma, and or cataracts. Sinuva should be used with caution if you have existing tuberculosis, fungal, bacterial, viral, or parasitic infection, or ocular herpes simplex because of the potential for worsening of these infections. The most common adverse reactions in clinical trials were bronchitis, upper respiratory or middle ear infection, headache, lightheadedness, asthma, and nosebleed. If I was to meet somebody that was going through something similar, understand that you need to do your research, but there are options available, non-surgical options that don't require the recovery time and the downtime that you would otherwise have. Okay, here we go again. Um, sorry. Sorry, somebody stopped my video. Uh, hello, here we go again. And um, I would like to introduce to you the next speaker, um, which is, hello, okay. I'm sorry, some, somebody's taken over my computer. So the next speaker will be uh, Hayu Brandbauer. He's an adjunct professor at the neuroscience and uh, otorhinolaryngology departments at the University of Chile. Uh, he's the head of the uh, Vertigo and Balance Disorder Centers at uh, Clinica Alemana de Santiago. And he will give us a talk on uh, what disorders should I rule out for the patients with chronic dizziness. There you go. My name is Hayo Breinbauer. And I'm a neurologist from Chile, and I would like to talk to you about today a little bit about chronic dizziness, particularly what disorders you should rule out for patients with this illness. Once upon a time, assessing dizzy patients was a mess. I don't know if you relate to this idea, but many colleagues have we have shared this feeling uh, during the years, but thankfully. There's, this is no longer the case. 
Thanks to the efforts of the Barani, Barani Society, we have now a new classification of vestibular syndromes that classifies all vestibular illnesses uh, in regarding their temporal profile. So we have acute, episodic, and chronic vestibular syndromes. For acute syndromes, the thing is relatively straightforward. Most patients will have either vestibular neuritis or a stroke of posterior fossa. And there's a lot of lectures and it has, there's been a great effort to teach about the hints plus um, technique to identify these two groups. A similar situation happens with episodic vestibular syndromes where, where most patients will have BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine. And you can easily identify these different situations based on whether the episodes of vertigo are brief or long or if they're positionally triggered or spontaneous. Yet, with chronic dizziness, there's still a little bit of a mess, or at least I feel like that when approaching these patients with chronic dizziness. And in this lecture, I will like to share with you how do I approach this challenge, this real challenge that's it, that is chronic dizziness. And I want to that, that the take home message of this lecture is that most patients will have a relatively new disease that is persistent perceptual postural dizziness. And we will talk about it in the second half of this lecture. And PPPD, which is persistent perceptual postural dizziness, can coexist with other forms of chronic dizziness that can be easily ruled out with paying attention to a few clinical signs. And this is the idea that I want to share with you. So let's, let's start with these other forms of chronic dizziness. And I think it's better to organize this, this um, by uh, following the clinical signs that you have to look out for. The first thing is to always look for BPPV. And most of you have, are saying, but hey, that's an episodic vertigo form. I will discuss that in a minute. But it's very important to always look for BPPV in chronic disease. Then you have to make a, a head impulse test. And performing head impulse tests will help you a lot to identify the most common forms of other chronic dizziness illnesses. As with all patients, and particularly in these patients, you have to look the patient in the eye, not only in a human level, but to look for spontaneous central nystagmus. And we will discuss that in a minute. Finally, and particularly if you have not found BBPV abnormalities in a heavy pull test and no spontaneous nystagmus, I would rec always recommend to perform a hearing test to uh, trying to identify and discard vestibular schwannoma. Let's get point by point. BPPV is a form of episodic vertigo, but it is the most frequent form of any kind of vertigo and dizziness in all kinds of population. And many patients can be very vestibularly sensible. And this can give you a situation where BPPV mimics chronic dizziness. So always look for it. And if you are in a hurry, uh, you can do the Dick's Hall bike maneuver even in a chair, which is a technique that I use every day in the, in the clinic. And I recommend if you do not have a um, table, if you have a table and you have the time, always perform a Dick's Hall bike testing. But if you do not, and you're not going to examine that patient, at least do the abbreviated maneuver in a chair, which has a very high sensitivity over 85, 90%. So roll out BPPV. You will be surprised how many patients have autolytes loosed, and that can be easily solved by, with a repositioning maneuver. So you have not this ideal situation. You have to move forward. And the next step is performing a head impulse test. 
you can do it with your own hands and using your own eyes to check if there is those corrective saccades. And if not, nowadays you can rely on the video head in post test. There are many lectures exploring how to do this properly and I invite you to, to see them if you have not do that yet. Most patients, when, they found, when you find in most patients with an unilateral abnormal head impulse test, so one ear is good, one ear is not working correctly, you will find in those patients a history of a previous acute vestibular syndrome that can uh, have happened even months or years before. At some point they will have that history. And what are we seeing here is that this is actually a vestibular neuritis, the most common form of acute vertigo that has not been properly compensated. This is a non-compensated old vestibular neuritis, and this is very often, particularly if patients have, have no exercise, no vestibular rehabilitation whatsoever, you will find this. And this is very easy to treat with vestibular rehabilitation, even if many years have happened. But if you have a unilaterally abnormal head impulse test and no history of previous acute vertigo, you have to get suspicious, big suspicious, because this is similarly similar to having a unilaterally high frequency hearing loss. And I know many of you are already thinking, hey, this is this this can be a vestibular schwannoma, and yes. This can be a vestibular schwannoma. So, unilaterally abnormal head impulse test or unilaterally a hearing loss of high frequency, do an MRI to check for that vestibular schwannoma. Now, what if you find in your head impulse that both ears are not performing well, that you have a bilaterally abnormal head impulse test? This opens the, uh, diagnosis, the diagnosis for bilateral vestibulopathy. And bilateral vestibulopathy is a big thing. There's a lot of causes, but most times patients will have no identifiable cause for their bilateral vestibulopathy, and you will have an idiopathic bilateral vestibulopathy. And that's just okay. That's what you will find in most cases. Um, there are some situations you have to consider. There is presby vestibulopathy. And many, some patients can have bilateral vestibulopathy very early in their life, in their 40s, in their 50s. But many patients will have a decrease in vestibular function from the 60s onwards. You can be quite relaxed if you have a bilateral vestibulopathy in patients that have a very pure chronic dizziness. But if in the history you ask, hey, at any point of your life, have you had a very bad day, a very strong vertigo attack? Yes, two years ago, or two months ago, or two weeks ago. No, well, that will be acute. But two years ago, I had a very strong acute vestibular syndrome. Then you have to get, again, be suspicious that because a positive history of acute vertigo in bilateral vestibulopathy can be a very dangerous thing to have. You, that can easily be a cerebellar stroke or a deficiency in vitamin B complex, which are things that you should identify and treat properly. Okay, so completely the opposite with unilaterally abnormal head impulse test, a positive history of acute vertigo, do an MRI and search for causes of for a bilateral vestibulopathy. So, other thing that you must always do is check for spontaneous nystagmus. And many patients uh, will have this. This is a vertical nystagmus that beats downwards. That, that, this is what we call a downbeat nystagmus. And of course, this is always central in nature. And it all, most times it will uh, speak about a cerebellar disease. This sign will go stronger, the nystagmus will be stronger in the supine position or with head hanging. So you can look for it when uh, checking for BPPV. 
most of these patients will have a normal MRI. So don't get afraid if you don't find uh, something in the MRI. And if it is combined with bilateral vestibulopathy, you have to think in the CANVAS syndrome, and there is extensive literature about this. So, uh, and what happens if you do not find anything in these physical examinations? What if you find nothing wrong? There are a couple of situations you have to look into. In elderly patients, there could be a case of presbystasis, which is the multifactorial balance law of the elderly. But in these patients, if this is the only problem, you will have more unsteadiness than dizziness. But don't worry, you can work it out with vestibular rehabilitation that will help these patients by all means. And speaking about vestibular rehabilitation, you perhaps have noticed that even with downbeat nystagmus, this treatment can help most, perhaps every, patient with uh, the forms of chronic dizziness we have reviewed at this point. So have that strongly in mind. But if you still have found nothing, and this is a young patient, for example, always rule out cardiological problems and post-concussional syndromes. These are not that often, that often to find, but if your patients has, have symptoms that are triggered with orthostatic uh, situations or with exercise or have episodic situations of only with lightheadedness, um, think of dysrhythmias and dysautonomia. And if they have a head injury in their history, well, think of post-concussional syndrome, which you can also help with vestibular rehabilitation. Okay, but now, whether you find something or not, most patients with chronic dizziness are likely to have persistent perceptual postural dizziness, PPPD. And again, this can coexist or not with the other forms of chronic dizziness we have just reviewed. This may sound a very new thing for many of you because the diagnostic criteria came just out three years ago, but they are the result of over 30, 35, 40 years of research in many different places around the world. And for many is the philosopher's stone for chronic dizziness because the number of patients who go out of the office without a clear diagnosis have been decreased from 30% to only 2% if you uh, add PPPD as a um, possible diagnosis. And this is very frequent. Uh, PPPD stands now uh, within the top three more frequent diagnoses for any kind of vertigo and dizziness. So yes, PPPD is a very big thing to have in mind. Obviously, particularly, in chronic dizziness patients. How does a chronic, uh, how does a PPPD patient look like? Uh, looking into the diagnostic criteria is a very helpful thing. These patients are uh, characterized for having, of course, dizziness or non-rotatory vertigo lasting three months or more. These symptoms are present most of the day, most of days, and but this fluctuation in nature, so you have, can have a good day and a bad day. Symptoms do not trigger with something particularly, but they can be exacerbated by different stimuli, for example, being upright or being a subject to active or passive motion, and particularly to be exposed to a complex visual stimuli. stimuli. These patients feel very bad when, when going to, um, to the supermarket to go shopping or to being exposed to the subway coming uh, to them. With this stimuli, they feel very bad. Very inter interestingly, PPPD patients often have their symptoms uh, initiated after another uh, disease causing vertigo or dizziness, after an acute or episodic or even chronic vestibular uh, illness, or uh, have, after having an anxiety attack or anything that can make them feel dizzy, these patients develop as a secondary thing, as a complication, PPD. 
And thinking about it this way is very interesting and helpful for identifying these patients. And of course, this affects quality of life very dramatically. Some clinical pearls. You should always consider PPPD as a positive diagnosis and not an exclusion one. If a patient has a history of PPPD, that patient has PPPD. He can has other things that you should also treat. But if you do not see PPPD and do not treat it like it should, this patient will not recover fully. It, for identifying them, they usually feel good in the morning. They wake up fine and get worse and feel worse uh, during the day. They feel better during exercise, which is very distinctive to other forms of vertigo. And they feel better when having a drink or having fun of getting distracted. And in this regard, PPPD has a similarity to tinnitus, for example. About treatment, many patients will get better with a mixture of sertraline or other uh, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors. Some forms and particular forms of vestibular rehabilitation can help them. Some forms of vestibular rehabilitation can make them feel worse, and this is important to, to check in detail. But many patients will, if you explain them what they have and you say to them, no, you're not crazy, this is a thing, and mo many people have it, and most people recover, eh, they will immediately start to getting to get better. And we will discuss that in the physiopathology of this illness. But you have to say that, yes, some patients are very hard to treat. So what is PPPD in terms of physiopathology? What is going on? What is wrong with these patients? This is the question that, uh, is, uh, that interests me the most and is the question that uh, I am researching more deeply in this moment and in, in my re efforts in, re in research. Some things that this is a psychosomatic condition, um, but there is a lot of evidence that uh, goes against this idea. There are many patients that have no psychological, no psychiatric comorbidity, and do have PPPD. Um, and this, the, this stands uh, for the idea that PPPD and anxiety and depression are things that can coexist in a patient, but are independent factors. So many authors, very respectable authors, uh, dealing with dizziness, think that we have to think of a new, plus, a new group of dizziness and vertigo disorders, with, which are functional disorders, where the brain and the ear are just fine in terms of hardware, and we're not dealing with a purely psychiatric uh, illness, but this is a software problem, a functional problem of how the brain processes vestibular information. Actually, there's a lot, and every day there's new evidence of that the brain of these patients work differently, that there are areas that are more connected or have more uh, gray matter volume and others, areas that have diminished connectivity in these patients. And the areas, the cort cortical regions having these differences have um, give hints of how um, what happens in how the brain processes vestibular information. The currently accepted model that is being, it's actually a question of, of great debate at the moment, says the following, that if we see balance as the integration of visual, proprioceptive, and vestibular information, a precipitant, uh, an event, uh, another form of vertigo, can uh, disarrange how this network is, uh, works normally, um, making a few changes in the brain, increasing visual dependency, giving a more rigid postural control, uh, relying less in proprioceptive information, and altogether re um, diminishing the integration of proprioceptive visual and vestibular uh, integration in the brain. And this disorganization disintegration, it was, um, uh, makes patients 
feel bad and which explains PPPD symptomatology. There are other models and in our team we feel more confident thinking in PPPD in this terms, in terms of a mismatch, a discrepancy between inner body representation and reality. What does this mean? This means that the brain thinks my body is here and it has this relation, for example, with gravity, but reality and what comes into my head from vestibular, visual, and proprioceptive signals doesn't match what my brain has calculated about my body self position. And in our uh, team, we have asked the question of what if this has not only to do with my body position, but with my self position regarding my whole three dimensional environment and my ability to navigate through that environment. And here are, we are including the concept of spatial navigation, our, our main hypothesis. And I want to take this last few minutes to uh, share my, my, our latest research in this field is that we think that PPPD exists as a discrepancy between inner the inner model of the world and reality in terms of the spatial navigation instances of the brain. How do you test for spatial navigation capacities of the brain? There are many ways. This is the Morris water maze when you ask a rodent to find a hidden platform in a, um, in a swimming pool. Uh, you, the rodent tries this very in different trials and he has to remember where the platform is in order to reach it uh, more rapidly in subsequent trials. You can replicate this uh, experiment in humans in a virtual environment as you have seen in this picture. And we did just that and we uh, asked the patients to find a hidden uh, target in a virtual round pool and we got so pretty surprised with our results actually because uh, you have healthy volunteers that have no problem finding the target in the white square in the image and patients with other vestibular diseases Meniere's disease vestibular migraine bppd vestibular neuritis have a little bit more problem finding it but they actually do it but ppd patients are very lost in space regarding this task and they wander around not finding the target. And even if they find it, they cannot remember and navigate properly to it in subsequent trials. These differences in spatial navigations were so dramatic that it allows us to discriminate between PPDPD patients and other vestibular patients. So we actually think that this could represent the first biomarker helping us to uh, diagnose these patients, and not relying exclusively on a subjective clinical criteria. We, we think it's, it's, it's an important thing that we are looking uh, more in the lab and future research at this moment. So that is our idea of PPPD, and I hope you have uh, got this message that uh, most patients with chronic dizziness will have persistent personal perceptual postural dizziness with or without other forms of chronic dizziness that you can identify with the clinical signs that we uh, reviewed. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Bye. Dear Professor Breinbauer, uh, thank you very much for this interesting talk and uh, your really impressive uh, slides. Um, uh, the PPPD, which is uh, really an, a new entity, uh, at least to me, um, it uh, yeah, might be a, a, a kind of game changer in the vertigo uh, uh, science. Um, for the reasons we do not have any questions in the, in the uh, Q&A, um, I would personally like to know um, uh, concerning horizontal BPPV, uh, do you have a preferred uh, maneuver, uh, and do you distinguish between uh, cupulolithiasis and uh, cannulolithiasis? So I'm, I'm speaking about uh, gufoni or barbecue, or what is your opinion on that? Yes, thank you very much for that uh, question. It is, of course, outside the, the, the topic of my lecture, but it is a very, very, very good 
question indeed. Um, at the moment, I follow the, a new maneuver that was developed in Brazil a couple of years ago by the very respectful professor in neurotology, Professor Suma Emaya, which is called the Suma maneuver, which is actually a combination of other maneuvers that has dramatically increased the uh, effectiveness of treatment. And uh, that's my favorite maneuver at this point. Uh, uh, um, followed by um, Gufoni maneuver. And for that, I want to clarify that I distinguish between three forms of lateral BPPV. And I think there's much confusion in the literature be between these forms. I um, think of geotropic form of uh, BPPV, a geotropic form, which uh, for many is in the former classification of cupular lithiasis and cannula lithiasis being the geotropic form, the cannula lithiasis, and ge a geotropic form, uh, cupular lithiasis. But uh, I strongly believe that cupular lithiasis is a third distinct a form with no latency at all. And I think, I don't know if you, you're heading your head. So I think you agree with that. So yeah. with the geotropic form, uh, Gufoni maneuver is the simplest and it's very, very helpful. And it's, well, geotropic is more frequent. So yes, I do a lot of Gufoni, but for the agiotropic form, which is, which gives um, us a lot, lot of headaches uh, as, as as clinicians, uh, the SUMA maneuver really, really is very good. And uh, after a single attempt, it has solved many difficult agiotropic BPPV patients. Okay, thank you very much. We, uh, we have another question from the chat. Um, yes. Does uh, the PPPD also present with tinnitus? Well, no. There, the, I, I mentioned that in the lecture, and there's some similarity in how the brain reacts. And that is very interesting in terms of research, but clinically, no, there's no clinical association between tinnitus and BPPD. Okay, so um, yeah, we got two minutes left. Um, maybe another uh, question which I'm personally uh, interested in, what is your opinion on the pathogenesis of uh, bilateral uh, vestibulopathy? Oh, well, that's very great question. Uh, we don't know. Um, there are, of course, many different forms of bilateral vestibulopathy. Many of them are, uh, for example, the most known is by autotoxicity auto with, with gentamicins and, and some drugs in that regard. And many, many are very idiopathic in forms, but I think for most patients with idiopathic bilateral vestibulopathy, you have to think this is the same thing as presbycusis that is uh, some form of uh, age-related uh, vestibular loss. That yes, it is uh, quite rare that you mm -hmm. can find this illness in very young patients, 40 years old. But also uh, in the same way, you can also find patients with very uh, early onset with, of presbycusis, patients very young that have this bilateral high-frequency hearing loss. So I personally, I, I, I think that bilateral vestibulopathy, uh, it's age-related in most cases, and that you find that very soon in life is, well, we're used that things that come with age come with 60 years old and more, but that's, uh, that's only a dogma. That's not, uh, there's no evidence for that. I see. Okay, so thank you very much for your uh, uh, detailed answers and your uh, nice talk. Um, if you have additional questions um, uh, from the audience, uh, please uh, go to the Zoom lobby and um, I pass over the hosting uh, towards uh, Professor Yongyu Lang. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, I will introduce the next speaker. I'm Yongju Zhang from Asan Medical Center, uh, uh, the chairman of the department of co-hosting department. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my dear friend, uh, Dr. Milos Kovacevic. Kovacevic. Um, he is based a facial plastic surgeon based in uh, Hamburg. He was trained in um, University uh, Heidelberg Klinikum Nord Hospital, Hamburg. And I really uh, admire uh, his effort to develop new technique for betterment, uh, betterment of the patients. Uh, 
I think he is a truly a thinker uh, in rhinoplasty. So please join me welcoming Dr. Milos Kovacevic. Dear young you, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be in such a big meeting for here. Uh, and uh, of course, I can give you a compliment back. You're also a great thinker. It's uh, always a pleasure for me when we both meet. So um, Brian Wong asked me kindly to give a lecture about basics rhinoplasty and one of the main issues, especially in our Caucasian patients is a hump removal, removal and also in the crooked noses. So I think we can start immediately with a lecture and I will give some Q&A update. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm Milos Kovacevic from Hamburg, Germany, and I'm very, very honored to be a part of this faculty in facial plastic surgery. And um, my presentation is about functional rhinoplasty and the problems which can occur in this area, and of course, the solutions. What we are seeing in our daily practice are noses like a tangent nose like this or a crooked noses and we should deal with this it's not only about appearance of the nose it's about aesthetics of the nose it's also about the functional problems and if we get rid of the hump with a traditional methods like a taking a rubin ostatom without reconstructing the world Functional and aesthetic problems occurs, and this is a mainly inverted V deformity, which you can see it beautifully on this patient nose. Also on these patients, it's a collapse of upper lateral cartilage, and it's mainly in the patients with a thinner skin and very short nasal bones. If you reveal the middle wall, we can take a look exactly on it and we can see why this happens and what is happening exactly at this. When we remove the hump, this is from Roland Daniels book and you see these two arches. This is a septum and two upper lateral cartilage when we remove it. In some cases, the upper lateral cartilage, if, this, if there is no support in this area, is collapsing and they're suddenly below the level of the septum. And this is what caused this aesthetic and functional problems. You can see it on this picture. There's a septum level, and this is upper lateral cartilage, approximately 2.5 millimeter below the septal level, which cause problems of breathing in this area. When we remove the cartilage, bony and the cartilaginous hump. When I divide it first, a lot of my surgeries are open, with an open approach, not a technique, it's an open approach. We should decide how to reconstruct the middle wall. And we have a mainly two options, either spread out grafts is a small pieces of the cartilage. They're inserted between upper lateral cartilage and the septum cartilage or to fold in upper lateral cartilage to the septum and to create so-called spreada flaps. These are so-called spreada grafts. This is an old picture of mine, I think 11, 12 years ago. This is a septum, upper lateral cartilage, and these are the spreada grafts. And these are spreada flaps. This is the upper lateral cartilage is folded in this region. But in some cases, if when you do um, spread of flaps, some problems can occur. And what happens in the profile looks natural, but in the front, you can see the bone is play because this um, upper lateral cartilage in this case was relatively short. It was on the same level. I created a folding, created a spread of flap. And after several months, it 
got a lot of tension, so the bone went laterally. So it came to so-called bone display and they, this patient got a wider nose. So we decided to make a, a rule for these cases. If your upper lateral cartilage is higher than your septum, three millimeter at least, you can fold it without creating a tension. If it's a lower than three millimeter or on the same level or below, if we would fold this cartilage, we, are, we would get a problems with this and creating a lot of tension and distortion of the middle vault area, then we should do those so-called spread out grafts. That means if higher than three and a half millimeter, spread out flaps folding. If lower than three millimeter, then spread out grafts. In some books, it's a little bit confusing what is happening when you place cartilaginous grafts or called spreader grafts that are going to open the middle vault. But in this older picture, you can see there's an invagination in this area. That means this cartilage is very, very thin. And in some cases, it, it is collapsing. So this is not going to support the breathing. So we should think what we can do. And uh, if we place these cartilage pieces like this, in some cases we can see um, very, very sharp edges in the patients with a thin skin. So this is not going to be a solution, obviously in a lot of cases, and you see the collapse on the middle vault, especially the breathing. So we decided to use other techniques, which was declared as an improper placement of the spreader, graft, it's a so-called, what we call pedestal spreader graft. So just a, we place this um, cartilage pieces just a little bit below, just a little bit below of the cell, sept, uh, septal um, surface, approximately 0 0.5 millimeter. That means the thickness of upper lateral cartilage. So upper lateral cartilage is literally sitting like as on the small pedestal on this spreader graft. And this is what we call the pedestal spreader graft. And it opens the middle wall and it creates a natural curvature of the dorsum, of the patient dorsum. And you see we are placing a graft, pedestal spreader graft in this just a little bit below. And then you can close it with a 5-0 PDS. So it, it gets your natural curvature in this area. Not in every, not every half of them, not both halves, it should be treated same in our patient. And if you see the middle vault, you see the difference. So we should rethink in every patient. And this is a beautiful histological um, picture from Yves Saban's book, the other previous picture is from Peter Spalhansis. When you can see this is a septum, the surface is almost perfect, almost perfect but you see the difference. So that means that we should treat every side of the nose differently. So we can place a spreader graft on the left side of the patients like it here, and we can use spreader flap on the other side if there is no tension in this area. So you can see it here how beautifully, this is a septum again, this is an upper lateral cartilage, and upper lateral cartilage covers this spread out grafts open the valve and on the other side, you can see how we folded our uh, upper lateral cartilage and created a beautiful um, spread out flap. And you can see how the dorsum looks very, very natural. Important is also mind the gap. There are sometimes just the gaps in the mucosa when upper lateral cartilage is not long enough and we remove our um, when we uh, remove a bony cap, so we should put additional grafts in this area. And sometimes you should put a graft with some kind of bigger tail behind. So this is a before and after the nose is straightened. And what I did in this case, pedestal spreader graft on the left side, normal spreader graft on the right side, clocking suture, cranial tip suture to avert to open the external valve, relocation of the septum, two millimeter removal, septal extension graft, 
and this came to this very, very good result. And this patient, other options, this is a patient where I did on the left side, pedestal spider graft, and uh, I folded the cartilage on the right side to create a spreader flap again, this patient. On this side was a pedestal spreader graft, pedestal spreader graft, he is a spreader flap and the profile view. And if you're doing spread of flaps, it's very, very important to do few incision just below the bony cap and also in this area to release the tension of this, of, of the folding. And sometimes if there is a bulging, you can create so-called interrupted spread of flap. And we don't have always to fold the full length. So that means we need to fold this upper lateral cartilage very, very close to the key area, but in the lower parts, um, very, very close to the caudal septum border, you should just place anchor researcher to prevent unwanted tension. And this is how it should look like. It's a spread of flaps and you see the smooth surface of the dorsum. And it's a hair before and after, after spread of flaps. In some cases, we need additional support with the other grafts to create a aesthetic dorsal line. And in this case, even after all spread of grafts, spread of flaps, it was not possible to create um, aesthetic or dorsal line. So I needed to place cartilaginous grafts, cartil so-called cartilaginous scales. There, combined with a high concentrated fibrin like a PRF. It was an only graft in this area. You see what happened with a also relocation in this case, spread of flaps, spread of graft, septal extension graft, septal extension graft support, a lot of other procedures. And with a piezo, with a, with a ultrasonic knife, I did a bone modeling in this area. And uh, with a um, graft, cartilaginous scales with a PRF on the right upper lateral cartilage, and you see the result, which is uh, functionally and aesthetically very good before and afters. If you rest the bone, be careful, because after 10 minutes, you can see suddenly your horns of your upper lateral cartilage. You finish the surgery, and, and 10, 15 minutes after, because everything is under pressure and some, some tension nose, especially you remove the bony part and your cartilage come, pops up and the patient comes to you after a few weeks, say, oh, ah, this is a problem. So you have to deal with this problem. And what we are doing is so-called partial spread of flaps. We don't fold it a complete length, just in a cranial part incrementally. This is how it works. And it works very, very well in a lot of patients. Several publications are very, very interesting, but this publication, this gives you a diagram what to do in a, um, some different um, situation with my friends, Frank Riedel, Abdul Kadir Gaksel from Turkey and Jochen Wurm. Sometimes we need a more support than spread of graphs and the spread of flaps and uh, to recreate a dorsum functionally and aesthetically. And in this case, is rib cartilage is needed because we need a structure. We need a recreated dorsum, which is so destroyed to the blunt force, like in this previous care case, it was a trauma. If you're when you, it's sometimes easier as a small trick just to take a piece, just a small, small wedge, approximately one, one half millimeter to release the tension of the rib. And you can see exactly the thickness of your rib is very, very useful. You see, and uh, you recreate the dorsum. This is a, just a partially, there's a lot of things to do here. Additional graph is coming here, but you can see how stable this structure is. And this is your fundament where you should build your dorsum and your tip. Additional spread, um, PRF with the cartilaginous scales. And this is her before and this is her after, one year before and after 
Also, you need sometimes bigger pieces of cartilage. For revision cases, this is a secondary case um, where patients went somewhere else and um, she came, she was not so happy with the results, which is obvious, but she's got also a lot of problem with the breathings and this is a rib cartilage before and after, before and after, before and after. And for the end, one of the most interesting um, techniques in the last five years is a renaissance of so-called let down, push down. There, um, uh, there, there are all those dorsal preservation techniques where we can have a dorsal aesthetic lines still there, but like you're moving the whole pyramid caudally. And so we don't need to deconstruct and reconstruct. And this is a very, very powerful and very, very good operation. And you can do to several techniques like a subdorsal Z flap or subdorsal cotal techniques, which we developed. We can literally flatten the dorsum and uh, to get rid of the hump and to get very, very good aesthetic and functional results. So for questions, you can mail me and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Best wishes from Hamburg. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kovacevic, for the beautiful lecture. Um, uh, we will have a, sh a short uh, time for the question and answer. Uh, here is one answer of uh, the question from the audience. Uh, how far underneath the nasal bones do you release the upper lateral cartilages for spread the flaps? Can you turn them in without release? Can you answer um, for this? There's a yeah, I can. I don't know if you can you see me because there's a problem with the video, or do you hear me? Can you hear me, Young Yu? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, okay. Video starting. Maybe I can. Okay, I can see you also. Okay, beautiful. Hmm. Um, usually, what I try always is um, not to go very, very far below the bones. What I'm trying is to do a short cut, approximately. 0 0.5, maybe two millimeters, just to allow the folding of my spread of flaps. Because the releasing, the full releasing of, 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 um, of upper lateral cartilage can cause some irregularities later. And it's very, very important to say, I try personally to avoid spread of flaps in a short noses. May I ask you one question, Yo you? Mm -hmm. Because I have a we have a maybe one minute. Tell me yeah. only one thing because you're in Korea doing mainly um, augmentation of the dorsum. Yeah, we what do augmentation. Of, of course, you're a master of it. You're a master of it. Tell me just the current, the, the, the best current techniques. Are you still in the DCF or did you switch to the solid rib? What are you doing now? Um, I... Um... I discarded the solid rib uh, long ago. I don't use oh, solid okay. rib. So, um, yeah, yeah. The, currently, I'm using a diced cartilage, uh, glued diced cartilage. I'm using uh, uh, more uh, design. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the implant is usually covered with the perichondrium or fascia. Perichondrium. And I think that but, uh, this is not a mainstream augmentation. Uh, in many private clinic, uh, still the um, use of silicon is most of. Yeah, I know. I know. I remember in Seoul. I remember your meeting, yeah, Gangnam yeah. style. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they call yes, it Gangnam yes. style rhinoplasty with a silicon. Yeah, yeah. 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 Many surgeons can do very decent job uh, using uh, silicon. Yeah. Um, I have one question for you. Please. Um, what do you think about the functional impact of the spread the graft. I know that there are debate about the effect of the role of the um, spread the graft in terms of breathing function. Now, some say that it widens an internal nasal valve, so it is beneficial. Some say that actually it doesn't have any effect on the 
uh, normal breathing function. What do you think? I think personally that the first, um, the most important thing for spread graphs is to prevent, to prevent inverted V. And as you know, as good as me, inverted V causes not only aesthetic problems, it causes functional problems. And um, there is a study, um, I can't remember exactly. I, I would, it would take 10, 15 minutes to, to look after it in, in my, uh, in my library, uh, for, I think it's from Boston, but they, they proved it was, I think, one military uh, hospital from Boston. They did a research and they proved in their research and their statistics that the uh, um, spreader graphs, they have a, some, that they, are, they have a functional uh, contribution to, uh, to the rhinoplasty. In my personal opinion, those so-called pedestal spreader graphs, as you remember, maybe I'm yeah. placing 0 0.5 millimeter yeah, below, pedestal. this opens the valve. This opens mm -hmm. the valve literally. And the small mm -hmm. spreaders, if you're placing in the same level, you know, you can, you can gather some kind of concavity and you can run into the trouble. Okay. Um, here is another question for you. Please. Uh, for the septal realignment with triangle piece excision, is there a risk of a septum fracturing? Do you get this question? For the septal realignment with triangle piece excision, um, can you can you maybe specify this question? What kind of septal realignment with a tri I think a triangle piece upper okay, lateral Q and A, and then uh, and maybe he is thinking. Uh, he thinks that um, he um, said that that was the last slide displayed. This last slide displayed. It was a upper lot. Uh, it was a. Um, it was a um, uh, letdown. It was a dorsal preservation. It was a. Is there a risk for a septal realignment with triangle piece excision? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, that. He is talking about the um, your it's, preservation. Uh, yes, method. there is a. I I have. I'm now mainly doing dorsal preservation. Let down, honestly, more approximately eighty percent of my primaries because mm -hmm. in those Caucasian noses, um, I'm doing it. I even do did um um a few. I will. We can chat about it after, it would be interesting. There's a new technique, Young Yu. Maybe next few days we should talk with a FaceTime. I have something new for you. Okay. You, yeah. can, you, can, you, can, you can do it in the Asian patients. Very, very interesting. Yeah. But I still didn't to, to answer to Mr. Chudhari. Um, I, have, I haven't seen until now, thanks God, any um, septum fracture. Okay. Yeah. What about... one... Okay, one more question for you. Yes, please. What about the cutting the over edges of the lateral, late, late, upper lateral cartilage and suture them over the septum? So yeah. You, um, what is I'm your? A, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of a, of a quotation: "Only paranoiacs survive." So mm -hmm. it's a better to place the small piece of cartilage called a spreader graft than to rely on the upper lateral cartilage and maybe it can that in especially in thin skin patients you 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 could have a trouble you can have a collapse of upper lateral cartilage and you invest just a five minutes in in, in this uh, spread of graphs and you can prevent a lot of problems but it's a good question very very good question okay uh, i have one question for you please in the thin skinned individual yes please um, despite every effort we have the risk of the uh, dosal irregularity. Excellent. I know that preservation rhinoplasty is, um, is starting from to avoid uh, the, 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 our effort to prevent this uh, irregularity. Okay. Still, do you, uh, do you think that the preservation concept can uh, avoid any use of a camouflage graft for uh, in the thick, thin skinned individual? 
And a thin skin patients, if you have yeah. a thin skin patient, if, if you can, if you can preserve the dorsum, mm -hmm. um, if we are very, very honest, after a few years, especially mm -hmm. in a thin skin patients, you can see in the spread of flaps, sometimes in the spread of grafts, small irregularities after a few yeah. years. This is mm -hmm. a reason I started, it's an article is published a few days ago in a facial plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Diced fat, chopped fat, connected with a platelet-rich fibrin, which allows mm -hmm. us to have a slight, I, I recreate literally a new uh, fat layer. So I can create a normal skin and it improves, of course, skin quality in a, in a, in a damaged skin. And if you have a secondary cases, we can talk next few days um, also it improves definitely the quality of, of, of the skin, but also let down a dorsal preservation. What I have seen in my patients, I see definitely less irregularities in, in, in this area. I see, I see. Um, in your vast experience, um, uh, what, what is your revision rate Co uh, due to uh, dorsal irregularity? Due, due to <laughs> total irregularities, my um, now I think just a due to dorsal irregularity is one to two percent because we started. Mm -hmm. I have a one hundred three consecutive cases of the letdown, literally without any hunt. We, we oh, started with a maneuver. There is a very very new maneuver, but we call it subdorsal clean, uh, subdorsal keel removal. And uh, it's uh, something very, very interesting. So I think we solved the problem of the hump recurrence in a, in a uh, letdown. It's a very, very interesting. And I would be glad to share with you. Okay. Experience. Yeah, here, here's so it's, uh, uh, definitely less. Okay. Here's one more question. Uh, the Please. same surgeon as question. Now, what's the size of cartilage excised for preservation rhinoplasty of your technique? It depends, of course, of the ham. Sure. We have a huge Turkish, Iranian, Afghani population in uh, in um, in Hamburg and in northern Germany. So, if the people have a uh, humps, there four, five, six millimeter, then you should remove a piece, but you do it incrementally, slice by slice, to do this. You can open literally to do longitudinal extraction to open the, the hump. And then you can remove three, four, five millimeters, depending on it. It's a very, very useful, interesting technique. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Milos, for your participation. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a great yeah, be here. I, Let's yeah. talk soon, my friend. Good, thank you, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, now, I, I'd like to invite the next speaker, um, uh, Professor Pil Sang Jong. Uh, he is the uh, professor at the Tanguk University uh, uh, Chonan Korea, and um, he uh, graduated uh, Seoul National University, and he uh, had been a president of the uh, Korean Head and Neck Society, and um, uh, he uh, published many papers, and he is particularly interested in uh, laser surgery. And actually, uh, I started my teaching career in Tangung University in 1996. I was there for six years, and he was my boss. Uh, please join me welcoming uh, Professor Pil Sang Jong. Thank you, Yongju. Yeah, you have to uh, share your uh, screen. Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Mm. Good. Thank you, Yongju, for your kind introduction. And also, I'd like to thank you, Brian and Professor Betch, to inviting me to this nice conference. Today, I will talk about the changing trend, how to treat well-differentiated cervical cancer. Uh, I must introduce Professor Dora Cocker, we call him father of the thyroid surgery. Before him, in the middle of 19th century, the mortality rate was 41% after thyroidectomy. Cocker's first 10 years at Barron, 
for 100 case, the mortality rate was 12.8%. Uh, and additional uh, 250 cases, 2.4%. And final new series of 560 cases, 0.2% of mortality. With uh, this great effort, he became the first surgeon to receive Nobel Prize in 1990. Uh, 1909. And this is the first case of total cellulectomy. Uh, she was an uh, 11 years old girl. At that time, she was very tall, and this is her younger sister. And nine years after total operation, the, she was a creatinoid because after total cellulectomy, her growing was stopped. From this patient, we can learn thyroid hormone is very important for growing for children. Now let's talk about the treatment of well differentiated thyroid carcinoma. We can use surgery, radioactive iodine therapy, and nowadays active surveillance also is one of the options. Among surgery, we can do total thyroidectomy, near total, and lobectomy with or without lymph node dissection. This is great figure. The changing trend of the initial surgical extent for PTC from 1940 to 1999. This is from Mayo Clinic. And at the beginning, uh, unilateral lobectomy was the most popular. But in 1950, the head and neck surgeon knew how to preserve parasitic gland and recurrent laryngeal law. And also, we can use. Uh, Started hormone replacement after surgery. From uh, 1950, near total was the mainstream for thyroid cancer surgery until 1990. And at 1990, the head and neck surgeon skill was nearly uh, perfect to do total thyroidectomy with minimal complication. So, from 1990, total thyroidectomy was the most popular surgery for thyroid cancer until 2009. And 80 American Thyroid Association made a guideline for thyroid surgery. And in 2009, at that time, the goal of thyroid surgery was removal of the thyroid cancer and lymph node provision of a diagnosis after a non-diagnostic or indeterminate biopsy, staging, preparation for radioactive ablation, and minimal recall or metastasis. And another change has been at 2015. At this time, the goal was changed a lot. The major goal was minimize potential harm from over-treatment a low risk patient and appropriately treating and monitoring for high risk patient. We can see the change in indication for total thyroidectomy. 2009, tumor size bigger than one centimeter should be a near total or total thyroidectomy. And 2015, tumor size bigger than four centimeters or gross ETE, clinical N1, or distant match. And this is indication for lobectomy or total. 2009, tumor size less than one centimeter, low risk, unifocal, intracellular, no previous radiation, no lymph node metastasis. But 2015, Tumor size, one for four centimeter, no ET, clinical N0, and no distant match. And also PTC, less than one centimeter without risk factors, lobectomy only. And this is changing guide drive, NCCN, indication of TT, 2005, age younger than 15 or older than 45 years old, 
RT history, distant match, bilateral nodal ET, tumor size at that time uh, bigger than one centimeter, cervical lymph node, and family history. 2010, it changed tumor size bigger than four centimeters and aggressive variant in pathology, and family history has been deleted. 2015 and also 20, 80 factors deleted and pathology poorly differentiated and history for radiation therapy uh, categorized as a recommendation 2B. And rather lack positive case was the extent of neck dissection. It has been changed in 2005, central neck dissection with modified radical neck dissection. 2010, central neck dissection with lateral neck dissection. 2015, selective neck, neck dissection in, including involved compartment, considering prophylactic central neck dissection. This is an uh, indication for completion thyroidectomy. Uh, like uh, to that's uh, similar to total thyroidectomy and 2010, macroscopic multifocal disease and 2015, confirmed contralateral disease, nodal match, vascular invasion, and fully differentiated. This is a change of uh, surgical extent in Korea with the 2009 AT guideline. Uh, for less than one centimeter tumor, uh, in 2009, the lobectomy rate was 60%. And 2014, it was 80%, 20% increase. But bigger than one centimeter, less than two centimeters, there is no change. Almost all total thyroidectomy. And in this report, 2015, AT guideline associated with an increasing rate of hemithyroidectomy. Before this guideline, it hemicellular rate was 17%. And after to, to, uh, 2017, it was uh, 22%. And in this journal, the trend of lobectomy was increased. 2014, it was uh, 1%. Uh, the tumor size was uh, less than four centimeters, T1. 2018, it was uh, 25 percent. And this is a paper report from UCLA. Uh, in, in 2012, uh, we used a molecular diagnosis like uh, BRAF. With this, the decrease in diagnostic thyroidectomy. And also 2015 AT guideline result increase in thyroid lobectomy as definitive treatment for cancer. This is a trend. 2010 lobectomy rate was 2%. And 2018 lobectomy increased to 20%, total 80%. And also, in this graph, you can see the stiff increase in uh, lobectomy after 2015. And also, this is a prophylactic central leg dissection. It has been decreased a lot from 2015. From this journal summarized, increased thyroid lobectomy and dec declined completion thyroidectomy from 73% to 26% and decreased prophylactic neck dissection. We can learn from this early adoption of new diagnostic technology and management guidelines has manifested in a less aggressive surgical approach to thyroid cancer. To make a decision for T1 PTC, many factors must be considered. Guidelines, risk factors including tumor factor and molecular markers, patient factors, increasing age, desire, medical team factor, experience, surgical skill. And I think this is one uh, of the factors 
rapport between patient and surgeon. This is from my 2013 lecture. What's the adequate extent of thyroidectomy? This uh, red one is malignant size is uh, around uh, one centimeter. My answer at that time was total thyroidectomy without or with prophylactic central leg dissection. And also we can do lobectomy with or without uh, central leg dissection. And at that time, my conclusion was, this was an uh, indication for lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. And this uh, red box, lobectomy followed by completion thyroidectomy or total thyroidectomy. And after three years, 2016 lecture, it was some changes. This uh, green one, I prefer lobectomy blue box, lobectomy, or total thyroidectomy, and red box, total thyroidectomy, or lobectomy, followed by completion thyroidectomy. And 2018, all this is a lobectomy case for my experience, and this black, uh, this blue box, it was uh, nearly total thyroidectomy before, but now lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. And this year, for all, this can be a candidate for active surveillance. And this is a Korean Society of Head and Neck Surgery consensus meeting at February 2015. Case one, female 40 years old, intraglandular six millimeters uh, tumor, high suspicion on ultrasonography. Would you do FNA or not? At that time, the answer was observation 27%, FNA 73%. And the biopsy was PTC. What's your choice for surgery or treatment? At that time, lobectomy 95%, total thyroidectomy 5%, active surveillance, 0% at this time. And this is the same tumor condition, but age factor was diff uh, di uh, different. 72 years old woman, would you do FNA or not? Observation, some increase to 33%. Biosource PTC was a choice for treatment. Lobectomy 66%, active surveillance 34%, and no total thyroidectomy answer. So age factor is very important, they know. And this is a 16 millimeters, T1B, intraglandular. At this time, lobectomy 83%. And 23%, some bigger, this time, total 67%, exceed lobectomy. So the extent of thyroid is still on debate in many ways. Now I'm talking about active surveillance. At 2015 AK guideline, active surveillance management approach can be considered with very low risk tumors. And they strongly discourage FNA or asymptomatic sub-centimeter thyroid nodules. Active surveillance, we can do very low risk tumors, high surgical risk because of comorbid conditions, relatively short remaining lifespan for other disease, concurrent medical or surgical issues that needs to be addressed prior to thyroid surgery. This is an ideal candidate for active surveillance at ATA 2015 guideline. All the patients with solitary papillary microcarcinoma, well-defined nodule margins, not adjacent to the thyroid capsule, confined to the thyroid parenchyme. This is also, there is a contraindication 
occasion adjacent to trachea or on the dorsal surface of reconstructed laryngeal lobe, and FA, FNA findings suggestive of high grade lymph node match signs of progression during follow. -up. This is a report from Professor Ito in 2017, a review of active surveillance trial. Younger than 40 years old patient, enlargement at 10 years, 12%. Nodal match at 10 years, 16%. Look at this. Uh, older than 60 years, at 10 years, enlargement 4%. Nodal match at 10 years, 0.5%. From this report, they conclude low, low risk PMC at Kuma Hospital strongly recommend close observation as the best choice. For active surveillance, we need a surveillance contact. Surveillance contact is effective tool to educate patient, codify a clinician patient relationship, document a plan for medical legal protection. During surveillance contact, you must um, in my, keep in mind, clinicians are not to push for any of the options, either surgery or active surveillance. Contract for active surveillance need a well-informed consent. And 2015, Dr. Brito says, a contract puts the clinician in a powerful position and the patient in a weak position. So in the past, PTMD, I'm considering and wondering how to uh, total cytodectomy or lobectomy. And recent years, T1A lesion surgery or active surveillance. And in future, I will considering T1B low risk PTC surgery or active surveillance. Decision making by tumor tumor factor, patient factor, clinician factor, and also biomarkers. Thank you for your attention. This is a Korean Head and Neck Society members, and I host uh, every year golf tournament for our society members. Thank you. Did you if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Yeah, thank you, Professor Chong, um, for a nice talk. Um, here's one question. You can go to Q&A at the bottom of this uh, Zoom. How does your department manage NIFTP nodules? Pardon? The question is, mm -hmm. oh, it disappeared. How your department manage the NIFTP nodule? Uh, FTP? Uh, it seems he retracted his question. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, he retracted. He removed it, deleted the question. Um, So uh, it seems there are no question for you. Maybe. Everybody's asleep in Korea? No, 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 I don't think so. Yeah, it's uh, early in the morning in Europe and um, yeah. uh, North, North America. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, here is one question for you. What is the interval of a sonographic exam for active surveillance? Uh, for uh, two years, uh, six months. Uh, and then uh, one uh, per one year, every every year for five to ten year, and then maybe it became uh, two years. But still, my uh, my patient, uh, I started the active surveillance uh, around ten years ago. So still uh, one year term and. After 10 years, I will do uh, two, every two years. Okay, yeah. Yeah, here is another question uh, for you. Uh, 
How does your department manage NIFTP nodules? Actually, uh, I'm not familiar with this uh, acronym, NIFTP nodules. Hmm. That's uh, some dilemma, I think. But in Korea, some uh, surgeon says it's not necessary to have a surgery. But with the FNA biopsy, you cannot uh, confirm the biopsy. So it is a changing in size. Or I will recommend him uh, diagnostic surgery. Okay, uh, here is another question. While active surveillance, what are the determining factors of surgical interventions? For example, yeah. tumor size criteria or metastatic lymph node? Yeah, um, uh, as you know, uh, the tumor size increase in 20% would be a indication for change to surgery. And if there is an appearance of a lateral lymph node, or also uh, bigger than one centimeter lymph node in the central area, it should, should be uh, recommend him to side of surgery. Okay, another question. Uh, there are so many questions are rushing in. Uh, what is the growth rate of all features that you do intervene? Uh, uh, I already answered 20% uh, per year okay. uh, would be the indication for surgery, but I think it is very important. The sonographic uh, radiologist who do the US is very important. Okay. Uh, there is uh, some difference from doctor to doctor to uh, measure the size. So I think you must know about that. Um, another question, if one side is PTC micro, sehr spannend. Äh, Hält das jung oder macht, kriegt man eher einen Herzinfarkt? <lacht> uh, some need to uh, mute. Ja, yeah. yeah, Susan Fleisch, please mute. Okay. If one side is PTC micro and the other side is multiple follicular, would you do total thyroidectomy or frozen section? Definitely, I do a total thyroidectomy first. Okay, uh, next question is, sorry, he is not, I'm not a head and neck surgeon. May I ask if we <laughs> yeah. give thyroxine suppression after the lobectomy for low risk cancer, how to monitor? Any blood test? Uh, in this case, uh, I think uh, with a low risk patient after lobectomy, uh, suppre uh, TSH suppression is not necessary, I think. But if there is uh, some change in the T4 level, uh, some low margin, even in the normal range, I will recommend uh, 50 for women and 75 for male patient. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Chung, for your participation. I think uh, we can have a short uh, uh, sponsor video afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Okay. Um, the next two talks will be moderated by Dr. Anna Sophie Hoffman from the University Clinic Hamburg. Yes, thank you very much. Hello and welcome from Hamburg. This afternoon we have one minute left, but I will already start in introducing the first speaker. Um, the first speaker of the session will be Dr. Susanne Fleischer from Hamburg also. She is a specialist uh, in, for ENT and phoniatrics. After her residency in the Western part of Germany, she joined the team of Professor Markus Hess as a senior resident at our university hospital in Hamburg. She specializes in digital laryngoscopy, stroboscopy, and the clinical diagnosis and management of organic and functional voice disorders. She has contributed to several leading textbooks and published numerous articles on related subjects. Together with Professor Hess and Frank Müller, they founded the first multidisciplinary voice clinic in Germany, the Medical Voice Center in 2014. Today, we are very happy um, to have her on board and she will speak about enhanced imaging in the office, tips and tricks for laryngoscopy. So welcome, Dr. Fleischer. I've already seen her, so maybe, okay, it's pre-recorded, great. Or they are. Because patients often ask us how big the vocal folds are, we then show them a scent because a scent has a diameter of 1.5 centimeter, which is about the length of a vocal fold. And that is what you can see here the vocal folds in general anesthesia and a scent, and both with a millimeter ruler. As you see here, your target can be seen the better, the closer the tip of the endoscope comes to it. Which means for laryngoscopy, a distance of a few millimeter to the vocal folds is best for seeing all details. So our conclusion is the closer you get to your target, the better is the magnification. To better estimate what is possible to see with one's optical system and how good magnification and resolution are, you can use some calibration paper such as millimeter paper or what we use for this is a cube with some graphics and colors. The cube is closed so we can use it as a sort of calibration box and also test the illumination inside. Please now look at the square in the right bottom and in the following slides you can see how good the magnification of this square is seen with different endoscopes. Here now again the red square and a millimeter scale and the red square is recorded with three different endoscopes. First left and bottom the square is shown with a 70 degree rigid endoscope with a distance of six centimeters because this corresponds to the distance of the tip of a rigid endoscope to the vocal folds. And then at the bottom right side, there's a chip on the tip flexiscope with HD quality, the distance as small as possible. And at the top right side, the same is shown with the standard fiber scope. Again, the distance as small as possible. And what you can see, there are quite some differences in magnification and resolution. And that does mean you can only detect what your optical system can show you. Very tiny lesions might not be seen. In the following, I want to show some tips and tricks how to get best imaging of the larynx, both for rigid and for flexible endoscopy. And these tips are based on the following. 
there are different possibilities to handle the endoscope. There are special positions of patient or examiner that help for certain questions. And there are some maneuvers that help as well. So the first tip is we always anesthetize. For transnasal endoscopy, that will be transnasal, as you see here. And since Corona, we do not spray anymore. Instead, we now give lidocaine 4% with a 2 milliliter syringe and ask the patient to sniff in and swallow. For transoral endoscopy, we also give lidocaine 4% with a 2 milliliter syringe and we ask the patient to gargle and then to swallow. Additionally, and depending on the gag response and on the specific question, we give lidocaine 4% endolaryngeal. That means we give it transorally into the entrance of the larynx with a boat cannula, as you can see here. And you all know how it works. The patient puts out his tongue. The examiner holds the tongue with the left hand and gives the anesthesia with the right hand when the patient is saying a long he and then does some laryngeal gargle. Now, first some tips for rigid endoscopy. For rigid laryngoscopy, there are 70 and 90 degree endoscopes and both work fine. But you have to adapt the angle how to hold the scope a bit when you change between these endoscopes. There are cases when you cannot see the larynx nicely, everybody knows it, or when the patient has a severe gag response. And here the position elbows on knees is in most cases of great help for better exposure of the larynx. So you ask the patient to lean forward and put his elbows on his knees as you see here. For getting a better magnification, the tip of the endoscope should be inserted deep enough and pressed inferior. That means it comes as near as possible to the glottis. In the left part of the slide, you see the standard position of the endoscope, which is approximately horizontally, while the corresponding image of the larynx is shown superior. Whereas in the image's right side, you see the position when the tip comes more inferior and closer to the glottis. This shows especially the anterior part of the larynx. More than 100 years ago, in the beginning of the laryngoscopy, these special positions were much more important. And there were some leading laryngologists that demonstrated how to do laryngoscopy. One of them was Kilian, and here you can see what he recommended. The examiner knees, whereas the patient is standing and bending his head. And this is still a helpful position, as I will show you in the next slide. So here is a video of a patient with impaired vocal mobility, shown in the first video. Seeing only this video, one probably would think of a paresis. But now in the second video, the same patient is examined some seconds later, just with a different position. And what you can see now by exposing the posterior clotis is a posterior by scarring. There's a scar bridge posterior and one could not see it in the first video with a standard position. And here you can see again the different positions of the endoscope and also of the head of the patient show different regions of the larynx. At the left side the standard position is shown with a rigid scope hold horizontally. In the middle, a position first shown by the laryngologist Turk, also more than 100 years ago. So the examiner is standing and the tip of the endoscope is held very steeply. 
it exposes the anterior larynx and the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. And at the right side, you see the position described before. According to Kilian, this exposes the posterior part of the glottis. And these positions are now shown in a video. And of course, there are more possibilities how to change the position of the endoscope. You can, by rotating the endoscope and inserting it a bit laterally, see more the endolaryngeal parts as the sinus morganii. Now, in the next part, we will describe how to work with flexible endoscopes. There is a principal issue, which is how to hold the endoscope. As you see, there is a handpiece for holding the endoscope and the handpiece has a lever with which one can control the tip deflection. And many modern scopes have some buttons as well with special functions one can use during endoscopy. And for these buttons you need your fingers as well. There are several ways to hold the handle. One way is ruling this lever of the endoscope with a thumb so that the tip of the endoscope moves according to my thumb's movement. This is when the endoscope is held like this and then the tip of the endoscope is again ruled with a thumb but as you can see I'm directing this handle towards the patient's nose. There's a third way how to hold this endoscope. You just rotate it 180 degrees and hold the endoscope with your finger here. Your thumb is opposing and then, then with your index finger you can also move the tip as you see. We prefer the way shown here how to hold the endoscope especially because you have the possibility to rotate the endoscope. We will show this later. And as you could see, you also have a better control to hold the endoscope at its cable. And in case you have a four-way endoscope with two levers to control the tip, it is good to have the digit finger and the middle finger to do this. Now we show you how to insert the endoscope. You should always have contact with your finger to the cheek or nose of the patient because in case of sudden movements the endoscope could hurt within the nose and it is also helpful when you ask the patient to move his head because then you can direct him with your finger. Now here the passage of the endoscope through the nose and the pharynx is shown and of course where the tip of the endoscope is positioned that determines what one can see. As you see here in this scheme it is also possible to go very near to the vocal folds or even through the glottis into the trachea. With a position at the level above the epiglottis, as shown here, it is possible to test some laryngeal functions such as respiratory mobility, the larynx during speaking or singing voice, and you can do the swallowing tests at this position. And then one can get very near to the glottis to get the maximum magnification of the vocal folds or to have a look into the trachea. And how this works, I will show you in the following slides. We call it the dipping maneuver because the tip of the endoscope is dipped into the laryngeal entrance for some seconds. This is possible during a deep inspiration of the patient through his nose. 
because during deep nasal inspiration, the vocal folds are abducting. And to enlarge the resistance for inspiration so that the patient can do this inspiration for many seconds, we recommend to compress the patient's nostrils by the patient himself or by the examiner. So the patient is first asked to exhale and then to perform a very long and deep inspiration through his nose. And we think that it is good to have first some trial inspirations without dipping for getting the patient used to this maneuver and for better estimating how many seconds you have time to do the dipping. And we repeat this dipping several times until we have seen enough. Nase zu so, tief ausatmen. Müssen wir tief einatmen. And here are two more examples. All the way out. And now, like 10 seconds inhalation through the nose. And exhale. And again, 10 seconds. And durch den Mund wieder ausatmen. And here, another helpful maneuver, the rotation of the endoscope. Here at the left side, we show the standard position of the endoscope that throws a view from superior onto the clotis. And at the right side, you see the endoscope is held, rotated by rotating the forearm by 180 degree. And by this, you have another view onto the clotis, which is from posterior and more horizontal. So you can see the more inferior parts of the vocal folds and the Morgani ventricles. And here we show how it works. The rotation can be combined with the head turn and also with the dipping maneuver. So let's have a look what happens when I rotate the endoscope. So I rotate 180 degrees and suddenly I have a different view, of course, to the larynx. And now I'll ask her to turn her head to the right side and suddenly we get a different view of the larynx. The head turn in combination with the rotation laryngoscopy does a good job. And again, a long inspiration. And out. Inspiration. Now this is a nice view. And out. So let's do the same thing on the right side. And again, inhale. And here you can see how the rotation endoscopy can be used for office-based surgery. In this case, for an injection. And again, an example for rotation endoscopy, now only the larynx itself. And as you have seen, one can combine the rotation endoscopy with the dipping maneuver and with different head positions of the patient. And here you see some examples for what is possible to see when the endoscope is rotated and the tip is near to the vocal folds. And there are nice maneuvers and techniques we use. Some of them are helpful as well for flexible as for rigid endoscopy, as the inspiratory phonation and the forced inspiration and the change of illumination. 
and some we will show now. For the change of the head position, there are many positions and here is just one example. Left turn, I can see the right recess, piriform sinus, and then turn the other way, and then this part is opening up. And give me a long E. Here's a patient with the subclotic stenosis in both images. And in the image at the left side, you cannot see the stenosis when the patient has his head in a normal position. But you can see the stenosis very nicely when you ask the patient to lower down the chin to the chest. And one can combine this, of course, with the dipping maneuver. Very nice and easily performed maneuvers are the inspiratory phonation and the forced rapid inspiration. By this, the medial part of the vocal fold is suctioned into the clotis. And here, the same patient at an interval of a second, and one can see the real size of Frankie's edema during forced inspiration. Here are some more examples. The so-called trumpet maneuver is performed by holding the breath and intense pressing. By this, the pharynx is widened and now one can see the posterior pharynx and the piriform sinus. Besides special maneuvers, there are also special techniques that might be very helpful, such as a change of illumination. We like to work with the narrow band imaging, the NBI mode, and this is especially very helpful for detecting pathological vessels. Here you can see the typical surface of papilloma with the little vessels, and these are more easily seen with NBI illumination. And here again, pathological vessels, the intraepithelial capillary papillary loops in dysplasia or carcinoma at the left side, and right at the right side, scarring that can also be seen more easily with NBI. Now, probably everybody knows the FEES, which is the examination of swallowing during flexible endoscopy. As you can see, we use for this examination green color. And with this coloring of the bolus, one can see whether there is a retention or laryngeal penetration or aspiration. As it happens, NBI illumination has a special effect on green color that is shown here. And that is the trick. With NBI, the green colors get brilliant red with much more contrast. And this makes it easier to detect laryngeal penetration and aspiration. For tracheoscopy, some maneuvers can be combined. In most patients, the trachea can be seen better when the chin is lowered and one can then perform the dipping maneuver as we described before. And I can see the vocal folds and parts of the trachea if she puts down her head to the chin tuck maneuver and I ask her to take a deep breath through the nose. I can even see more of the trachea. In some patients this is more easy to perform after transoral 
anesthesia of the larynx. And when the glottis is very narrow, a flexiscope with smaller diameter might be better for passing the glottis or the stenosis, as in this example. So, our conclusio. One can use some maneuvers, such as change of head position, and as a main message, get close to the vocal folds for getting a good magnification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fleischer, for this very interesting talk. I think after um, this session, everybody should at least know practically how to do laryngoscopy. There is one question from the audience. Is there any experience of aspiration of the lidocaine solution into the trachea during the topical anesthesia? And if you have some experience of aspiration event, do you have any tip to prevent this? You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Flasch. Yeah. So we um, do not give very much anesthesia, so some drops might get into the trachea. In some patients, we even want this when we want to go into the trachea or through the clotis. And when we do not really want it, we ask the patient to say he and makes this gargle so the drops will stay on, on the clotis and not be inspirated. Okay, there are, if, thank you. There are a few more questions. What size scope do you prefer in adults and which one in kids? We have two uh, endoscopes. One is not HD, but near HD quality. It's above, uh, it's about, I think 2.9 millimeter that we do use for kids, also for babies. And the other one is, oh, I think 3.9 millimeter. And this is in most noses very uh, good to tolerate. Okay, can you turn on your video? Everybody uh, ask. I, I just see it, yeah. Okay, perfect, great. So everybody can see you now. And um, one more question um, from the audience. In case of pediatric patients, do you have a tip to check the larynx, for example, subglottic stenosis or laryngomalacia? Um, we can check the larynx and the mobility, but uh, it's nearly never possible to look into the trachea because you need uh, the maneuvers you have, I have described here and with children that is not, or with small children that is not possible. So in this case, one would um, recommend anesthesiology, general anesthesia. Okay, and what do you do if um, you have an older patient or um, a patient in your outpatient center and you don't really get any endoscopy done? Do you do it in, um, in anesthesia, in real anesthesia or? Um, I think that's nearly never happened because we, we always can see things. But of course there are patients, you see the larynx and you have no, no explanation why he has um, a dysphonia. So in these cases, we would recommend a general anesthesia. Okay. And how does the patient press during trumpet maneuver so the larynx doesn't close up? And he, we uh, tell him to blow up his cheeks and to press like pressing, having um, like um, lifting a heavy box. Okay. Um, uh, there, one more question from the audience. I would like to know if she perform, uh, if you perform laryngeal biopsy always under local anesthesia, or in what cases um, you choose general anesthesia. Um, we can all do it in local anesthesia, but um, it is not very um, precise. And when you want to have more than just a probe, it's better to do it in general anesthesia. And of course, some patients have a too severe gag response and it does not work. But in most patients, there are these two options and you have to decide from case to case. Okay, and there is, um, I think, um, time for one last question. And um, this is, is it possible um, for you to use the flexible um, esophagoscope to do evaluation? 
Yeah, we can do it. We don't have a very long flexi scope, so we can only judge on the upper part, but it's not so um, difficult in most patients. They just swallow the endoscope. That works quite nice. Okay. And still one last one, because it's only 29 now. Um, when asking the patient to say ha 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 or he he he, um, is it to expose, uh, to expose it to which side? Um, there are two um, ways you do this he 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 for judging the um, respiratory mobility. And we do it very extensive and also let them cough and count and everything. And when you want to see details on the vocal folds, we um, recommend to take the contralateral nose because you have a better view on the contralateral vocal fold. Perfect, great. So, and um, thank you very much uh, for this great um, presentation and all the, uh, all the questions you answered. And I would like to invite now the, um, the audience to join you in the extra Zoom lobby. And very important for you, Dr. Fleischer, is also to log into to this Zoom lobby to be able to answer question, questions. All right? Yeah. Perfect. And then I would like to introduce you to the next speaker. It is Dr. Craig Durkay. And he is the director of pediatric otolaryngology at the Children's Hospital of the King Daughters in Norfolk, Virginia, as well as the fine endowed professor and vice chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. In over three decades at Children's Hospital, he has been an integral part of the hospital leadership team as a member of several key committees and task forces. He has served as president and chairman of numerous organizations in pediatric otolaryngology and currently serves as governor for the Virginia chapter of the American College of Surgeons. He has written over 150 peer reviewed scientific publications and 35 book chapters. Today, Dr. Durke will talk about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis and the current trends in management. We are very happy to hear your presentation now. Good morning, UC Irvine. My name is Crater Kay. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist from Eastern Virginia Medical School in the Children's Hospital of King's Daughters. As you can tell, I speak quickly, and I'm going to talk to you about RRP, current trends in management. This is uh, respiratory papilloma disease. I have uh, a couple disclosures on the PI for two different CDC multi-institutional studies on RRP prevalence and incidence, but don't blame me for the COVID testing or distribution snafus at the CDC. And I'm also the PI for a Merck-funded investigator-initiated study on occupational risk for HPV infection among surgeons. So just as a brief review, RRP is also known as laryngeal papilloma. It's caused by HPV subtypes 6 and 11, which are also the subtypes responsible for causing anogenital warts. It's the most common benign neoplasm of the larynx among children, the second most frequent cause of chronic childhood hoarseness. And typically, we diagnose it between one to four years of age with a delay in diagnosis from the onset of symptoms of about a year. We are seeing a decrease in the number of new pediatric cases per year, and the prevalence, which was previously estimated at 0.6 to 2 per 100,000, is most likely now at 0.4 to 0.6 with the current uptake of the HPV vaccine. Transmission is believed to be through exposure to HPV when traversing the birth canal of an infected mother, additional risk factors, appear to be for being firstborn, having a prolonged second stage of labor and being a young mother. It's really not that simple though, because HPV, the exposure is fairly ubiquitous and RRP is rare. The risk of contracting the disease has been estimated at uh, between one in 250 to one in 400 if the mother has an active condylomata at the time of birth and has not been vaccinated while approximately one in every 100 RP patients have been documented to have been delivered by C-section, the national rates are 15 to 25%. 
but despite this data, ACOG does not recommend elective C-section if the mother has an active genital wart. Other modes of transmission in children may be iatrogenic through exposure to an infected operating room, exposure in amniotic fluid, or child abuse. Risk factors for aggressive disease, which we define as needing more than four surgeries a year or having disease extend outside of the larynx, or uh, diagnosis under the age of three and infection by subtype HPV 11. About 10 to 15% of children are going to develop disease in their trachea and 1 to 2% in the lungs. When uh, people die from RP, it's usually due to either an airway obstruction, malignant degeneration, chronic lung disease, or an anesthesia disaster. An adult RP um, is thought to be either due to reactivation of pediatric disease or as a result of a sexually transmitted disease during adulthood. There are two peaks that we note between 20 and 40 years of age, and then again between 60 and 75 years of age, reflecting uh, senior retirement community uh, sexual activity. Adult disease is much less aggressive clinically with fewer yearly surgeries, but it still can progress to chronic lung disease and squamous cell carcinoma. The question is, is it biologically any different from pediatric disease, or is it just that the adult larynx is larger than a child's larynx and able to accommodate a larger volume of disease? Adults with RRP find their disease worsened by exposure to tobacco, radiation therapy, and reflux, and a lot of adults can tolerate office surgical procedures for removal, while that's rare in children. So let's shift gears and talk about the vaccine that Gardasil was first approved by the FDA in 2006, initially for uh, use in uh, girls 9 to 26 uh, years of age, and then in 2009 for boys 9 to 26 years of age. The main target group uh, for the vaccine has been the 11 to 12 year olds uh, before they become sexually active. Ketchup vaccination has been allowed for those 13 to 26. And it's important to know that the girls and boys are covered under the federal vaccines for children program that provides vaccine to children under the age of 19, covered by Medicaid, um, uh, S-CHIP and uh, TRICARE. Uh, in December 2014, the FDA approved the nine valent vaccine. In 2015, the ACIP added the nine valent vaccine to its recommendations. And then in 2018, the FDA expanded the recommendation to also include men and women between the ages of 27 to 45. And just this past year, the FDA expanded the labeling to include prevention of head and neck cancer, though they haven't uh, expanded the labeling to include prevention of RRP yet, but we're getting there. It was initially a, a three-dose regimen, but the Gardasil vaccine is now uh, being recommended as a two-dose regimen um, with the three-dose for older recipients and the immune compromised. And in this study, they found non-inferiority four weeks after the last dose between the two and three-dose regimens. Merck no longer is making the quadrivalent vaccine, and the CDC currently does not recommend revaccinating with the nine-valent vaccine if you originally got the quadrivalent vaccine. Uh, but this is why they expanded to a nine-valent vaccine, that the original quadrivalent vaccine only covered about 70% of the uh, HPV types that cause cervical cancer, but the uh, new nine-valent vaccine covers over 92%. And this is a really good vaccine that 100% of the HPV 16 and 18 related cervical precancers and non-invasive cervical cancers were prevented in the vaccine group versus the placebo group. 95% of the low-grade cervical dysplasias and precancers were prevented in the vaccine group versus the placebo group. 99% of the general warts caused by HPV 6 or 11. Um, and then in the boys and the men, an additional 90% of the general warts were prevented. And the um, uh, antibody uh, titers uh, suggest a long-term protection that won't need a booster dose that... Um, uh, in contrast to uh, the seroconversion rate uh, after a native infection that with the vaccine, you get uh, between 100 and 1,000 um, uh, times uh, mean titer of uh, protection. And it uh, uh, so far looks like it's uh, been um, uh, able to, to be preserved 
of since 2005 in the original uh, Nordic cohort. But it is important to get the kids vaccinated before they become sexually uh, active that in the initial uh, cohort of more than 20,000 subjects, 1.7% of them were serological positive at age 12. And if you wait to vaccinate them till age 15, it goes up to 15.9%. And it's also important to, to kind of market this as cancer prevention, not genital wart prevention. There's been some encouraging data from the CDC recently. Male coverage of the vaccine in the U.S. Uh, among uh, 13 to 17 year olds has increased to 60% for uptake of at least one dose and 40% for both doses. The female coverage is similar at 73% for one and 55 for both. Overall, the coverage is at 68% for one and 51% for both doses. But too many teens are not getting their second dose and the pediatricians really need to work hard on this. The rates are still lower than what we achieved with the Tdap and meningococcal vaccination. Alternative schedules and timing for the administration of the uh, vaccine are being worked on. That uh, Merck has funded a uh, uh, two-dose uh, regimen trial of the nine-valent vaccine that should be out early this year. And ASIP has already altered its recommendation in young children. Approval to administer by pharmacists would increase the uptake with supervision agreements similar to uh, how they're able to uh, now give COVID vaccines and flu vaccines. And the um, uh, AAP is behind a less is more campaign to stop over explaining the vaccine to treat it in the same casual and informative fashion as all the other vaccines. One dose regimens are, are being debated similar to the current uh, discussion regarding the COVID vaccines. Is it better to save the vaccine uh, for uh, uh, everyone to get two doses, or do you go out there and, and use your resources to give everybody one dose? Um, it, it looks like one dose is uh, protective for HPV. In this study um, of the uh, women who uh, got uh, one, two, or three doses, they all uh, compared favorably against the unvaccinated, and there was no statistical difference between the efficacy of one dose, two dose, or three dose. Uh, in Africa, this is a particularly big deal because cervical cancer is very lethal in Africa with more than 120,000 women diagnosed with cervical cancer every year and 82,000 dying annually. Due to the cost and other issues, the HPV vaccine in sub-Saharan Africa is rarely provided, but in uh, a pivotal study in Rwanda and Uganda, where school-based programs achieve 98% vaccination with a single dose, um, this could really be a game changer. Um, and organizations like Global Vaccine Alliance are, are willing to go out there and uh, put some money behind this. Occupational exposure to HPV and prophylactic vaccination for otolaryngologists is something I was curious about. We um, received a grant from Merck for vaccine and lab study um, um, support, and we uh, have vaccinated all the otolaryngologists, surgery, OBGYN, and urology residents and staff uh, who have environmental exposure to HPV through our employee health. The protocol calls for pre and post vaccination antibody titers. Uh, this is currently not covered by third party payers. Um, and our recruitment began in the summer of 2018, and we hope to finish this off by uh, the summer of 2023. Relaxation of FDA rules may also help us. That a federal judge in Manhattan ruled that the FDA could not prohibit the truthful promotion of a drug for unapproved uses because doing so would violate protection of free speech. The FDA is actively working on new guidelines regarding off-label promotion. This um, would be helpful to allow pharmaceutical reps to discuss the potential for prevention of RRP with pediatricians, uh, though it's not currently labeled for that use. Can we prevent RRP with HPV vaccine? Uh, this was the subject of our CDC study. Um, we uh, did a prospective analysis of incidence and prevalence at 29 children's facilities. Uh, we obtained tissue and blood from the patients. We did an extensive history from families, including vaccine history and abnormal pap smears. 
And we combine this with, with a 20 year retrospective study also funded by CDC to look at the effect of the vaccine with 26 centers having submitted complete data. The total commitment from CDC was over a million dollars. Um, these are the 29 participating uh, centers. And the preliminary results we presented at the International Papillomavirus Meeting in Sydney and our uh, paper, I'm uh, pleased to tell you, is uh, um, accepted last week. Uh, 143 prevalent cases of uh, JORP were reported from 20 participating clinics. Among these, the median age of diagnosis was four years. Half of the patients were male. Nearly all had been delivered vaginally, and the majority were firstborn. And the mothers were young, with an uh, age of 22 as the median. Few had had a known history of general warts, and none had received the HPV vaccine before delivery. Most of the um, uh, disease was HPV-6, followed by HPV-11. And then um, this is our uh, incidence and prevalence study that uh, uh, tracking the number of cases from pre-vaccine um, uh, era to post-vaccine era, you can see a pretty remarkable redu reduction in the number of new cases in the US. This is also reflected in data from Australia and Canada. There are public health issues involved in vaccination. Texas, Virginia, DC, and Nevada have passed mandatory vaccination prior to entering sixth grade with an easy opt-out. New Hampshire offers a free voluntary program and 24 states are considering legislation. I hail from Virginia and we had the largest increase in HPV vaccination last year going from 39% to 59%. There's still opposition out there from civil libertarians an anti-vaccine movement and the religious right, mainly focused on uh, being concerned that this could encourage sexual activity. And obviously the addition of vaccination of boys is gonna significantly increase the herd immunity. There is an act active anti-vaccine movement out there. They argue against mandatory vaccination. Why force healthy children to get the vaccine to prevent against future behavior that might result in disease? But of course, this is the principle of every immunization program dating back to polio and smallpox. You vaccinate the masses to create herd immunity to protect the relatively few who would otherwise become ill and suffer devastating consequences. And it makes sense from a financial standpoint, the annual cost of HPV associated diseases uh, comes to more than six and a half billion dollars a year while the annual cost of uh, vaccinating all the boys and girls uh, um, in the 11 to 12 year old cohort each year is 1.15 uh, billion. So 17 cents spent on vaccination is gonna save a dollar in treatment future costs. Vaccine ethics, uh, critics contend that abstinence is a safe alternative to vaccination, but abstinence only sex education approaches do not delay the age of sexual initiation or the number of sexual encounter encounters. Um, and critics also fear a disinhibiting effect and encouragement of sexual activity if you just talk about it, but sex education and distribution of condoms to counter teenage pregnancy and AIDS have not been shown to increase sexual activity and actually delay initiation of this. So we need to really go out there and combat the fake news about vaccine links to autism and the current anti-science rhetoric regarding vaccines. There are risk perceptions about uh, subsequent sexual behaviors after HPV vaccination in adolescence. And this study, the research suggested the vaccine will not encourage sexual activity, much like using a seatbelt doesn't promote reckless driving. Uh, there are adverse reactions from the vaccines, but fortunately they are a few and far between. Uh, over 29 million doses have been administered since 2014 and registered in the VAERS and the VSD database. Only 3% of um, uh, adverse events uh, were deemed serious, and there was no increased risk of thromboembolic events, Guillain-Barre, or death. Um, the most common side effects are syncope or local reactions. And the conclusion is that the nine valence safety profile to date is consistent with the pre-licensure trials and comparable with the post-licensure surveillance and epidemiological studies for the four valent vaccine. So let's talk about treatment. Is RP a manageable or curable disease? Dr. Kim from South Korea 
uh, published this article in Laryngoscope a couple of years ago on 29 adult patients that he treated with a concurrent surgical intervention, which was a micro laryngoscopic resection, uh, plus uh, use of the PDL laser and interlesional uh, sodafovir, and then followed the patients for two years. These were uh, uh, generally uh, severely affected papilloma patients with a Durkay Coltrera score of 18 at the outset. And after a mean of three operations, um, they achieved complete remission in all 29 patients. The most common subsite for recurrence was the anterior commissure. The surgical technique included a micro laryngoscopic on block resection that included the submucosal glands using cold instruments, followed by PDL and the interlesional sodafovir. This obviously needs to be reproduced in uh, other adults and uh, children cohorts, but it is encouraging information. And will treating patients with RRP with the vaccine be helpful? The upside is that you, uh, at worst, protect them against the other eight strains of HPV that they're not infected with, protecting them against future cervical, penile, anal, and head and neck cancers. And if administered after surgically clearing all the visible papilloma, it may actually prevent regrowth. The downside is that the patient may incur out-of-pocket out of expense if it's used off-label under the age of nine, and that cervical cancer and wart data suggest that the vaccine will not make established lesions go away. In the systematic review of adjuvant HPV vaccination for secondary prevention by Bransky and others at NYU, they looked at 19 studies covering more than 22,000 patients, and they found that nine of the 12 studies reported decreased disease recurrence, decreased disease burden, or an increase in their surgical interval in those with active disease. There was great variability in the studies, and it uh, suggests that there is a role in those with active disease who have mounted a poor immunologic response against their papilloma. So what are some other adjuvant therapies that can be used besides surgery to treat RRP? I was the lead uh, author on this uh, review of sodafovir use. We uh, surveyed 115 uh, laryngology um, and uh, pediatric otolaryngologists uh, for their uh, use of uh, sodafovir. 74 of the 82 had used sodafovir within the past 10 years, encompassing an experience with 447 children. We came up with 18 consensus statements, the main ones being that you should try it if a patient is needing more than six surgeries in a year, if they're having an increased frequency of surgery or an extra laryngeal or bulky disease. Uh, the typical dose should be less than three milligrams per kilogram, the concentration 2.5 to 7.5 milligrams per ml and a volume less than two mLs. Should usually schedule a trial of five treatments do routine biopsies and offer informed consent. Let's talk about Avastin. Avastin is a monoclonal antibody to a vascular endothelial growth factor, which prevents its inter interaction with the VEGF receptor. It's not really found to be very useful when injected locally, but when used systemically, it seems to help a lot with those with extensive laryngeal tracheal and even pulmonary disease. We've developed a protocol, we being Karen Zur, Simon Best, Doug Seidel, and myself, and we use the Delphi method of, to survey experts, and the particulars of the protocol were accepted for publication last month. This is one of Simon's patients, pre and post uh, eight cycles of acyclovir, oh, I'm sorry, of, of Astin. This is tracheal disease before and after of Astin. And the best practice recommendation is you debride them in the OR and then immediately follow them with their first IV dose of Avastin. Um, dose them at 10 milligrams per kilogram IV, start the frequency at every three weeks, do a second look at three to six weeks with debridement to maximize the window from the medication to work. The laryngeal and tracheal disease seems to respond quickly. After four to five doses, you can start to back off on the interval but the response to pulmonary disease can take longer and these patients need to be followed with serial CT chest uh, at six month intervals. Um, it appears to suppress the disease phenot phenotype but not cure it. Stopping the medicine uh, likely results in disease recurrence, but you can reload the medicine and, and get the disease under control again. You really need to partner with medical oncologists who use this medicine in uh, infusion centers Approval often needs to be obtained on a case-by-case -case basis because it's off-label, and the side effects that need to be monitored are hypertension and renal function. 
Uh, PDL1 uh, therapy for adult and adolescent severe ARP has been looked at by Clint Allen at NIH and Sarah Pai and Aaron Friedman at uh, Mass General and Northwestern. Um, there's a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, human monoclonal antibody, uh, uh, Bavencio and Keytruda are the two uh, brand names. Um, uh, these medicines bind to the PDL1 and prevents interaction with PD1, allowing restoration of immune function through activation of cytotoxic T cells, and is designed to unleash T lymphocyte killing of papillomatous cells. The initial results have been encouraging for laryngeal and tracheal disease, but not so much for pulmonary disease. Xenograft model for therapeutic drug testing in RRP. This is the idea behind sort of uh, personalized medicine. You biopsy your papilloma, you xenograft it into a mouse, pass it over multiple generations, and then in vivo test it against uh, different drugs. In uh, this case report, they uh, used Avastin and saw a dramatic response. This working on uh, built on some of the work um, developed by Dick Schlegel at Georgetown, Chris Hartnick in Boston, and Matt Brigger and Seth Pransky in San Diego. It may be a feasible approach to identify new therapeutic agents in the treatment of RRP. Um, and then uh, lastly, therapeutic DNA vaccines have a lot of uh, promise. Uh, Inovio has an HPV 6067 a vaccine and uh, NIH has developed a 611 E2, E4, E67 a vaccine for adult and adolescent uh, RP uh, phase three trials. If you're interested in getting your um, uh, potential patients enrolled, you can contact Clint Allen at NIH or Seth Pransky in San Diego uh, regarding the Inovio study. And future directions, maybe we can combine Avastin and immunological therapy or Avastin and Sadafavir to eventually cure RRP, given the low side effect profile and uh, uh, encouraging efficacy. It might be worthwhile considering Avastin as a primary treatment, and it might be time for a paradigm shift to start to treat aggressive papilloma with medical versus traditional surgical therapies. This is the cutest grandson ever, and his um, sister, the cutest granddaughter ever. I'm going to hang on here and answer questions for the next couple of minutes. Thank you to um, University of California, Irvine, for allowing me to do this presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't start my video uh, because I think the host has to, um, started. Uh, hold on. Here we go. Perfect. So there is one question from the audi audience. What is the youngest age the vaccination can be given in case of uh, the papillomatosis? Well, uh, according to the CDC it's um, and the FDA, it's nine, but you can use it off-label as young as the child needs it. Um, so just by uh, labeling, uh, you should begin um, vaccinating children at the age of nine. Uh, uh, um, we've um, given the vaccine to children as young as one. Speaking to the scientists at Merck, there's no reason why it should be uh, ineffective in a younger child, but it, it could potentially need a booster dose if you started at a very young age. Great. Are you recommending vaccinations to surgeons operating on the papillomatosis patients? <clears throat> well, that's what we're studying. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, we got a nice grant from to see if it's efficacious. Uh, really, at the pre-vaccination uh, antibody titers among those who are occupationally exposed to HPV, and make sure that. Um, by giving them the vaccine, we offer them additional protection in the workplace. But we should have an answer for that in 2023. Okay. Um, if the papillomatosis lar uh, is laryngeal and extra laryngeal has dysplasia or malignancy, any role of adjuvant? That's another question. I'm sorry, uh, any role for which? Uh, for of an adjuvant therapy. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. 
Okay, then, um, I, to be honest, I don't really understand the question either. The, the next question is, in the US or in Europe, do otolaryngologists prescribe HPV vaccinations? So uh, we're being recorded, but I'll, I'll still say it out there. Uh, we sneak it in, in, the, in using it off label in the younger children, uh, we'll vaccinate them in the operating room that it's um, often difficult to uh, get the insurance company to approve it on an ambulatory basis, but um, the hospital bills are pretty complex and we'll order it um, when the child is uh, under anesthesia and we'll administer it under anesthesia. Um, as an advocate, I think it's very important that otolaryngologists get involved in convincing families that are vaccine hesitant um, to get their children uh, uh, vaccinated against HPV for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, prevention of RP being one, but prevention of head and neck cancer and, and the myriad of other um, uh, diseases and cancers that uh, HPV is responsible for. Perfect, there are a few more questions, but we are run, um, running out of time here. So I would like to ask you to come into the Zoom lobby and um, I will follow you there to ask um, and answer more questions. And I would like to introduce Professor Hess um, as the next moderator um, who will moderate the next session. Thank you very much, Professor Hess. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now and we're online. This was a, a terrific afternoon here in, in Germany and I really enjoyed it. And but. It's still going on and the last talks of our module number 13. And the next speaker will be Dr. Pete Batra. And Dr. Batra is well known for his uh, work and he's chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And he's also the medical director of the Rush Sinus Allergy and Asthma Center. He has published a lot, over 200 peer review articles, he has given lectures, more than 400, I think. And he's also serving as a second vice president and serves as the rhinology subgroup leader. So I think we would be very interested to hear what he has to talk to and talk to us about fungal sinusitis and the diagnosis and management. Dr. Batra, please. I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my charge in this conference is to speak to you about fungal rhinosinusitis. Over the next 25 minutes, I'm going to go through the differential, the diagnosis, and we'll go through management strategies, specifically focusing on each of the variants. These are the disclosures, uh, none that are relevant for this specific presentation. From an evolutionary standpoint, the presence of fungus can be traced back to the planet uh, about 300 million years. Uh, it is estimated that the biomass of fungus on planet Earth is 10 to the 9 ton. Uh, there's about 100,000 different species that uh, exist with about 400 that are known to cause disease uh, in humans. So it is fair to say that fungus is truly ubiquitous among us. And here's a couple of examples. You can see the typical bread mold or this uh, fungus that is uh, growing on uh, these uh, logs uh, in the forest. When we look at fungal rhinosinusitis, we can really classify this in, into the non-invasive and invasive uh, variants. And I would point you to this very nice uh, study by Chakrabarti, which was really a a, a group uh, that was convened to look at this classification scheme. So under the non-invasive variants, you have the superficial mycosis, you have fungal ball, and then the very interesting allergic fungal sinusitis. And on the invasive side, you have the acute invasive or the fulminant invasive fungal sinusitis. You have chronic invasive fungal sinusitis and chronic granulomatous 
uh, fungal sinusitis. And I will go through each of these variants, go through the key clinical features, and we'll talk about management of each of these. From an epidemiological standpoint, when you look at the study where they looked at 400 patients with known fungal sinusitis, you can see the majority of them have the non-invasive variant uh, to be 87.5% uh, exactly. Um, and you can see that's almost equally split among allergic fungal sinusitis at 45% and fungal ball at 40%. And the remainder were invasive, with acute invasive being the most common. A chronic invasive and chronic granulomatous are much more rare, um, and you can see only comprised less than 2% of all patients in the study. Nonetheless, they're important to recognize, and we'll go through examples of these cases as well. So looking at superficial cyanonasal mycosis, this is really a saprophytic fungal infestation, and it's really tufts of fungal materials that can arise on stagnating mucus or on crusts, and it's essentially bread mold. Um, patients may be completely asymptomatic or may report of presence of foul odor or even facial pressure. Um, in my practice, I've seen this typically in patients in the setting of previous surgery when they've come for an opinion. In this right max ray sinus, you see this retained unstent process stagnating mucus, and you can see mold forming on that. In the right sphenoethmoid recess, a large crust with some fungus that's starting to, to develop. Um, and then in this patient with a incomplete misnatural ostium of the maxillary sinus, again, you can see this large dry mucus and crust. And then again, you can see uh, fungus forming directly on that. And so Local debridement and saline rinses for majority of these patients should be curative. And certainly this is the most simple one to manage. Now, moving on to fungal ball, this is really an accumulation of dense fungal debris in a sinus cavity. And again, there is no mucosal invasion. There's a couple of confusing terms that are often used interchangeably and really should not be. Uh, there's a term called mycetoma, which is really a dermatologic condition referring to a local uh, invasive infection of the subcutaneous tissues, or that older term aspergilloma, which is a chronic locally invasive fungal sinusitis seen in the Sudan uh, caused by aspergillus flavus. And this is really the chronic granulomatous variant. And again, I would discourage use of either of these terms. With fungal ball, they likely occur from one or two pathways. Uh, the most common is the aerogenic pathway, where there's likely an inhalational uh, of mold spores through the sinus ostium, uh, and, then the, and then the fungus can continue to germinate uh, in that specific sinus, and eventually forming a large tuft of fungus and resulting in patient symptoms. Or the iatrogenic pathway, which is usually due to odontogenic Procedures. I've also seen this after maxillomandibular advancement surgery, where there's implantation of fungus into a sinus, uh, resulting in the final common pathway of a, a fungal ball. Uh, this is a nice large study by Pierre Nicolai's group, also published about a decade ago in laryngoscope, reporting their experience with 160 cases, uh, most commonly seen in middle aged patients, about a three to one predilection in females. And you can see. Uh, these are the typical symptoms, uh, repeated sinus infections, facial pain and pressure, uh, purulent discharge or smell disturbances. But interestingly, almost a fifth of these may be in some asymptomatic. And in some of these patients, it may pose a dilemma when you pull the trigger on surgery. When you look at the location, certainly the maxillary is the most common, showing you a right uh, maxillary fungal ball with classic hyperdensity. Another one with a left maxillary uh, fungal ball, again, showing the hyperdensity. Uh, sphenoid is the second most common at a little more than 14%. Uh, left sphenoid uh, with hyperdensity, right sphenoid uh, with hyperdensity. Uh, very rarely can they occur in the ethmoid sinuses. And this is a patient that took care of many years ago, which has a fungal ball within a right contrabolosa. The patient had right-sided facial pressure and uh, purulent discharge. And interestingly, uh, MR imaging on this of this area showed a signal dropout 
I took her to the OR and uncapped the ethmoid bulla, and you can see this tuft of fungus sitting within that area. And once that was uncapped and, unevacu and evacuated, the patient's symptoms uh, completely resolved. You can see the gross appearance. It can have the soft, wet uh, appearance, or it can have a, a more of a gritty uh, and firm appearance. And the color can be anywhere from green, yellow, brown, or black. And when you look at this under a microscope, you'll see this entangled mass of hyphae with a, a, a minimal uh, mucosal uh, inflammatory reaction, which is typically neutrophils. And again, there is no presence of fungal uh, invasion. And on CT imaging, showing you examples of patients that have managed over the years, uh, you may see partial or complete uh, a pacification of a sinus uh, with, again, this heterogeneity, which is due to metallic areas or microcalcifications from calcium salts. Uh, it's very common to have adjacent bony sclerosis, as you see within this left sphenoid sinus. And Anywhere from 4 to 17% can, can have bone erosion. You can see erosion of the intersphenoid septum in this case. This patient was sent to me with the idea of a tumor. You can see erosion at the level of the clivus. You can see the subtle hyperdensity as well. And this was just a very large erosive sphenoid uh, fungal ball. Uh, the treatment of this is endoscopic surgery. You want to create a wide opening of the involved sinus, ensure complete evacuation of the fungal debris, I've done lots of revision fungal balls when the fungus was not fully evacuated and it does return and the patients can remain symptomatic. There's no role for antifungals or immunotherapy for an isolated fungal ball and the prognosis is really quite excellent. Moving on to allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. This was a term that was coined by Macmillan in 1987 when he observed the presence of uh, allergic fungal sinusitis in two patients with curvilaria. The actual association can be traced back to work by Millar in 1981 when he looked at allergic aspergillosis uh, and its uh, association with allergic bronchopulmonary uh, aspergillosis. But we know this is an extramucosal immunologically mediated fungal process, most commonly seen in young patients, uh, adults, uh, or adolescents, um, and uh, invariably associated with the presence of nasal polyps and this classic fungal mucin. Uh, roughly about half of the patients may have asthma. Uh, uh, classic atopy is reported in two-thirds of patients, but in research studies, 90% of these patients can have elevated specific IgE to fungal antigens. Uh, I currently practice at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. I practiced uh, early in my career at the Cleveland Clinic. In the northern climates in the U.S., we see this less frequently. Uh, when I practiced at University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, uh, I saw this a lot more. So it is much more prevalent in the southern and southeastern United States. Uh, the pathogenesis is likely due to a composite of factors. There's certainly local host factors. There may be anatomic anomalies. Uh, Contabulosa variant has been thought to be perhaps one contributing factor. Uh, you have to have the environmental fungal exposure, and you have to have the predisposed genetically inclined host who has atopy and ability to form a T-cell mediated response. So you have the initial antigen exposure, fungal proliferation, and this can then trigger an inflammatory cascade resulting in a TH2 mediated pathway but can also be IgE mediated as well. Uh, this then uh, results in eosinophil recruitment, uh, and this will result in edema, obstruction, stasis, reduced ventilation, and then it can just form this downward spiral, and this disease will just continue to progress and can result in massive skull base or orbital erosion until it is reversed through the action of often surgery and appropriate medical therapy. Uh, this is a classic diagnostic criteria as posited by Benton Kuhn. Uh, type 1 hypersensitivity to fungus, nasal polyps, characteristic CT findings, as you see here, this thick, dense eosinophilic mucin that I'm suctioning out of the left uh, frontal sinus in an adolescent male. Uh, and then the initial criteria did uh, also uh, 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 require the positive fungal stain 
or culture, uh, which is often the case in most of these patients, but not universally. Uh, in data showing at the fungal isolates, it's most commonly Aspergillus and the Demetaceous species like uh, Fusarium, Curvillaria, Penicillium, Cladosporium, uh, Bipolaris. Uh, so it's typically, these are the types of fungal isolates one would expect to find if you were to send this for fungal stains and culture. Uh, CT findings are really quite uh, uh, a classic and can be quite dramatic. Uh, it does tend to be unilateral or asymmetric in about four-fifths of the patients. Uh, you can expect to see paranasal sinus expansion. As you see here, uh, bony erosion, uh, which can be quite massive, uh, and these characteristic hyperdensities, which are just large clumps of uh, fungus uh, within all of these individual sinuses. You can see a very advanced case with significant erosion of the orbits and the entire skull base. In fact, this was sent uh, to me uh, with the idea that this was a skull-based tumor. MR imaging is not required uh, for all cases, and I reserve it selectively if there's extensive skull base or orbital erosion, or if there is uh, concern about accurate diagnosis. But what you can expect to see is on T2-weighted images, uh, you'll get the signal dropout, which is quite classic and characteristic. You have these hypotense areas, which will look like air, but it's actually just dense concretions that do not light up on the MR signal on T2-weighted images. And you'll see this peripheral mucosal enhancement. You see this uh, fungal disease within the sphenoid. And again, it can look like an aerated sinus. And then you see this peripheral mucosal enhancement on these T2-weighted images. Uh, the treatment is certainly for the types of advanced cases that I just showed you. Surgery is critical, uh, but then there's a whole host of other medical adjuncts that are critical for long-term uh, disease control. Uh, the goals of the surgery are really fourfold. Uh, one is to establish ventilation and drainage, reduce polyp road, comprehensively clear this dense eosinophilic and, and fungal mucin and debris, uh, and then cultures and histopathology to enhance diagnosis. Uh, at Rush, we perform structured histopathology uh, with a, a large number of variables assessed in each single patient that undergoes surgery for inflammatory disease. But I think it's important to underscore the point that comprehensive surgery is key to successful disease management. I also want to emphasize uh, that surgery can be a significant challenge. Uh, you can have very significant distortion of the normal anatomic landmarks. This is a disease that does not know any boundaries. Uh, the loss of bone adjacent to the critical uh, structures will further add to the surgical challenge. Uh, so image guidance can be an important adjunct. Uh, and I always start these patients in aggressive pre-op medical therapy. Uh, Culture-directed antibiotics has indicated uh, oral steroids for one to two weeks to really minimize inflammation, reduce bleeding, uh, to, to be able to do a comprehensive surgery. Here's a patient that had very severe left-sided AFS, and you can look at the sphenoid, you can see a very uh, uh, a prominent optical carotid recess, optic nerve, you can see pulsation of the platinum, that's dehiscent, pulsation of a dehiscent cella, and also pulsation at the level of the clivus. And often, these things may not be evident until all of the disease is cleared, the mucosal inflammation has settled down, and you really realize how close you were to all of these critical structures. And you can see this very large frontal opening, and again, expanded due to the fungal process within the frontal recess. These patients require really close monitoring, serial endoscopy. Um, earlier data suggested long-term systemic corticosteroids. Uh, certainly, I think we need to be more judicious. And then adjuncts such as topical steroids, uh, steroid irrigations, uh, and immunotherapy certainly may play a role for a select group of these patients as well. So now I'll move on to the invasive variants, and we'll talk briefly about uh, chronic invasive and chronic granulomatous, and then I'll spend a fair bit of time of the uh, last part of the talk on the acute invasive. So when we look at chronic invasive, this is a more slow, insidious, destructive process. And the typical span uh, course of time is uh, over 12 weeks. Uh, I have seen this in patients that are borderline immunosuppressed, uh, such as diabetics, 
or chronic steroid users. And commonly, this will occur in the ethmoid or sphenoid sinuses, but can really arise within any sinus. When you look at this histopathologically, uh, you can see subepithelial invasion of fungus, as you see here, occasional vascular invasion, and then sparse inflammation. Um, Aspergillus fumigatus is the most common organism, and treatment is typically conservative, uh, endoscopic surgical debridement, and then long-term antifungal therapy. Um, when we look at the chronic granulomatous fungal sinusitis, uh, typically this is seen in the immunocompetent host. Um, this is caused by Aspergillus flavus and most commonly seen in North Africa and South Asia. And in some cases, this can actually present as an enlarging mass in the cheek or orbit or the sinuses. Uh, proptosis can be a common feature. And again, histopathologically, you may see underlying fungal invasion, which is a little less uh, readily apparent on this histology slide, and, and certainly granuloma formation, as you see here. And again, treatment for this is endoscopic surgery and long-term uh, antifungals. I'll share with you an interesting case of a patient that I managed many years ago. This was an adolescent man who actually had allergic fungal rhinosinusitis that we managed. Uh, cleared the disease, it was quite extensive, and he was lost to follow-up. And then he returned a few years later in his early 20s and actually had developed right frontal headaches. And you'll see he's got some soft tissue disease involving the right frontal, a little bit of extension of the contralateral side, clear maxillaries, and you'll see on this T1 with contrast, this is just an area of mucosal swelling, but you see kind of this heterogeneous density this is one of these rare uh, uh, cases of a allergic fungal sinusitis transitioning to a chronic granulomatous fungal rhinosinusitis many years after surgery. And really he was not on any treatment for many years. So he underwent an endoscopic modified Lothra, uh, removal of all of the gross disease, and then started on posiconazole uh, based on culture, which demonstrated aspergillus. And you can see this is his endoscopic view. Uh, you can see a very large uh, sphenoid opening. You can see the cella there. And we'll march her, excuse me, we'll uh, march her uh, way up into the uh, ethmoid cavity and showing you the view at the frontal uh, neoosteum. A uh, little bit of contracture, but remember there's a lot of fair bit of scar here from the fungal disease, but overall a very functional result with resolution of symptoms. Now, moving on to the last variant, which is the acute invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. Uh, this is a rapidly progressive process. It's quite dramatic, and the clinical course can really span hours uh, to days. Um, to give you an example, uh, this is, you can see this area of necrosis from vascular thrombosis, and that spread and happened while the patient was on the OR table, or you can see massive facial necrosis in a different patient. This is seen in the setting of really uncontrolled diabetes or uh, immunocompromised due to transplant, bone marrow transplantation, solid organ transplantation, or uh, 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 AIDS, um, or patients on chem chemotherapy, um, caused by a zygomycota, uh, mucor, uh, rhizopus, or ascomycota, uh, such as aspergillus, and the presentation can really be variable. Patients may present with headaches, cranial nerve palsy, visual loss, orbital pain, and, and certainly all of the rhinologic symptoms as well. Uh, examination can really vary. Uh, you may see this dusky mucosa or almost this kind of this yellowish appearance on the nasal septum. Uh, you can see a bloody crust or black escar. You can see a necrotic uh, middle turbinate here or you can see significant uh, proptosis or ophthalmoplegia if there is uh, significant orbital involvement. Uh, here you can see I've removed uh, non-viable lamina papricia on the right side, and you can see uh, devitalized periorbita uh, underneath there. Uh, and it's also important, especially when patients have involvement of the floor of nose, to check for oral cavity involvement because it can spread into the palate and you may see some eschar in the mouth. 
Uh, the pathology in these cases may show tissue infarction, uh, vascular thrombosis, or scant, and, and with scant inflammatory cells. Certainly, uh, injury invasion is a serious uh, 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 issue um, and uh, can result in luminal thrombosis, can result in further spread of the fungus systemically, uh, and in those cases can often be fatal. Uh, frozen section diagnosis is absolutely critical for a rapid diagnosis and intraoperative decision-making. Uh, a study that we published at Rush a few years ago showed that it had a 100% uh, positive predictive value and was really quite instrumental in guiding intraoperative uh, decisions uh, on the extent of surgery. When you look at the CT imaging, often it can be nonspecific. Uh, you may see uh, mucosal thickening, or in cases, you may see some subtle bone erosion. Uh, certainly, MR imaging is a more sensitive indicator of invasive fungal sinusitis. Uh, you may see loss of contrast enhancement, as you see in this area within the right orbit, or you may see extra sinus signal enhancement into the tergomaxillary fossa, infratemporal fossa, or even into the frontal lobes, as you see here from a uh, spread from the a sphenoid region. Um, there's really four key treatment goals uh, when patients present with an acute invasive fungal sinusitis. A correction of the underlying metabolic immunologic, immunologic uh, abnormality, surgical debridement of devitalized tissues, uh, IV amphotericin uh, or antifungal therapy, and then close monitoring for recurrence and persistence while they're still in the hospital and then long-term as well. Uh, this is one time the sun really should not set or rise uh, in these cases. Time is of the essence. These patients need emergent OR intervention with endoscopic resection of devitalized tissues to uh, bleeding margins. I'm showing you a case where complete septum was removed up to the skull base and even the right orbit was removed. Uh, a very difficult case. So uh, on a case like this, uh, uh, close coordination with oculoplastics and neurosurgery may be required. Certainly over my career, I've become much more conservative in regards to orbital exoneration and craniotomy. There's only been a couple of cases uh, where we've, this has been performed and we've been able to save uh, those patients in those advanced cases. Uh, serial debridement and neuroanesthesia as dictated by clinical and radiographic exams. Uh, there's been cases where patients have go, had to go to the OR several times during the hospitalizations to ensure a disease-free status. And then oral and in select cases, topical antifungals as well, although the duration is unclear. And then long-term serial endoscopic surveillance. Uh, the case that I just showed you, uh, here's the patient after removal of the right orbit. You can see the orbital prosthesis, the patient alive many years after management of uncontrolled uh, diabetes. So I'll uh, end with this systematic uh, review uh, and looking at 52 studies with 807 patients. You can see the presentation typically included facial swelling, fever, nasal congestion. These patients were treated with IV antifungals and surgery. And you can see the overall survival, all comers, was about 50%. What was important with the study is they were able to look at this large cohort of patients and show that advanced age and intracranial involvement were independent negative prognostic factors. And intuitively, that seems to make sense. Uh, diabetes and surgical resection were independent positive prognostic factors. And intuitively, that also makes sense because diabetes is something that can be reversed. And certainly, if the disease is less advanced and amenable to some level of surgical resection, these are patients you hope that you'll be able uh, to save. So that is a whirlwind tour uh, in the slides, which will be available for you as a PDF. I've included also this chart, which gives you a nice summary of all of the uh, different variants and kind of gives you the immunologic status, prognosis, and uh, the uh, standard uh, treatment uh, uh, regimen. Uh, I'll conclude with that. I want to thank the organizing committee again for this uh, opportunity uh, and look forward to further discussion and any uh, questions from all of you. Thank you, Pete. That was a terrific talk. Thanks so much. And you actually raised so many questions and they're all listed now in the FNA. And I, I would 
only have time for, I think, one or two questions. So the first one would be the CT finding double density sign in allergic fungal sinusitis. Is that the same as in fungal ball? Yeah, th this is really a, a CT characteristic and it's really a, a matter of how the fungus presents. If there's a dense concretion within the maxillary or sphenoid sinus and there's peripheral mucosal enhancement, you can certainly see it in both diseases. Okay, the other question would be, have you ever experienced patients of chronic invasive fungal sinusitis caused by remnant fungal ball or progression of fungal ball? Yeah, unfortunately, that is a rare event, but I have seen uh, that uh, uh, a fungal ball, uh, longstanding neglected in a patient who developed immunocompromised transition to invasive disease. And this is why patients that are asymptomatic if they opt not to have surgery, there needs to be a frank discussion that there is a very small risk that this disease could one day potentially transition to an invasive variant. Okay, one last question. Both the non-invasive and the invasive fungal sinusitis, do they cause bone erosion? Uh, certainly, I think you can see bone erosion in both of the variants. I uh, certainly see it much more commonly in allergic fungal sinusitis occasionally in sphenoid fungal balls. I think it tends to be much more subtle in uh, acute invasive fungal sinusitis, but I think any of these uh, subtypes can present with bone erosion. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And there are many more questions here, and I think and I would like to ask you to, to move over to the Zoom lobby maybe, and um, because I have to announce the next speaker, I cannot follow right now. So um, yeah, you, I think Pete, you have to click onto that Zoom link and then uh, get out of this one and go into the Zoom lobby. So thank you so much. Let me now please announce the next speaker. It's Dr. Holger Zutov. He's a full professor in the Bielefeld University and he's head and chair of a very large uh, ENT department. He has researched extensively on skull base, ear and eustachian tube and he's published many, many articles. And today he's going to talk about the eustachian tube and the dysfunction. And he also has really lots of experience in this. And we're looking forward to Holger and your talk. And I think you have to unmute yourself. Thanks. My dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to give my presentation on diagnosis and treatment of eustachian tube dysfunction. My colleague and friend, Markus Hess, is going to uh, chair the meeting and uh, my best regards from Bielefeld, also to Mark Pretorius, who is going to speak about sensory neural hearing loss. I'm going to talk about the eustachian tube, its diagnosis and possible treatment options. As you know, I'm from Bielefeld University, a city located within Germany. It's uh, in the middle of Germany uh, with a historic marketplace. The University of Bielefeld is a quite new university, which has about 30,000 students. We just established a new medical faculty uh, last year. So looking at the eustachian tube, there are a lot of challenges and you're pretty much aware about the eustachian tube, it's difficult to diagnose the eustachian tube dysfunction. And uh, we are all aware that there are a lot of challenges. It's difficult to define what's the eustachian tube dysfunction. There are man many underlying pathologies, pathologies that are, have still to be defined. And some cases, we really don't have a deep understanding of that. And there are a lot of tests tests, about 70 tests of forced, non-forced response tests to the eustachian tube. And as you know, there is little data available with a really good level of evidence. So this is the background for my presentation before I start talking about diagnosis of eustachian tube dysfunction. We all know that the eustachian tube uh, in adult patients 
has a length of about 31 to 38 millimeters. So this is a far, pharyngeal and um, a middle ear opening. Majority is cartilaginous, at least in adults. And about one third of the eustachian tube is bony. So all the regulation and the muscles are attached to the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube that you can see here in this pictures drawn by my friend Harald Konopatsky. You see the proximity towards the internal carotid artery and the complex mechanism of opening, which is due to the selected uh, movement of the specific muscles like the tensor or levator veli palatini. So we had the same problem when we met with a couple of friends and colleagues in Amsterdam, and we tried to define the eustachian tube dysfunction. So we had a consensus meeting, and the outcome was published in 2015. And you can see and uh, read the different types, clinical presentations, and diagnosis. So we broke it down actually to three different distinguishable entities. So eustachian tube dysfunction can be either dilatory eustachian tube dysfunction. Think about patients that report on problems while air traveling. So there is a bowel challenge induced eustachian tube, tube dysfunction. And of course, a patulous eustachian tube dysfunction that can be broken down into chronic, intermittent, or masked. Dilatory eustachian tube dysfunction, which is the most prevalent form of eustachian tube dysfunction, can be either functional, dynamic, think about patients with cleft palates, with, which is actually underlying uh, a muscular failure, or a pure anatomical obstruction that is really very rare. So looking into the clinical science, what do patients report in the outpatient setting? They say, well, while they are air traveling, they have problems with uh, ambient pressure, inability to perform, uh, perform a facilitative maneuver or chronic otitis media with a fusion. However, there are more severe um, middle ear problems related to eustachian tube dysfunction, which can be either a middle ear atelectasis, recurrent diseases, think about recurrent cholesteatomas, and fa failed tympanoplasties. I'm going to show you a clinical example later on. So it's very important after taking the patient's uh, history to look and do a high resolution video endoscopy of the back of the nose. So what you can see here is really striking. And I show you here a couple of examples that you find on routine examinations, uh, investigation, investigating patients with eustachian tube dysfunction. You find on the upper left scars, you find cysts, you find patients with a discharge from the eustachian tube or here patients with uh, scar formations. Those scars actually can have an impact on eustachian tube opening as hyperplastic mucosa or inflammation of the underlying tissue can have as well. So this is absolutely necessary. Of course, it's very important to do a microscopic examination of the tympanic membrane you can see here a middle ear fusion on the left or a retraction. It's very important in my, uh, from my clinical point of view to ask the patient to do a Vasalva maneuver to see if that a retraction is fixed or if it's reversible. If it's reversible, a balloon may have a chance to clear this condition. So in an outpatient setting, apart from having taken the patient's history, apart from looking into uh, the patient's ear and do an, uh, an endoscopy of the nasopharynx, we can always do uh, um, a questionnaire. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, McCool, um, developed this um, EDTQ7, which is extremely helpful to stratify the patients into no problem, moderate problems or severe problems which is really easy done. Of course, there is some redundancy in the questions, but it's helpful to, to uh, distill down your diagnosis. On the other hand, we do tumor manometry on routine testing. It's uh, a test where you apply a nose piece and where you actually have a pressure sensor 
that is placed into the external ear canal. And we can actually record the displacement of the tympanic membrane at 30, 40, and 50 milligrams. And we can have a pressure recording being done. Just want to show you on the next slide what we can do. So we get two curves. One curve when you swallow the water, which is the uh, lower curve, the upper curve, is showing you the displacement of the tympanic membrane. And while doing that, we can actually record the opening latency index of the eustachian tube, and we can see if it's regular, delayed, or if there is no opening at all. So with that information, it was helpful for our studies to stratify those patients correctly. So we did the ETS-5, which I'm going to show you later on, uh, for our initial tests that we published on the ringoscope earlier on. And you can see that uh, there is um, a range from zero to 10 points. And you can see the different points attributed to the Vasalver equalizing pressure by swallowing and tubomanometry that I've shown you uh, earlier on at 30, 40, and 50 millibars. So how can we treat that? Once we have treated the patient, uh, uh, we want to treat the patient, what are the options? And of course, there is medical therapy. However, most of the therapies that I've tried was not helpful in our patient setting. So we came up with the idea of a balloon. And you can see the balloon here being placed into the eustachian tube. It's a cartilaginous framework. And so the uh, once we have used the inserting device, the balloon is inflated to 10 bars for two minutes. And then the uh, balloon is withdrawn in a deflated stage. So looking into that, this is the balloon. The dimensions are three to 20 millimeters. At 10 bars, it's going to widen to 3.3 millimeters. And you can see the pressure syringe applied to that, which is filled with silene. And the pressure is held for two minutes at 10 bars. So that was the in initial setup. And I think all the other companies pretty much did the same so far. And I can show you the clinical application in an adult patient. What I generally prefer in adults is a contralateral approach. So let's say you want to do balloon dilation. On the left side, we have the insertion device. We have a Hopkins optics that is angled at 70 degrees. And then the back of the nose is visualized. You can do that in selected cases if there is no severe septal deviation on the ipsilateral side which works as well in uh, adult patients. However, this approach is not really good in uh, pediatric patients. So this is showing you the endoscopic view from the back of the nose. You can see a large cyst here, but you can see the insertion of the balloon. And then uh, it is pretty straightforward because if you do a, um, a velopharyngoscopy, you can actually see the back of the septum and the symmetry of both eustachian tubes. These are the insertion device and I regularly use a 70 degree um, insertion device. This is the operating table set up. You can see the different Hopkins Hopkins. You can see the cotton, uh, uh, which is soaked with silene, uh, with cytometacillin, so it makes sense to use it before. On the other hand, uh, this is a, a clinical picture where you puncture the uh, pharyngeal office of the eustachian tube, you insert the uh, catheter with the microendoscope, and then everything is held into position for two minutes. Here are the summer results that we published in 2015 in clinical otolaryngology. We're very surprised initially so we got a, po a very positive effect on the eustachian tube scores that I explained to you earlier. You can see the increase of the eustachian tube score and the effect that is still persistent in the majority of cases after three years. On, on the other hand, we applied this um, technique um, along with my colleague uh, from the Ulm Armed Forces Hospital, Matthias Tisch, in children, and here you can do the contralateral, ipsilateral, 
or the pharyngeal approach. And this is some very helpful to do vedal traction and a 70 degree Hopkins optic to inspect the back of the nose and to have the symmetry of both openings, especially if you have adenoids that you should remove prior to the balloon dilation. So we investigated uh, children, 126 that we published in the Italian Journal of Otolaryngology. And these were patients uh, with, um, uh, had at least two or three grommets in place. And we got a really good clearance of their clinical signs and symptoms of obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. On the other hand, there have been two randomized controlled trials. I think one run by my colleague and friend, Dennis Poe, who demonstrated the superiority of balloon dilation uh, in comparison to medical management uh, in adults. And another clinical trial, I think there is a third one now, by Ted Meyer showing um, the balloon that, that balloon dilation is superior to continued medical management for persistent eustachian tube dysfunction. So these are results with Puton audiometry. You can see the improvement of the eustachian tube uh, balloon dilation uh, towards the threshold of the air bone gap, and uh, as well showing a regulation and normalization of tubonometry one year after balloon dilation with a positive for sulfur in a patient with dilatory eustachian tube dysfunction. So you always have to investigate other um, uh, clinical entities that ha have an impact or are the underlying reason of eustachian tube dysfunction. So it's very important to look at uh, at chronic rhinosinusitis. You can see the mucus uh, discharging and blocking the office of the eustachian tube. So you have to treat that first. On the other hand, you have this cobbled stone pattern. And if you look at histology, you see the severity of the inflammation and you find those cobbled stones pattern, which are pedognomonic for extraesophageal reflux. So these um, slides kindly supplied it by my friend Dennis Bow. You can see the effect of balloon dilation on the uh, mucosa that has crushed the inflammation. There is a shear of the biofilm. And you can see that there is only little damage applied to the pharyngeal office of the eustachian tube. So this is probably how the mechanism works. You get rid of mucus, you, you shear off the biofilm, you crush the subepithelial uh, uh, connective inflammation, and then you get clearance of that situation later on. So we looked at the force applied to the membranes of the inner ear and the tympanic membrane. So we had a cheap model and you can see uh, a pressure sensor sticked into the uh, opening of the uh, middle ear by the tympanic membrane and here balloon applied. And you can see the increase of the balloon dilation. And here is the um, inflation of the balloon, deflation and the normalization of pressure. So we looked into different uh, scenarios. However, none of the pressures that we actually were able to show could lead to a break of the round window risinous membrane or the tympanic membrane. So other pathologies we see, for example, is localized amyloidosis. You can see that with the congruent staining. On the other hand, if you do a lot of revisions in middle ear surgery, you always wonder how bent a middle ear top prosthesis can be. And this was due to a damage of the uh, eustachian tube. So the previous surgeon who did an anodectomy actually um, led to, uh, that led to a scarring of the eustachian tube opening. You could see the scars on both sides and here in the nasopharynx. And how can we treat that? You can recanalize that. However, it takes some experience and you need to have a stand placed for a longer time into the office of the eustachian tube. And here you can see a patient with a failed radioform flap who had a patient with a squamous cell carcinoma of the soft palate. And you can see the eustachian tubes, the obstruction. We did a dilation of the eustachian tube and put in a stand for three months 
and then the eustachian tube came back to normal. So here is the opening that you can see three months after stenting, but I think we need that time to keep it patent. So what can we do? So far we can talk about the experience we got. Uh, we had a couple of side effects. However, now re just recently we experienced three cases with a temporary hearing loss. Maybe we don't know for whatever reason that happened. We haven't seen any petrius eustachian tubes. We did about 300 revisions and six emphysemas. If you have an emphysema, you can see the air entrapped. So this is when the balloon is actually tilting and you haven't realized that and patient will do a salver after surgery. And you can see this crepitations under the skin and around the soft palate. So normally these complications go away if you put the patient on oral antibiotics. So the success of balloon dilation is actually increasing with the severe, uh, uh, negatively with the uh, severity of clinical signs and symptoms. I think if you have a failed tympanoplastis, probably the outcome is not as satisfactory as the, uh, if you talk to divers or flight attendants, you have really great success with that procedure in those patient cohorts. So these are the outcome. I think now there are worldwide more than 100,000 procedures. The general success rate is about 80%, but we still have a lack of evidence for long-term results and a lack of evidence for prospective randomized controlled trials. So this is to conclude my presentation, very much looking forward to Mark's. Here is part of my team. At Bielefeld, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and co-workers from uh, other places like Dennis, James, and my colleagues who helped me doing the study. So here are some references that I would like to share with you uh, that uh, actually are suggested for further readings. So I'm, I'm done with my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Holger. And as I can see, we have something like nine minutes left and there are a couple of questions that came up. So um, let me ask the first one. ET dysfunction causes pars tensa and or pars flaxida retraction? Question mark. Well, if you look, uh, I think it's possible to cause both pars tensa and pars flaxida retraction. But we know from studies, especially from Italy, that you can cause uh, that there is a selective epidempanic ventilation. So pars flaccida um, uh, retractions may have a different underlying pathogenesis as compared to pars tensor retraction. Okay, thank you. I think your video is not on. If you want to turn it on, then we could see you if possible. Let me then go to the next one. Is it possible to do the balloon dilation under topical anesthesia at the outpatient clinic? Well, it's possible. Uh, I just supervised the PhD thesis from Helsinki University. And this group actually did some really good studies showing that it's possible to do that in local anesthesia. However, it takes much more time. Normally the procedure in an operating room uh, in an outpatient uh, clinic would take about 10 mi minutes uh, in total. But if you do that in local, you need to numb it up very carefully. It's a very difficult, I think uh, in my hands at least, I tried it a couple of times. It's much more time consuming, and but it's working and you can do that under local anesthesia. Okay, next question. Uh, do you do balloon dilation and ventilation tube insertion at the same time? Well, we try to avoid ventilation tubes in children who had like two or three ventilation tubes prior to the balloon procedure. So I would prefer to do a myringotomy first and then do the balloon dilation. I think there is no problem doing that simultaneously in, in the same uh, procedure. Okay. Next question, um, I once observed ET orifice pulsation, probably carotid artery pulsation, although CT did not show carotid canal dehiscence. 
Then I stop balloon insertion on that side. Do you see ET orifice pulsation frequently? And do you proceed balloon insertion? Well, what we see, and we did routine CT testing, and it's very well known from studies by Proctor, for example, in temporal bone anatomy, that there are 9% dehiscences between the internal carotid artery and the eustachian tube. And actually, if you do a tube manometry and you get this pulse synchronous pulsations, you know that there is dehiscence. So you get spe a specific pattern uh, from uh, a dehiscent internal carotid artery. But even so, if there is a dehiscence, it's no contraindication. We measured the force you actually need to open up the, uh, the internal carotid artery. And so even the maximum force times about 20 by the balloon is unable to do damage to the internal carotid artery. So a dehiscence is no contraindication. The only risk is, is there is a severe arteriosclerotic plaque in the internal carotid artery, then I would refrain from doing the procedure. Okay, I think this is an important information. Thank you. Why is meringotomy not routine in BET? Well, what we do is if there is a middle ear fusion, we do a meringotomy in uh, our patients that have a uh, middle ear fusion. It makes sense because uh, you actually have an imp you may have an impact and we've seen three patients in our, um, in our about 5,200 patient cohort that had a hearing loss. So in those patients with middle ear fusion, because fluids are not incompressible, I would do a moringotomy first. Mm -hmm. Is there any role for adding a surfactant to the eustachian tube? Well, we know that the surfactant is very uh, important uh, to keep the um, tension. Um, but I haven't seen any study that you are actually using a specific surfactant substance to um, uh, treat the eustachian tube. And so I don't see this, uh, it of the same importance like in the, uh, the alveolar system of the lungs. So I am actually not aware of that, that surfactant. It may be helpful, but I think we still don't know. Okay. Next question. What is the next best option to balloon tuboplasty for improving ET function? Well, uh, you know, there are these uh, uh, balloons for children uh, from, from Denmark, uh, the Ottovent, for example, that you can use. Uh, prior to a procedure. So I think in children that makes sense. Um, I, I just, um, when I was uh, summing, summarizing um, uh, for the textbook Scott Brown, I looked at the evidence for any medical treatment and I couldn't even decongestive nasal drops or other, um, other um, possible uh, drug, drug treatments don't have um, an impact on your station tube function. So I think um, it's, uh, there is no really high evidence for, uh, for a medical treatment that could affect the eustachian tube. Okay, a couple more questions, if you will. What's your view on ET dilation on NPC post radio treatment patients with middle ear effusion? Will it post increased risk of carotid bleeding? Well, I haven't come across all any case of carotid bleeding. I mean, in the past medical history, I think there has been the private doctor to the Danish king, where they used a metal uh, bougie uh, to uh, recanalize the eustachian tube, and that was uh, a disastrous outcome. But I haven't, uh, and concerning um, post radio therapy, like in nasopharyngeal carcinomas. I think that the Asian countries have many more experience with that. I just overlook about 12 cases uh, in our patient cohort, and it was a chance was about 50 50 to, to have a long term um, effective treatment. And that's what my colleagues from Beijing University reported as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience on treating patients 
suffering from tubal fibrosis after irradiation with balloon dilation? Well, you, the only chance you have is to recanalize that. We use a laser to reopen the uh, your staking tube and you have to place in a stand for about three months. However, it's very tricky and it's a really difficult procedure. And I think you need to have a lot of experience to do surgery in that area. And uh, we tried that and we were successful in only 50% of the cases where we, we canalized that. So it's a long-term fibrosis. And if it's a short, um, if it's like half a centimeter or five millimeters, you may be successful doing that. However, if that distance is longer, I think we need to look for a proper stand uh, to keep that in place, and that is probably much more difficult. Okay, one short answer, answer, please, for a short question. Should CT scan always be done prior to using balloon dilation in ET? Well, uh, I think it's not necessary. We found out in a, in a previous study that we found, uh, only identified three cases where we um, found pathology we didn't expect, but I think you can skip that. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you please now to move over to the Zoom lobby and I will follow you in a second. But first I want to hand over to Professor Pretorius and he will moderate the next session. Thanks for being here and yeah, let's move on to the Zoom lobby. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. So, hello, my name is Dana Hutchison and I'm a fourth year medical student at University of California, Irvine. And I'll be helping to moderate the next three hour module, module along with my colleagues, Elaine Martin and Kelly Hernandez. We have a great session prepared, which will be led by super moderator, Dr. Sinil Verma from UC Irvine. And I also have the honor of introducing our um, moderator for the first speaker and the visionary of this 48 hour otolaryngology webinar event, Dr. Brian Wong from UC Irvine. So Dr. Wong, would you please introduce our first speaker? I will. Welcome Sunil Verma. Um, welcome to everybody. We'll have a formal welcome at maybe eight o'clock a little bit. Um, I hope everybody is uh, awake. This is uh, the, the last final uh, 100 meter. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Roxana Kobo. She is a global leader in the field of facial plastic surgery, uh, specifically rhinoplasty. Uh, Dr. Kobo ha has uh, been a leader in many elements of this, first of all, in open structure techniques. Secondly, uh, in particular, in dealing with specific uh, issues related to a thick skin soft tissue envelope. She's gonna be giving a talk on uh, with, with that as one of the focuses today. Uh, Dr. Kobo uh, is basically at every single international uh, uh, present uh, uh, meeting that you could possibly imagine because she's invited to them all. Uh, she's made seminal contributions across the field. Uh, within Columbia, uh, she has been president of uh, her otolaryngology society, uh, as well as uh, the first woman president of the Columbian uh, Society of Facial Plastic Surgery. She's been uh, president of the, the mother organization of all facial plastic surgery uh, organizations, the International Federation of Facial Plastic Surgery uh, uh, Society as well. She's been vice president of the international board uh, that certifies facial plastic surgeons uh, globally. Um, so we wanna thank Dr. Kobo for taking time out of her busy schedule um, and uh, let's get to it. Good morning, evening, and afternoon. I want to thank professors Brian Wong and Zhang Zhujan for the invitation to be part of this 48 hour update in otolaryngology. I live in Cali, Colombia, and today I'm gonna to be speaking about the approach to a thick skin rhinoplasty patient. These are my disclosures, my book. When we look at the shape of the nose, we need to remember that the nose has two main components, an underlying bony, and cartilaginous framework, which is the skeleton, and a huge covering, which is the skin soft tissue envelope. Most of what we do in rhinoplasty has to do with the bony osteocardial and cartilaginous skeleton. But we need to remember that the skin soft tissue envelope plays a significant role on how these final results are gonna look. 
So we need to remember several things. The skin is thick in the radix and in the super tip area, and it's thin in the rhinium and moderately thin at the nasal tip area. Now, what is the problem? We are frequently encountered with patients like this. Today, the world is global. It is full of mixed races. And the tendency when we have such huge mixture of races is that the skin tends to be thicker, oilier, and more with more sebum production. So what we're, we have been doing for the past five or six years in our office is an integrated management of the thick skin rhinoplasty patients. What does this mean? This, this means a medical management and a surgical management. And why is your skin thick? One is race, as I told you, there are races or areas in the world where the skin is thicker. Age plays a role. Sex, men tend to have more uh, thicker skin than women. Acne, and acne is more frequent in younger patients, and those are the big population of patients seeking rhinoplasty. So we need to remember that we need to evaluate the characteristics of our skin soft tissue envelope. All of this was published in an issue that we did all uh, centered in managing the thick skin and facial plastic surgery in 2018 in the Facial Plastic Surgery Journal. I encourage you to look at this. But basically in the article we published there, we presented this worksheet, which is the worksheet that we use in every single patient uh, that comes into our office seeking a rhinoplasty. What do we evaluate in them? Skin elasticity, where we do a pinch test basically at the rhinion and at the nasal tip to define how elastic our skin is. We want to know how oily it is. We want to define any skin alterations and skin force. And with this, we classify our patients into three types of patients. Type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 is the patient that has a moderately thick skin but has good skin elasticity. The pores are manageable, does not really have any acne. Type two patient, this is patient whose skin elasticity in this area in the super tip area is less. It's the skin, we feel the skin thicker. Uh, there's a more tendency to have acne. So these are patients that are more acne prone and their pores a little bit uh, more open. And then the type three patient is almost like the very ultra thick skin patient where there's no skin elasticity. The pores are really big as we can see in these pictures. They tend to have changes in the skin thing, there's more rosacea, there's more acne. And these are patients that we know that no matter what we do, changes are gonna be less visible over the skin, uh, through the skin. So we have started skin treatment in all of the patients. And how do we organize the skin treatment? How do we tailor it? We basically tailor it in the different areas of the skin. So we want to cleanse and exfoliate, and this basically targets the epidermis. And then how do we treat the dermis? Basically doing oil control and sebum control. And so basically what we know today is that skin programs are a must in all of our rhinoplasty patients. The objectives are to reestablish normal skin conditions. And this in, in turn will diminish the skin's inflammatory response. This ideally is started before surgery if we can do it. And it is continued at least six months after surgery. And all patients receive a complete facial one to two days before surgery. What products do we use? Cleansing agents, scrubs, and topical antioxidants, retinoids, sunblocks. Change in diet is really important because this promotes acne formation. So we tell patients that they should stick to a healthy diet. Avoid everything that has to do with trashy food, with carbohydrates, high sugar diets. And then what we have found is that in the last year, oral isotretinoin has been advocated for the use in thick skin rhinoplasty patients. And that has been a real game changer in our practice. We were the first group to publish this. We published this in 2016, where we showed that we could use isotretinoin safely in our rhinoplasty patients, and we would get much better results when we were dealing with the thick skin. And then we came out two years later, with the integrated management of the thick skin. And that has given, given us even better results because if you complement isotretinoin with skin management, the results in thick skin, uh, skin patients are even better. So basically, what are the indications for oral isotretinoin? We use it in type two and type three thick skin patients and patients with moderate to severe acne, cystic acne patients, sebaceous hyperplasia. Now we need to monitor patients. 
uh, when necessary. And if we're in countries where we cannot formulate isotretinoin, then it should be managed conjointly with a dermatologist. But what does isotretinoin do? It shrinks the oil glands, it reduces acne bacteria, it reduces inflammation, it helps prevent clogs. But the beauty of this is that it really uh, thins out the fibroadipose layer in a uniform fashion. So what happens in the first weeks after surgery? The skin looks oil and shiny. It is normal to see edema and swelling. And what we know today is that up to 30% of our patients, especially young adults and adolescents, will have acne flare-ups. And that basically happens because there's more stress, uh, they have irregular facial cleansing routines, they, some surgeons use tapes for a long time, and that promotes uh, acne presentation. So what, how do we use isotretinoin? We're using low doses. Why? Because we know that these low-dose schemes are just as, as effective as normal dosage. We monitor uh, patients. They need to have normal hepatic function tests, no pregnancy. What we know is that these low-dose schemes give us better tolerance, less side effects. So we're using 10 to 20 milligrams two to three times a week. In severe cases, we use it daily. We stop one to two week, weeks before surgery if we were able to start them before surgery. And then we restart two weeks after surgery when the tapes come off. Now, with the duration of treatment is four to six months. You can start isotretinoin whenever you need it, whenever you see acne. Surgery can be performed safely. There, is, there are no scarring issues. And it is much better, the results are much, much better if you complement this with a complete skincare program. Once you have done this, let's take a look at the surgical option. What do we know? The, uh, there's a limit in thick skin noses. Why? Because the skin soft tissue envelope is, the flap is thicker, the, it has more fat, the dermis is thicker, it's less elastic, the skin flap is heavier, and the underlying structures of the nose can be very hard to see, but also in many less ethnic patients, we, found, we find that there's poor skeletal support. So what do we want to do? We want to build up the underlying skeletal framework. We want to have more defined looking noses, but the big problem is that many of our patients do not want big noses. So it really becomes important to structure the nose without increasing the size dramatically. So we have two scenarios. They both share common things. They both have a thick skin. They both have diminished skin elasticity. They both have weak skeletal frameworks, but one is a smaller nose and the other one is a big nose. So what are we gonna be doing? This one, we wanna increase and push out. And this one, we wanna diminish, but we need to structure. So basically, what is it that we do? During surgery, we want to avoid bleeding. So it's proper head positioning. It has to be a little bit more elevated, proper nasal infiltration. We routinely use tranexanic acid. We've been using this for many years now. There has to be controlled hypertension. We need proper surgical uh, dissection. I don't need to overemphasize this. We usually do not use cautery and we need to, at the end of surgery, avoid that space formation. So what are the objectives of surgical treatment? Basically, if we're gonna increase the nose, we're gonna make it bigger, we want to structure the underlying, I mean, if we're gonna diminish it, we wanna structure the underlying skeletal framework. We need to remember that the skin is thick. So anything underneath, underneath needs to be structured. If we're gonna, if we were gonna increase the nose, we need to push everything out. And, it, and at the end, that covering, if it's overly thick, we need to debulk it. And if not, at least we need to eliminate the dead space. So we're doing three, we need to have three key points in surgery. So basically the structural support of the nasal skeleton is one of the most important parts of the surgery. So basically when we structure the l strut, we need to remember in primary patients that we're harvesting cartilage from the septum. And many ethnic patients, that cartilage from the septum is very poor and it's very thin and it's very flimsy. So we need to leave at least 15 millimeters dorsally and caudally to be able to have enough support of this l strut, And then we're gonna be building on top of this. So what happens with the thick nose with thick skin? We're gonna lower the dorsum, but we need to structure it. So we're gonna be structuring the middle third of the nose. So we're basically gonna be using spreader grafts, spreader flaps, and then spanning sutures. And all of this 
aimed at structuring this area so that when we lower this a little bit, our structure will not buckle with the thick covering it's going to have on top. So this is basically what it looks like here. We're placing spreader graphs and we're basically uh, we're increasing the support of the middle third of the nose and we're strengthening the superior portion of this L spread. Now, what happens with the pedestal? The pedestal is basically the area at the caudal edge of the septum. And it is not uncommon to find retrusive caudal septums in patients of ethnic origin, especially Latino patients. You can also see this in Asian patients, but we have published extensively on this. So basically it means that we need to structure this pedestal because if not, anything that we do in that nasal tip will not be able to support the weight of that skin over time. So how do we do this today? Basically by using an overlapping septal extension graft. And th this OSEG is basically gonna reinforce all of this area and it's gonna, it's gonna create a stable base to use grafts in this nasal tip. And it's gonna help me define and control what? Projection, rotation, support, and final shape of the nasal tip. Now that OSEG or overlapping septal extension graph can come in many shapes. It can be rectangular, it can be triangular, it can be wider at the bottom, wider at the top, it can be smaller and it doesn't have to go all the way down to the nasal spine. But what is our final objective? Our final objective is to structure that pedestal. That is gonna be the real structure for everything that we're gonna be placing on top to define and structure and project and rotate that, night, that nasal tip. So basically the position and the shape of this graft is gonna define the position of the nasal tip and is gonna help us define what, that, what nasal labial angle we're gonna have. So we can do many things with the OSEG. We can increase rotation, we can do counter rotation, we can change pro projection. And as you can see here, this is overlapping the existing cartilage of the cartilage. And here we're defining how high or how low that OSEG is gonna be. So this is what a graph can look like. This is a template and I learned this from Brian Wong a few years ago. And this is how our graph is gonna look. So it's very similar to our template. And this is what it looks at the end. And we're basically suturing the feet of the medial cura to this new graph, which is our new caudal septum. And this is what it can look like in a side view. And what we do since it's overlapping, I usually use a small bolster graph on the other side to help keep the graph in the midline and to give it a little bit of additional support because our graphs, our septums and our ethnic patients tend to be more flimsy. And so this is an example of this. This is a patient, a very thick skin patient where we did exactly that. And we additionally resected the SMAS and we had him an oral isotretinoin for six months. And this is his pre and his post-op result. And you can see how his skin looks better, the support is better, and the final result is a lot better with a lot better definition of his nasal tip. What happens with the flat nose? What happens with the small, flattering, tiny nose? We want to augment the dorsum. We want to support the tip, but we also want to augment the dorsum. So here we have patients like this. In our country, we, we get a lot of African descent patients. And basically what we do in my favorite technique, and there are many described in the literature, I use finely diced cartilage with uh, fibrin glue and of the fibrin glues I use back uh, to seal. I don't have any uh, negotiations with anyone, but I feel this is the one that works the best. And I basically, I use a template and that template can be either done with a 3cc syringe. And for the last few months, I've been using the uh, Jiang cartilage mold, which was developed by Zhang, uh, Professor Zhang Zhujiang. And this is basically what this graph can look like at the end. We cover the dorsal portion of the graft with fascia or with perichondrium so that this graft will not be visible over time, especially at the Rhinian area. And this is a pre and a late post-op result in this patient. And you can see how powerful this graft can be, especially when we're trying to push out structures. So now let's take a look at the nasal tip. We want to perform changes in the nasal tip using a structural and preservation approach. What has changed for me over the years? 
I always uh, stabilize the pedestal first. And that means an OSEC, an overlapping septal extension graft. I do minimal, if any, resection of alar cartilages. I use grafts for structural process, uh, purposes and I use it in a rational fashion. What do I wanna do? I wanna reinforce and augment the support structures of the nose. And I define nasal tip structures and I do this with sutures and that's out of the scope of this talk, grafts and when needed, camouflaging techniques. So let's take a look at what grafts I use to structure and define the nasal tip. Basically, if I'm dealing with the alar cartilages, the area we deal with the most, where we use grafts the most, is basically the lateral cruise of the alar cartilage. And there are two types of grafts we can use here. Alar strut grafts, which go underneath the cartilage, or alar batten grafts, which go on top. This, these two grafts, do ba they basically give support, they give camouflage, and they help us with uh, structuring that nasal tip. Now, the lateral sidewall is really important, especially if we're thinking not only in form, but also in function. So there are many graphs we can use here. We can use alar contour graphs, articulated alar rim graphs, or lateral curl repositioning. You can see that these graphs are different. Some are bigger than the other, but they all help us do one important thing. It gives us additional support to that lateral nasal sidewall, and it will also give us support to all of our nasal tip, uh, structures, and it will help us define that nasal tip. And then in the infratip lobule, then we have uh, graphs like the shield graph, which is a very old graph that is still something that I use a lot because it's very valuable, and it gives us additional refinement and definition of this area. Now, once we have structured all of our nasal tip, we need to take a look at the skin. So basically here, we need to manage uh, the dermis, the, the thickness of that uh, skin soft tissue envelope. And this means smooth developing. I only use this for type two and type three skin, and there are two ways I use this. I basically use a subdermal approach and a subperichondrial approach. And there are several recommendations we need to keep in mind when we're doing this technique. We need to avoid using cartery. We need to avoid resecting that smudge into the alar groove because this can compromise vascularity of the flap. And we need to avoid dissecting very high up into the dermal layer because this could end up in skin necrosis. When we're debulking the smas, we always need to think that if we're too aggressive, we can necrose our skin flap. So this is a subdermal flap. And here I'm gonna show you, I'm making an open approach. I'm elevating my skin in an epidermis dermis plane. And so I'm leaving all of my smas and all of my ligament structures attached to the low, uh, alar cartilages. And now I'm elevating that smas with the ligaments and block. And here I'm trying to do a subperichondral dissection and I'm elevating this in a complete uh, in block fashion. And I'm basically here, I define how much I want to dissect. And you can see how thick this graft is. So basically this, this osmos I can later use as a graft either in the radix or I can use it in front of the nasal spine to give us added support there. And then if I have elevated my flap subperichondrially, I can detach my smas from my skin soft tissue envelope. And here you can almost dissect it with a caudal elevator, or you can cut it out with scissors. I never use cautery. And here you can see the dermis and you can basically finger dissect this. And you want to extend And here. You can see how I'm not extending my dissection laterally. And then I'm beveling my cut because that transition into the middle third of the nose needs to be beveled. And this is what this flap, this graph can look like after the resection. And so once I have done this, I want to eliminate the dead space in the supertip area. And this is especially indicated in thick skin patients. So what we're doing is that bringing, we're bringing this skin flap down over the nasal skeleton and we're helping to create a nice supertip break. Internally, this can be done with sutures. If we do not want to use sutures, we can do it externally, basically applying taping the skin. What does this do? This helps us avoid accumulation of blood, it reduces swelling, and it uh, diminishes the formation of fibrous tissue. 
So this is here, we're marking the super tip break. This is the skin elevated and we're passing a suture right where we marked and we're passing the second pass of the suture. So this is a loop suture right at the anterior septal angle. And here, this is what it can look like. So we resected the SMOS, then we did, we're eliminating the death space and this is the final picture of this same patient after we closed that death space. Now let's take a look quickly at the post-surgical management. So here we need to, uh, immediately after surgery, it's ice packs and head elevation, especially the first 74, uh, 72 hours. We want to avoid swelling, we want to avoid convulsion. Cast and tapes week one, additional tapes week two, and then we need to do proper cleansing. We need to start our patients on our skin regime, sunblock. This is important. We avoid sun exposure and strenuous exercises for a few months after surgery and proper diet is key to be able to control swelling. Now, this is very important. No support, no evidence supports delaying skin surgery, dermabrasion or peel. So we can safely do surgery if we need to start our patients in oral isotretinoin. And we usually start them two weeks after surgery and we extend our oral isotretinoin from four to six months. So Kenalog injections have been used for many, many years and uh, one can start them as early as one week or two weeks post-surgery. Post I repeat them every four to six weeks with a maximum of four to six injections. What are the complications? Atrophy, hypopigmentation, telangiectasia, ulcerations. My experience is that with oral isotretinoin today, I hardly ever inject tri, uh, Kenalog in my patients because I have found that I don't really need it. So let's take a look at some cases. This is a patient with very thick skin. She was not an oral isotretinoin. We basically did a septal extension graft with the structuring of the middle third of the nose. And you can see how nicely this stands out even after a long-term result. A second patient, she was in low dose isotretinoin and her we did a SMOS resection, but look at the quality of her skin in her long-term post-surgical result. And she has all of the structure and she's got the spreader grafts, the articulated ailer rim grafts, uh, she's got the SMOS resection. And you can see how we were able to improve the nasal tip contour, we were able to improve the quality of the skin. Another patient, low dose oral isotretinoin, additional grafting in the nasal tip, and the same thing. Here you can see how we were able to get better consistent re results and look at the quality of her skin. And then our last patient and the same thing, smooth resection, structuring techniques, low dose oral isotretinoin, and OZEG. And you can see how nicely those tips, how we can gain tip definition in spite of the thickness of her skin if we do an integrated management. So what have we found? Oral isotretinoin can definitely help us reduce inflammation. It will diminish thick subdermal space. These changes are usually permanent. Thinning occurs in a symmetrical manner. So we need to remember nose is part of the patient's face. We need to do integrated skin management. Uh, surgery has to be aimed at building up and strengthening all of the support and underlying structures of the nose. And if you need to thin out the skin soft tissue envelope, you can do it safely. And basically what you need to remember is that it has to be an integrated management. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobo, that was great. Um, I think we have at least one question here in the Q&A. Um, may I ask, is there any contraindication for reducing or trimming the SMAS while dealing with those with thick skin? Uh, good morning for everybody here this morning. Um, no, uh, I was looking at the question. Uh, the SMAS, SMAS resection is basically something I leave only for the ultra thick skin patients. And the reason for that is basically because with the aging process, our SMAS tends to thin out over time. So basically what I do is that if I'm gonna have my patients with uh, an oral isotretinoin and, and I'm, able to be, uh, I'm able to start them on the isotretinoin before surgery, what I have found is that the SMAS, because it has uh, the oral isotretinoin, we need to remember has an impact in the dermis. 
and the SMAS is right under the dermis. So once we open the flap, if I see that that SMAS is really not ultra thick, I leave it. I leave it because if I'm able to push out all of the structures I need to push out, many times I just leave it. Now, I've never had problems thinning out the SMAS. What are the rules of the game? Because I think there are some rules of the game. The first rule is that you do not want to go out too laterally. If you get into the ailer groove, you're gonna be, uh, you have the risk of uh, uh, hitting all of the vascular, uh, uh, all of the vessels that are the ones that are gonna be feeding your uh, skin flap. So you don't really wanna go way, way down to the lateral uh, nasal sidewalls. And then the other thing is that when you do your dissection, you do not want to dissect into the dermis. Now, I frequently see people dissecting the SMAS with cautery. Now, uh, that is, you know, that is a big no. I mean, you want to dissect this bluntly or with scissors, and you definitely want to be careful of not getting into the dermis because there you can run into problems. And I have seen skin necrosis from other colleagues, basically because they got into the wrong plane. And that is a big headache for any rhinoplasty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Couple other questions here, and we can go till 7.35. Um, how soon before surgery do you start isotretinoin? Well, in acne patients or in patients that I see that are, have ultra thick skins, I start them as soon as I see them in my office. I mean, I don't think there's a time because many times, and that's a, freak, I, a question I get asked frequently. Patients get to my office and they tell me, I want my surgery next week or in two weeks. You know, I. As soon as tapes are off, I start them on isotretinoin. If, if the patient tells me, oh, you know, uh, it comes, they come to my office now and they want to have my, uh, surgery in July, I start them on isotretinoin and I start them on a skin regime. And it, you, you would be surprised at how nice the skin looks before surgery. What is the benefit of that? Swelling will be less. Inflammation will be less. And the game changer here with thick skin patients is that you do not want to have swelling and you do not want to have post-surgical inflammation. So those are the two key things you want to keep in mind when you're operating on these patients. So if you can do pre-surgical treatment, it's even better. For me, it's not a reason to postpone treatment, but if I have the time, I definitely start them and treat them in before. Thank you. Um, still a couple more questions here. Um, this may be a little bit out of um, the scope of it of this lecture, but when do you use ALAR strut graft and when do you use ALAR batten graft? Okay, uh, I'm going to be talking about that next week uh, in a lecture I have for the uh, Middle Eastern Conference. Uh, they're, for me, they're different. I mean, I use an ALAR strut graft. Uh, for me, an ALAR strut graft goes under the lateral cruise of the ALAR cartilage the ailer batten goes on top. For me, in my hands, I use ailer strut grafts more when I need more support. And I use ailer battens, even though if you look at literature, you're gonna find that people say that they use ailer battens also for support. I feel I use them more to fill in concavities. Uh, they both have an impact. They can have an impact in, in uh, basically in the, um, Lateral sidewalls, it can improve uh, more the struts than the batten grafts. They can improve the function of the external nasal valve. So it really depends what you want to use them for. But I use both of them. I use more the strut than the, than the batten graft in my practice. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then could you repeat the dose for oral isotretinoin? There's not a magical cookbook dose. You know, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, the, the normal dose uh, is 20 milligrams every day of the week, at least four to six months. That's a standard dose. Uh, that gives a little bit more side effects on patients. What am I using personally? I use 20 milligrams two to three times a week. What is the beauty of this? because I think there's a nice part to this. One, that the younger patients are more willing to take it. Why? Because they can drink. 
when you tell them that alcohol is a big no, they're like, no, 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 wait a minute. I want, I don't want to stop partying. So you tell them, well, you know, take your isotretinoin on Mondays and Thursdays. Don't get drunk every single weekend. And you can have, you know, a beer or two. It doesn't matter, you know. So, so for the younger people, having, for example, taking two or three tablets a week is much better than taking it every day because they feel less restricted. So that's basically the dose I usually use. I use 20 milligrams two to three times a week in older patients, uh, 50s, that women usually, when women start in their 50s, uh, they're starting their menopause, um, it is frequent to see acne flare-ups. And it's very bothersome because patients who had never had acne suddenly are starting to have acne. So you start them on very low doses and it works beautifully. And many of them come for rhinoplasties at that age and it works very nicely to thin out. So it's sometimes you can even use 10 milligrams, but in my standard dosing is 20 milligrams two to three times a week. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we have one more question. Not sure if we can get to it in a minute, but um, we'll try. When to use shield graft and when to use spreader graft to improve the internal nasal valve. Okay, completely different. Shield grafts are not used to improve uh, internal nasal valve. They're placed in the infra tip. They're used for extra definition. So they're different. They give us extra projection, extra definition of the nasal tip. Spreader grafts, if you use them more towards the caudal edge of the septum, those are the ones that improve, uh, that can help impact internal nasal valve. If you place your spreader grafts up, not towards the caudal edge of the septum, they won't really have an impact in the internal nasal valve. So you need to know how to place them. So I think that's under a minute. Perfect, thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Fuller. A quick question, if we have 10 seconds, um, what changes with revision rhinoplasty in terms of skin management? Okay, uh, in revision rhinoplasty, I don't, I try not to resect SMAS the skin soft tissue envelope becomes very important. I do stretching skin exercises because many times it's a problem of elasticity that I learned from Rick Davis. And that's basically you tell patients to pull on their nose hard to try and stretch it out and downwards. And then uh, in those patients, isotretinoin works very, very nicely because it thins everything out in a uniform manner and you're not gonna have the risk of, vascu of, of, for example, of uh, the risk of uh, having necrosis of your flap because you're thinning it out too much. So for me, isotretinoin and revision patients work very, very nicely. And then the stretching exercises to increase vascularity and basically pulling up the skin, you know, to be able to, to have a little bit more of skin elasticity. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kobo. That concludes the Q&A portion for this lecture. Uh, Dr. Kobo, if you're available to answer more questions, please go to the Zoom link that I placed in the chat. And attendees, please click on the link to ask Dr. Kobo additional questions. And Dr. Pretorius uh, will now be joining us. He'll be moderating the rest of the session. He comes from Hamburg, Germany. And uh, Dr. Pretorius, I don't know if you want to introduce the next, um, the next talk. Thank you, uh, Dana. Um... The next talk will be given by um, Professor Dietz, who is the director of the ENT department at the University Hospital of Leipzig. And he is internationally renowned an expert in the field of head and neck cancer. Uh, he is uh, the immediate past president of the German ENT Society and active in numerous committees across Germany, Europe and India, as well as an affiliate member of board of directors in the Global Online Fellowship Initiative Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center, New York. Also today, unfortunately, he is attending an emergency at the hospital. So he will um, be happy to answer questions that will be sent to his email address. So if you have questions during the, uh, the talk, please note them, write them down and send in an email. We will uh, post the address later. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be invited to the 48 Hours Otolaryngology Update Conference 2021. I think it's a very enthusiastic project and my pleasure is to present about the topic pre-therapeutic induction with checkpoint inhibitors, a game changer. This is definitely the question. Please see my disclosures. If you are thinking about head and neck oncology treatment, uh, you be aware probably about the problems we facing more and more since we are uh, being more and more successful in our treatment results that late outcome may be a challenge. So if you look on the, on the left side, surgery, um, if it's only uh, focusing on the primary tumor, uh, you can compare, um, let's say, the power of therapy with a cat. If you combine it with the neck dissection, uh, the animal force is increasing until the line uh, in the field of primary chemo radiation with cisplatine. If you look for late toxicity outcome, you see horrible differences and as we know, if you combine surgery with chemo radiation or you perform high dose primary chemo radiation, uh, a lot of patients are really suffering from late outcome functional problems if they survive. For example, looking for the treatment of advanced laryngeal cancer, you know, uh, to compare laryngectomy with, with alternative treatments, the option of chemo radiation is called organ preservation. We know that in T3 lesions, if you can go for organ preservation surgery, this is fine. And if you think laryngectomy is the best option and you go for primary chemo radiation, um, as described by the team of Michael van der Breckel, outcome is very similar. If you go in T4, advanced laryngeal cancer for laryngectomy on the one side, or alternatively for primary chemo radiation. There are huge differences in outcome and primary chemo radiation definitely is worse. What we would like to have is if you compare late toxicity with a very good functional outcome, here defined as laryngoesophageal dysfunction free survival after five years, on the one side, we have these very horrible situations after primary chemo radiation, like you see very advanced laryngeal edema, and from a functional point of view, definitely this larynx is not usable and you can go for laryngectomy uh, in the same way. What we would like to have is this. What you see here is uh, a very nice shaped larynx without edema, and without tumor, and we learned that as more dose you give to the larynx, as more probability is to end up with this severe edema situation. This situation after organ preservation, we all hate that. You see edema, you see uh, a highly asymmetric larynx, and there is a high probability of uh, residual or recurrent disease so nobody is really happy with a result like that. What we learned is if you go for primary chemo radiation, compare that with induction chemo, and that is the key uh, of my presentation. Induction chemo is definitely superior in the field of organ preservation. If you just look to the data of the 9111 RTOG trial, Lisa Litricha published in contrast to the statement of Arlene Forestry, she is uh, the founder of that trial, that we see in the chemo radiation simultaneous group, much more death and less um, uh, successful organ preservation cases. If you, if you see induction chemo and radiotherapy uh, and you compare these both, the degree of total laryngectomy is less, and the degree of death people is less. The greens are the ones who are alive after 10 years. 
So after primary tumor radiation, the big problem is that you end up, if there is residual disease or recurrent disease with salvage surgery, and nobody likes salvage surgery because you are facing big problems, the wound healing and so on. We know from René Lehmanns and his group that um, only two thirds uh, of patients or in another way taught uh, two thirds of patients have big problems uh, after organ preservation chemo radiation and before they were suitable for laryngectomy and after this they were not suitable for laryngectomy due to different reasons. Distance metastasis, poor general condition, um, refusal of surgery or unresectability because of tumor progress. So the idea of one fits all for organ preservation is not the best you can do. And therefore we, we performed in Germany and that is a big point for German otolaryngologists. Uh, if we go for organ preservation, we would love to see quite early whether this is a good responder or not. And induction, induction chemo in that time really gives you a good idea. And what was new in that trial was the early response evaluation. So here you see the tumor and after one cycle chemotherapy, this was given by uh, Taxan, Platin, 5FU. If you see more than 30% surface shrinkage of the tumor in endoscopy, you, you can be sure that this is a good responder. And the idea of the trial was really to select patients quite early before you have these problems after chemo radiation regarding salvage um, wound healing problems. This is the trial. You see, we compared uh, the one group which was standard with TPF and TP induction chemo uh, with the additional use of cetuximab. Unfortunately, cetuximab failed, but what we learned in the trial is that this early response evaluation after one cycle really works. We had some outcome problems with 5FU, some toxic death, so we skipped 5FU and went on with uh, TP, which showed the same results in early outcome uh, response. So after one cycle, we did this endoscopic evaluation, and you see that 30% of each arm went for laryngectomy, and 70% went for another two cycles induction and then radiotherapy. Here you see the outcome. Uh, you see the both lines showed TPF or TP with Erbitux and the blue one was without Erbitux. And let's say after six months, we saw a big difference, but this difference melted away in at least after two years, we had this nearly 75% outcome situation. So the point is that if we look for this survival, um, these are huge tumors. It's, it's very difficult to compare with the RTOG 9111 because there were a lot of smaller lesions. Anyway, we saw that in spite of the fact that we had more than 70 or nearly 70% stage fear carcinoma, uh, that the outcome was quite nice and the degree of salvage surgery was low. So the question was for us how we can better select and one very remarkable observation was that FDG-PET CD scanning can give you a kind of prediction um, about the clinical outcome after one cycle induction chemo. So we are convinced that the idea of short induction, only one cycle for response evaluation, really can uh, make a big point in decision making. And what we saw, just to, to show you this picture, if you have a very bright situation of the tumor before the first cycle of chemo, and you give that after one cycle 
uh, you can see in case of good response, this very dramatic difference in shining, in brightness. And if you have that SUB difference in PET-CT that can definitely give you uh, a good feeling about this is a good responder. What we did was to select some criteria beside FDG, beside early response evaluation by endoscopic view. And we mixed that up in four points, which could be checked in these cases or patients after first cycle of chemo. The one is whether there are not more than two positive nodes at the beginning of therapy. So it shouldn't be too much tumor in the neck. The next is that the residual tumor volume is uh, more than 20%. And here in milliliters, the degree of the tumor is not too big. And the fourth point was SUV max. It's a, it's a uh, relation of residual SUV max should be in that field. And that was a kind of cutoff. At least we calculated the hazard ratios and looked whether the cutoffs of the different hazard ratio points would be in some more than 60.4 a five or less than 60.5. So what we found was that if we have less than 16 in the LFS score, so with these four points, we really had very good outcome parameters. And if it was more than 16 points, outcome was worse. To make it very simple, if we see this scoring less than 16. We can select very nicely for our preservation. And uh, we think that in these cases, to stay conservative brings you to a very nice outcome. If the score is more than 16, it's better to go for laryngectomy because you end up with much more problems than in the other group. So this was the first step to think about how we could improve our results. But there is now a very challenging situation because we have the checkpoint inhibitors, we have immuno-oncology in the field of oncology. And this very nice uh, picture shows you how quick substances like nivolumab or bamprolizumab really came up like starfighters. Uh, in a very high degree of use worldwide, also a high degree of money for the companies. But it shows you there's a high, highly uh, effectiveness uh, of these substances and a lot of trials going on and it's really a game changer. The question is about head and neck. What can checkpoint inhibitors do in head and neck? And unfortunately today, what we observe is that about 75% of our patients, uh, if you treat them with checkpoint inhibition, anti pd one or anti pd one uh, there happens nothing. The C is silent. But in 25% of our patients, you definitely have this very traumatic effect and if they respond, they respond very strong and the duration of uh, response is unbelievably stable. Um, therefore, we really learn in first, second line treatment, um, there are some of these drugs licensed already in Germany and all over the world, uh, that we have a duration of response which really changes the view on first, second line treatment uh, towards a curative treatment. So the idea is what can checkpoint inhibition uh, do in the field of induction uh, therapy? And if you uh, see the first data we know with bempolizumab uh, from, uh, it was presented uh, by 
Populari at ESCO 2017. Uh, it was amazing to see uh, if you come very, very far in front with these new drugs, you see traumatic effects. So this was one of the first trials which was presented. And you see they, they had a pretreatment biopsy before surgery. Then they gave neoadjuvant bempolizumab one dose. They waited for another three weeks and then they went for surgery. And what they presented was this result, what they saw du during surgery after one cycle pempolizumab. And the data were amazing just to collect 30, 42% of patients uh, had any treatment effect in the primary tumor or in the neck. And 25% of the patients had major treatment effects. That means that in these cases, the neck was clear or the primary tumor melted completely away after one dose. So this was uh, interesting to see. And I just would like to present in courtesy of Rainer Fiedkau from Erlang, he's a radiation oncologist. And he started with a very interesting trial, which is called CheckGrad. And this trial uh, is running, and there's one patient out of this trial, which is very interesting. He had a, a big tumor, T3, supraclotic larynx carcinoma, uh, T3 and one, and a lesion in the upper lung, which was not clear. And he had the typical um, risk factors, and they started to put him in the trial. The trial is working like you see here. Um, they give induction with cisplatin and docetaxel and combine it with tremilimumab and durvalumab. Durvalumab is a PDL1 inhibitor, and tremilimumab is a CTLA4 inhibitor. So it's the full combination of checkpoint inhibition we know from melanoma. And they had this uh, induction, one cycle. Um, and after that, they checked the CD8 density. And if there was an increase, they went on this, this duvalumab tremelimumab combination. And if not, uh, they just gave the standard chemo radiation outside of the trial. And uh, what they saw is very interesting. Just one patient, like already explained, with the supraclotic larynx carcinoma, you see the lesion in the supraclotis starting, like you see here. And another slice which shows you a very huge disease. And they decided to go for laryngectomy because the tumor was quite big. And after this one cycle, they didn't see too much from the clinical situation. So they went for total laryngectomy with partial pharyngectomy, neck dissection, primary voice rehabilitation with voice procedures. And what they saw in histology was a very strongly regressively altered tiny residual carcinoma. And before they had T3, and after that one cycle at least, the pathologist um, uh, described a T1 and 0 lesion. Then they went on for chemo radiation. And here you see the biopsy situation, which was really amazing because it was very hard to find vital tumor uh, tissues in this case. So this was very uh, interesting to see that the combination with checkpoint inhibition really makes a difference because these traumatic situation we see not so often if we just go for chemotherapy. So that's the reason that one of the new trials we start now in our German interdisciplinary um, head and neck study group together with the European organization uh, of cancer, the EORTC, uh, we, we developed a new design after this already presented DELOS2 uh, design, we call that ELOS, and combine now the induction chemo with bemprolizumab. 
let me show you the protocol. We hope that we can start this trial this year. The idea is if we have advanced laryngeal and hypopharyngeal carcinoma, and there is an indication for total laryngectomy on the one side, and on the other side, the patient is suitable for laryngectomy. And if CPS, that is uh, the combined positive score of PDL1 expression in tumor cells and surrounding tumor tissues, if that value is more than one, then this is a good patient for that trial. And we start with two arms after randomization. The one arm has a short induction with uh, taxol, platin, plus pemprolizumab. And the other arm is only like in Delos 2, uh, the one cycle uh, taxoteria and platin. After this one cycle, we go for early response evaluation. So we do PET, we go for endoscopic surface shrinkage uh, evaluation. And if there's a good responder, we go for another two cycles and radiotherapy. And if not, we go for laryngectomy in both arms. Perhaps you remember the study protocol from the DELOS2 trial. And we think that we will see a big difference regarding bampolizumab, uh, which will be maintained for another six months. Just finally, another very interesting story regarding induction with checkpoint inhibition. That is uh, the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and you know 80% is in head and neck. And the cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, they are already much better responders to checkpoint inhibitors than the other uh, mucous membrane squamous cell carcinomas. So we are facing here more than 50% responders and in head and neck uh, mucous membrane squamous cell carcinoma, we are facing 25%. And there is an idea of starting with induction in these cases, even if there is infiltration of uh, relevant structures like the eye or the tumor is too big, we can start with induction with checkpoint inhibition and uh, Zimiplimab from Sanofi is licensed in Germany for that worldwide also. And then we check for um, whether surgery is more feasible, more suitable uh, after tumor shrinkage. For this indication, Zimiplimab is not licensed. It's only licensed for highly advanced, non-resectable and metastating uh, squamous cell carcinoma of uh, the skin. But interestingly, there are some trials running to check whether induction with this substance makes a difference. Here see the different trials and one slide of one of the trials from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. You see before and after induction a patient and um, you see a big difference of the tumor. The tumor was shrinked. The border is much better um, demarcated so resectability improved. So we think that also in that field, maybe induction will play a big role. And just to show you from one of our own patients, the effectiveness of Zimiplimab, this is an old lady with this very big tumor. And after two cycles, two cycles, you see that result. So it's really amazing how powerful these substances are. So if you ask me, pre-therapeutic induction with checkpoint inhibitors, a game changer, I would give you the answer to be serious, probably. I definitely expect that we will see a lot of new indications by using che checkpoint inhibition in induction. Okay, and we were so fortunate that Dr. Dietz was actually able to join us live in person. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have any more time for Q&A in the main webinar. If you'd be so kind as to look at the Zoom link that was placed into the chat, um, he would be happy to answer questions live in that separate lobby Zoom.
Welcome to Otolaryngology Updates 2021, 48 hours of virtual otolaryngology education. I'm Bill Armstrong, Professor and Chair, Department of Otolaryngology at the University of California, Irvine. We hope you find this educational opportunity useful. It could not be done without the close and careful collaboration among valuable colleagues across the globe. On behalf of the course chairs, Dr. Brian Wong, Professor and Vice Chair, Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Yongju Jang, Professor and Chair, Department of Otolaryngology, Asan University in Seoul, South Korea. Dr. Christian Betts, Professor and Chair, Department of Otolaryngology at uh, University Medical Center, Hamburg, Eppendorf. And Dr. Harrison Lin, by, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Otolaryngology at University of California, Irvine. Thank you for attending. Okay. So uh, welcome again, good morning. Uh, it's morning at least in uh, the West Coast of the United States. It's dinner time uh, in Germany and I think all of Asia is fast asleep. Uh, our next uh, speaker is from UKE, uh, Hamburg and it's uh, Dr. Marcus Hess. Uh, Dr. Hess is a laryngologist and also a phoniatrician. He is the co-founder of the first voice clinic in Germany, the Medical Voice Center. Uh, he has uh, many inventions, publications, and holds a patent for LED stroboscopy. He's chair of the Pan-European Conferences, a founding member of the German Society of Phonosurgery, founder and executive board member of the European Academy of Voice. He has been uh, past president of the International Collegium Medicorum Theatri, and he has uh, served in many capabilities on international boards, uh, scientific boards, and, and committees. Uh, so he's going to give a, a fantastic uh, presentation today. And uh, Dr. Hess, welcome. Hello. I'm Marcus Hess from the Medical Voice Center in Hamburg in Germany. My task today is to talk about office-based procedures. I have nothing to disclose in respect to the topic of this presentation. However, as we all are as clinicians, we are all opinionated by our own experiences. Let's acknowledge the things that were done by our colleagues in the past. The first operation in an office of a vocal fold polyp was done 150 years ago. But what has changed in the meantime? Well, I think it is the imaging, it's the use of lasers, instruments, etc., etc. But overall, I think that it is a way of accessing the larynx that is or was almost forgotten. And I think there is a good reason why we should not forget these procedures. And I will talk about some of these interventions today. First is the setting. The setting is in the office, of course. And I think that for transnasal procedures, I think we always need an assistant. Whereas if we do transoral indirect procedures, you can do that alone, but mostly we need somebody to help us. In times of corona, it is very important to protect our patients, but also ourselves. And this can be done with the powered air purifying respirator, the popper, or at least an FFP2 or FFP3 mask, or the N95 masks. And when we do transnasal interventions, we have the mouth additionally covered so that the patient, when they cough or when they throat clear, then the droplets don't go into the room. But we also have to take care of the aerosols of the room, which means that ventilation is also very important. Some of our colleagues use a perforated mask, and I think that's a good trick. Anesthesia is key for everything that has to do with um, endonasal or peroral um, endoscopic procedures. But anesthesia is actually two parts. One is the topical medication, and for this we use the lidocaine 4%, but you can also use other topical anesthetics. 
and we used no sedation. And above that, I think it's very important also to verbally calm down and reassure the patients. So let me show you a couple of ways how to anesthetize the larynx. Of course, you can spray them, but nowadays in corona pandemic times, we rather not spray, but put in the anesthetic um, directly with a squirting movement with a syringe in the nose or into the mouth and pharynx. But before we put in the anesthesia, we also want to inform the patient that when the anesthetic is inside, they will not have any swelling, although they feel or might feel they get a swelling. Swallowing is possible, but you cannot control it. And coughing is actually something that cannot be avoided. Once you put in, you instill the anesthetic into the larynx. And so we make a let's say, a good point out of that and tell the patients, listen, once you cough, it spreads over all the anesthesia into the larynx, and that is good because then every part is covered and we can do better interventions. When we use lasers, we also inform the patient that because of the lasering, there is a, a smell that is sensed from the patients, so that plume is something uncomfortable and also the laser pulses with the heat that might interfere with the intervention. So we try to keep the laser pulses, the energy levels low so that the larynx does not twitch and compress and, and squeeze and will make our intervention impossible. The verbal anesthesia is at least as important as the topical. So the patient who actually sits in front of us and looks directly to us or to somebody in the room, they want to be reassured that everything is okay. So we keep on talking continuously to the patient. We give them a timeline, tell them, listen, everything works well. And we have done 50 or 60 percent now from the intervention or 70 and 80 percent because this gives the patient the, the possibility to interact with you. So this gives the patient a feeling of being an active part and being helpful. Once in a while, which means every one or two minutes after I'm doing continuous interventions, I do a, a swallow break, which means that I ask the patient, could you swallow right now? because many patients want to suppress the swallowing, and you can su suppress that, of course, but suddenly it breaks through and then they swallow, maybe in a moment where you don't want it, so you have a controlled swallow that might be better than just one that comes suddenly and surprisingly. Then the last part is that we ask our patients, if you want me to hold on and stop and freeze, um, we ask them to lift their, their hand, their left hand, and as soon as they do that, I just stop doing any interventions. And if I don't see that because I'm looking at the monitor, then I will ask um, the assistant to tell me, and then the assistant says, stop or hand up, and then I will freeze. For transoral or transnasal interventions, sometimes it's a good advice to put a little bit more of the anesthetic into the larynx and we can do that of course with a spray or nowadays with this bent cannula where we instill the anesthetic into the larynx and then we ask the patients to do a um, laryngeal gargle so that the anesthetic goes everywhere not only to the ventricular folds but also to the vocal folds. Let's see how it looks like when we do transoral procedures. Indirect transoral in the office, unsedated patients. So number one is the numbing of the larynx. We use a cotton swab that is soaked with lidocaine 4%. You can see that the vocal folds tolerate the pressure quite well, and the triggering area is more in the posterior larynx.
This is a case of a soprano who had a lesion on the left vocal fold. She refused to have surgery in general anesthesia, so we did it in the office, transoral indirect. Nowadays, the transnasal procedures are coming more and more worldwide, and that's why we want to focus a lot of our time today on transnasal procedures. Also, unsedated patients where the nose is always anesthetized, and then, of course, the larynx as well. So topical anesthesia for nose and larynx with a syringe in corona times, of course, we have the masks we instill while the patient is sniffing like this and sucks it in through the nose and also swallows the lidocaine then the endoscope is advanced and through the working channel we instill one to two cc lidocaine four percent while looking where the tip of the endoscope is we want to instill it of course into the pharynx but also into the larynx and we can also apply the lidocaine through a catheter. That the advantage is that we use less of the lidocaine and we can more precisely point where we want the anesthesia, which is in this case endolaryngeal. So with transnasal biopsies, I think this is something for the beginners because the biopsies are mostly taken from bigger growths. And let's see how the instrument works in the working channel, but outside of the patient. And on the right side, you can see a typical situation we need three hands or even four hands to do a biopsy and the surgeon holds the endoscope with two hands and then we need an assistant, somebody who just opens and closes the biopsy forceps. Biopsies and excisions can be made on different locations, but as a rule of thumb, we can say everything that you can see can be biopsied. So on the left side, there's a cancer. So bleiben. So bleiben kann man schon. Zu. In this slide you can see how we do transnasal injections. This is a single-use injection cannula. It is 25 G um, of width, which is very small, and 5 millimeters in length, and it can go in and out in a shielded, protected mode in the catheter.
hier die so bleiben. Perfekt. Einmal kurz leicht so machen. <lacht> Gut. Nochmal. <lacht> Gut. Nicht machen, so. Gut. Nadel raus. Ja. Jetzt wieder 15. Moment. Und jetzt. Sehr gut. Nadel raus. Nadel raus. Und jetzt. Nadel zurück. Let's see a couple of examples for injections in the larynx. On the left side, it's steroids. You can see in this video how after four sessions of intralesional steroid injections, the scars will get less and less. So bleiben, ganz ruhig bleiben. Ganz ruhig bleiben. Jetzt die Strategie. Jetzt lässt. Nicht verstecken. Eins, zwei. Jetzt mehr los. So for biopsies and injections there many indications that are listed here and let's switch over to the lasers so transnasal laser surgery is actually facilitated very much with the use of different kinds of glass fibers and on the left side you can see photoangiolytic lasers and cutting lasers and the blue laser is something like a, a dual purpose laser the energy absorption of the laser light is really very much depending on the distance to the target and so this has to be trained. The laser that we like very much is photoangiolytic lasers. It was the KTP before, now it's the blue laser. It's a small little laser that is portable and it can be used in the office of course and Let's have a look in a couple of minutes um, how we do that. But on the right side, you see that there's the illumination is also again with uh, spectral light filtering. In this case, it is NBI because sometimes the contrast is better and that helps us to see the small little lesions. NBI is something that we like for many small lesions to detect. You can see how the contrast helps us to detect the little um, papilloma in this case, but it's also the vessel structure that is really something new and we're looking at more and more in detail. And sometimes it might even be pathognomonic for the detection of um, benign and for malignant lesions. So this is now um, papilloma case pre-op. Sehr gut, so bleiben. Das ist perfekt. Kommt sehr, sehr gut hin. Nicht 
nur für eben, sondern tatsächlich auch das nehmen. In this case, this gentleman on the left side had a retention cyst and he did not want to have surgery in general anesthesia, so we marsupialized the cyst in the office. This is a gentleman who had mild dysplasia on the left anterior superior aspect of the vocal fold. It was proven by biopsy and so we ablated this little lesion in the office transnasal indirect with a blue laser. This is an example of a patient who had T1 cancer of the right vocal fold, was not exposable in general anesthesia, and so we offered to take the cancer away after taking a probe some days before, and it was proven cancer, and so it was ablated in the office. If you're interested in watching how the office setting is during such an operation, I would like to advise to click on this link and at 2 hours 48 minutes you can see a couple of minutes of office ejection and at 4 hours 47 minutes you can see how we perform office indirect laser. In both cases it is transnasal indirect. So overall, with a photoangiolytic laser, fiber-guided, we can treat many kinds of benign and also malignant lesions. Let's move over quickly to the transnasal tracheoscopy. So if you have a nice anesthetization, you can have a great look into the trachea in many patients. You can also, of course, do the transnasal esophagoscopy, which is shown here.
let's just complete with the percutaneous procedures. And here we can do injections, thyrohyoid approach or cricothyroid, where you look into the larynx with the endoscope, but you do the percutaneous injection with a long needle from outside. Or also percutaneous augmentations, transoral indirect, or thyrohyoid, or cricothyroid. And with this, I would like to stop with an announcement of a workshop that we're giving in June this year, where we have many interventions and show live demonstrations. That office-based procedures are coming back. You can do biopsies, injections, laser surgery, but also other things that I couldn't talk because of the restricted time. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. That was an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Uh, do we have a, 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 a quick question? Uh, Kelly? Or I think there was one question about, do I do injections of botulinum toxin into the false vocal fold, into the ventricular fold? Yes, the answer is yes. And there was a publication many years ago by Blake Simpson and colleagues and Actually, since that time, we, we do that as a first approach and we try to spare the vocal folds. And in some cases of adductor spasmodic dysphonia, this works very well. Okay. Well, um, in, in the interest of timing, keeping on schedule, uh, uh, doc, Dr. Hess, um, I'm wondering if you can, can go uh, to, to the lobby area, uh, which is uh, posted, I believe, in the, uh, the chat or question and answer. Uh, section. Uh, if there are any other questions for Dr. Hess, uh, meet him over there, and uh, if and uh, we'll go on to the next speaker. Thanks for having me be part of this. Okay, greetings. It has uh, been uh, an absolute pleasure. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone can hear and see me. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Torsten Dorman. Uh, he's uh, actually, I believe, on this presentation, the only person that's not also boarded in otolaryngology. Uh, the, Professor Gubish was otolaryngology and plastic. Uh, uh, Dr. Dorman is a consultant anesthesiologist at the Center for Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine at UKE Hamburg. Uh, he is also a specialist in pediatric anesthesia and cardiac anesthesia um, and a, a research associate lecturer and faculty member at, at, at Hamburg. Uh, his interest is uh, in anesthesiology, especially airway management in rare uh, syndromatic diseases, especially patients that have lichrosomal storage disorders such as mucal uh, polyrysacidosis, neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis, and lipodosis. Um, and this presentation uh, is actually uh, slotted into pediatric otolaryngology because this is probably the area where airway management is, is most critical. I think we all agree on that. Uh, Dr. Dorman, uh, thank you for being uh, the sole uh, non-otolaryngologist here, and uh, we all respect anesthesiologists. We are the only specialty in medicine, I think, that, that really, really feels your pain and challenges. Thank you. Dear colleagues, good morning or good evening, depending from wherever you are watching right now. My name is Thorsten Dorman, and I am a senior consultant pediatric anesthetist at the University Children's Hospital in Hamburg, Germany. I will talk about anesthesia considerations in the management of the syndromic pediatric airway. And if we talk about anesthesia, we need to talk about critical events. One of the pediatric anesthetist's most important goals is to identify patients with increased risk for critical events and to develop necessary skills in managing urgent situations. Critical events in pediatric anesthesia are pretty common. The apricot trial, 
a large prospective multicentral trial with over 30,000 patients enrolled has shown a um, large event rate, a, large, a huge incidence of um, cardiovascular and respiratory events. And for us, uh, if we talk about the syndromic airway, especially important are respiratory events. And the respiratory events are most common in infants and preschool children with an incidence of 6%. The study has identified several risk factors and clustered into four uh, major categories. The category, categories are airway sensitivity, physical condition, anesthesia plan, and anesthesia management. All these categories were highly significant predictors for the primary outcome respiratory event. A respiratory event was defined as any critical event that um, required immediate action and otherwise could have led to um, death or serious harm of the patient. As you can see, many of the identified risk factors are highly relevant for the syndromic child undergoing um, ENT surgery. You can see handicap, snoring, ASA of more than two um, are uh, pretty common the syndromic children per definition have a handicap as it was defined as any metabolic genetic or neurologic disorder but also things like respiratory infection two weeks prior to surgery are relevant for the ENT population we have general anesthesia surgery and ENT surgery as risk factors and concerning the anesthesia management the need for intubation and the inhalative induction are also risk factors associated with respiratory events. Of note, the experience of the most senior team member was a protective factor and associated with a 3% decrease in event rate per year of experience of the most senior team member. So in syndromic children undergoing ENT surgery, we expect a high rate of respiratory events. And the goal is to identify these patients and to manage anesthesia so that the rate for critical events remains low. If we talk about the syndromic child, the first thing that comes to mind is a multitude of rare and ultra rare and often diseases, some with uh, extremely catastrophic, catastrophically difficult airways. But that is not the goal of this talk. I want to give you some insight into key concepts of how to approach and evaluate um, children with syndromic disease and how to draw some conclusions and um, um, make an anesthesia plan. So we will start with the most important syndromic disease and that is Down syndrome, in my opinion. Why is Down syndrome the most important one? Well. It is the most common syndromic disease with one in every 700 birth. And it leads to frequent consultations of pediatric otolaryngologists and subsequent indications for surgery. That means every pediatric anesthetist will have to treat patients with Down syndrome regularly. Down syndrome patients suffer from multiple airway alterations which affect anesthesia management and they suffer from cardiopulmonary manifestations, such as heart defects, ASD, VSD, or pulmonary hypertension, which can limit the cardiorespiratory reserve in case of an unexpected event. The generalized hypotonia is also an issue because especially the reduced tone of the pharyngeal muscles leads to upper airway collapse, and therefore it may be relevant for anesthesia. Many of these patients exhibit an obstructive sleep apnea with a prevalence reported as high as 64%, uh, uh, between 34 and 61%, depending on what cutoff you use uh, for the diagnosis. And last but not least, cervical spine instability. These patients have a risk for subluxation of the craniocervical junction 
um, which uh, means that we have to be careful in manipulating the head of these children. On the left side, you see a schematic uh, overview of the unaltered airway, uh, and on the right side, the uh, airway alterations in the Down syndrome patient. We have a retrognathic mandible, which means that conventional laryngoscopy can be difficult due to a suboptimal uh, optical axis and problems visualizing the larynx for intubation. Mid-phase hypoplasia, large adenoid pad, large tongue, all lead to upper airway obstruction and consecutive sleep apnea and recurrent respiratory infections, which are all risk factors for critical events as you have seen. But we have also alterations um, in the lower airway like high incidence of subglottic stenosis with strider um, or tracheo or bronchomalacia, which may uh, be a problem for intubation. So what are possible anesthesiological implications? In the preoperative management, we need to perform proper airway assessment uh, and be careful in the use of sedatives without monitoring, as that may aggravate the collapse of the upper airway and lead to apnea and hypoxemia. During induction of anesthesia and airway management, we anticipate a difficult mask ventilation uh, due to the upper airway alterations. And due to the increased secretions, the respiratory infections, um, which are both risk factors for functional problems like bronchospasm or laryngospasm, the inexperienced anesthesia provider should avoid inhalative induction as that is another risk factor for such functional problems. I tend to use a larynx mask whenever it is possible to avoid endotracheal intubation due to the lower airway alteration. And if endotracheal intubation is necessary, I use a smaller tube than usually anticipated, half or full size smaller with um, a cuff to avoid um, air leakage due to the tracheomalacia and uh, avoid injury due to the uh, stenosis. The most important problems are during emergence from uh, the anesthesia and extubation. We expect upper airway obstruction due to airway collapse and secretion in almost every child with Down syndrome um, after surgery. The problem is that nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airways, which are the possible solution, are often not uh, possible due to surgical reasons. But we need to take our time, provide CPAP via mask and jaw thrust or uh, uh, put the child on the side uh, to uh, cope with the situation and provide these measures until the child has recovered enough uh, to go to the post-operative care unit. I use short-acting myorelaxants as the pharyngeal muscles are typically um, most sensitive to the myorelaxant and um, if you don't use the reversal and the child uh, is still paralyzed, there may be aggravation of the aforementioned problems. And we expect the prolonged post-operative recovery. So that is one example of how to approach a child with a um, syndrome, how to evaluate the situation, and how to come to some anesthesia conclusions, how to manage the child. I will now use mucopolysaccharidosis and mucolipidosis as an example of much more complicated um, diseases. They are both lysosomal storage disorders, which are inherited progressive diseases um, with a low incidence of uh, in combined one in every 28,000. Specific enzyme defects lead to accumulation of different macromolecules in the tissue. And uh, there are several disease types depending on the stored molecule with different phenotypes. These diseases can be a good example 
for several airway related problems which are present in syndromic children and uh, not only in mucopolysaccharidosis but also in other syndromic children. Here you say, see the same child as on the slide before. It is a, a child with mucolipidosis type 2. And you see the typical craniofacial dysmorph dysmorphism with coarse facial features, with a large tongue, with a short and thick neck uh, and stiff neck. Um, all this in, comb in combination makes the airway management uh, extremely challenging because um, conventional laryngoscopy is almost never, almost never possible in these patients. We also have problems with upper, upper airway obstruction, obstructive sleep apnea, and organomegaly such uh, uh, as hepatomegaly and splenomegaly can um, complicate ventilation further. This is another example of uh, child with mucolipidosis type 2. And here you see spine and thorax deformities. You see this extremely narrow thorax and uh, you see dental anomalies. Um, yeah, all this uh, is a problem for anesthesia management, of course, because due to the thorax deformities, we have restrictive lung disease, we have a low vital capacity and we have increased pressures for ventilation. Furthermore, the patients with mucopolysaccharidosis have a severe instability of the craniocervical junction due to a dense excess hypoplasia and have cervical spine stenosis due to deposits of the mucopolysaccharides in the craniocervical junction. Here you see the um, MRI image of an eight month old child with MPS type two and the compression of the cervical myelin. This means these patients frequently undergo decompression surgery, spine surgery, um, or stabilization surgery, which can limit the um, mobility of the cervical spine and make anesthesia even more complicated. And they are at risk for uh, spinal cord injury during reclination of the head. On the right side, you see another example uh, of a child with the mucolipidosis and the regional nephric mandibles. Not only alterations of the upper airway occur, but only, uh, also alterations of the lower airway. In panel A and B, you see the, the large tongue, the, the typical features we already discussed. And here, panel C is where it gets interesting. As you see the hypopharynx with the epiglottis, and you see the large uh, mucopolysaccharide deposits in the pharyngeal wall, which uh, obstruct the hypopharyngeal airway. There's also possible obstruction uh, in the uh, level uh, at the level of the larynx, uh, enlarged folds, vocal folds uh, uh, with. Um, here with deposits and uh, you can have even obstruction uh, of the trachea caused by uh, deposits of mucopolysaccharides or collapse of the lower airway due to uh, malaysia. So to summarize airway related problems in syndromic children, there are uh, three major categories. The first one is difficulties in maintaining a patent natural airway um, with anatomic and functional upper airway obstruction, a laryngotracheal and bronchomalacia with collapse of the lower airway, difficulties with ventilation caused by craniofacial dysmorphism, reduced mouth opening, restrictive or obstructive lung disease, and functional problems like laryngospasm and bronchospasm. The most challenging problem is, are difficulties in securing the airway, um, which may be due to difficult laryngoscopy or difficult intubation due to airway uh, alterations. 
For approaching difficult airway management, there are four basic management choices. A vague intubation versus intubation after induction of general anesthesia, non-invasive versus invasive approach, video laryngoscopy versus uh, no video laryngoscopy, and preservation of spontaneous ventilation versus the ablation of spontaneous ventilation. The two most important decisions are, can we uh, induce general anesthesia or do we need to keep the patient awake and do we need to preserve spontaneous ventilation? And to make these decisions, we need to assess the problem likelihood and the clinical impact of different problems. Patient cooperation is almost always a problem in the pediatric patient um, and especially in the syndromic patient. In adult patients, the gold standard for solving difficult airway problems is the intubation uh, in the awake patient, um, spontaneously breathing with local anesthesia and only mild sedation via a flexible optic. And this is almost never possible in children due to lack of patient cooperation. So we might have uh, come, uh, we might have the need to come up with a second best solution in children. Problems with mask ventilation or supraglottic airway placement are highly relevant because that would be um, an indicator to keep the child breathing spontaneously until the airway has been secured. If we have the combination of difficult incubation and difficult ventilation, we may run into a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation, which is uh, the most critical airway problem in uh, all of anesthesia. We already mentioned difficulties in, in laryngoscopy and in intubation due to several reasons. And what I want to mention here also is the difficulties in surgical airway access. Almost every difficult airway algorithm ends with surgical airway access if all other measures were not successful. But if you remember the child with mucolipidosis, it may not even be possible or easy to perform front of neck surgical airway access due to uh, the cervical spine, um, uh, the reduced cervical spine mobility, and so on. Difficult airway management in pediatric anesthesia is a field that um, is pretty problematic because of several reasons. The most important one is that there is low incidence of difficult airway management in the pediatric unselected population much lower compared to the adult population. That means there is not much experience in management of a difficult pediatric airway. The incidence of failed or difficult intubation or placement of laryngeal mask was estimated at around 0.9% in the APRICA trial and 0.2 to 0.5% in the PDI registry from the uh, USA. 80% of the difficult intubations were anticipated. So we had time to prepare for the problem. Nevertheless, if we look at the airway management techniques, and this is data from 2018 and 2016, there is a low percentage of advanced airway management techniques in difficult or failed intubation. In almost none of the patients uh, with failed intubation in the APRIC trial, um, a technique other than conventional laryngoscopy was used. That is extremely unfortunate because from the PDI registry, we know that the success rate with direct laryngoscopy in children with expected difficult airway is extremely low. A success rate for initial attempts of 4% and eventual success rate of only 21% is abysmally poor in my opinion. And yet there is reported adherence to this technique with sometimes five or more conventional intubation attempts. That means we need uh, to improve uh, uh, our technique. 
especially because we know that there is a high percentage of life-threatening events in patients with difficult or failed airway management. At least one major complication occurred in 20% of the cases, significant hypoxemia in 9%, and even the risk for cardiac arrest is one in every 68 patients with difficult or failed airway management. And that was exclusively due to hypoxemia. If you compare that to the incidence of 1.4 in 10,000 reported in the general pediatric um, anesthesia population, that is substantially higher. And more than three attempts for intubation were associated with significant increase in critical events. So we need to make sure that we use the optimal technique and limit the amount of intubation attempts. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. That is the key message for managing the syndromic airway. We need to evaluate the situation and anticipate problems, as I've shown you in this talk, how we do that. We need to build a team. That means we need an experienced anesthesia provider, we, but we also need immediate help in case of emergency. That means a second anesthetist available, a surgical team for emergency airway access, and so on. Good communication and good crew resource management are key uh, to managing the most complex situations. We need to make a plan. That means I am a big uh, uh, fan of standardized algorithms and we should implement standardized algorithms in every institution dealing with the difficult pediatric airway and train uh, all anesthesia providers in these measures. We should perform the anesthesia under optimal conditions. That means no remote location, no unfavorable timing. We need to plan ahead um, how we want to manage the post-operative care. For example, is ICU administration uh, after surgery necessary? And concerning the airway, there is, um, yeah, there are three recommendations. It is common sense and, uh, and also scientific consensus that preserving spontaneous breathing in patients with difficult ventilation and intubation is critical. The ablation of spontaneous ventilation is feasible only after the airway is secured or possible ventilation has been verified. That means in these patients, we need to consider intubation in deep sedation and local anesthesia. The first intubation attempt needs to be the perfect one. That means the first intubation should be performed under optimal conditions, as every attempt doubles the risk for critical events. We use a myorelaxant, and we should use video-assisted laryngoscopy for the first attempt. Study data shows a higher success rate than conventional laryngoscopy, 82 versus 21%. In more complex cases or in smaller children, it may be necessary to use fiber optic intubation with or without guidance of a supraglottic conduit, like a laryngeal mask, as this has a higher first attempt success rate than video assisted laryngoscopy. And in cases of expected significant lower airway alterations, it is also uh, recommended to use fiber optic intubation and to place the endotracheal tube over a flexible optic uh, under direct view. What is often forgotten is that the most respiratory events occur during extubation and emergence from anesthesia. That means extubation of these children requires the same prerequisites as intubation. That is some quick overview over this very complex um, theme. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention and want to close with a quotation from Martin Jör, who said, there is only one way to perform pediatric anesthesia and that is perfect in every detail. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Dornmann. Um, I think we have uh, a time for like a very short question. Uh, let me check to see what is uh, in the questions. Uh, Elaine, do you have uh, uh, the, a question to serve up? 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, do you typically in the in these syndromic patients when you bring them into the OR, do you typically use um, a short acting benzodiazepine or you avoid it in the difficult airway patients? Um, that depends on the um, assessment of the upper airway. If we su suspect uh, upper airway collapse, then we typically tend to avoid uh, pre-medications such, such as benzodiazepines. You can use clonidine, for example. Um, but most important is, um, is a calm setting. Typically, these patients are uh, accompanied by at least one parent uh, until induction of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, well, a good, good calm uh, situation and an experienced uh, anesthesia team are um, um, often the best solution for these uh, patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And do you, you actually allow the parent into the operating room or? Yes. Just, oh, wow. Awesome. That's okay. standard in our uh, institution okay. for every child. Yeah, we have the possible, the possibility and the uh, necessary uh, infrastructure. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm curious, did, did that happen during the most scary parts of uh, the COVID pandemic uh, a year ago as well? Yes. But we test all patients, all, all um, parents before I see. To, to do a quick, quick antigen test. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. That concludes the Q&A portion for this lecture. Dr. Dorman, if you're available to answer more questions, please go to the, uh, the Zoom link that was placed in the chat. And attendees, please click on the link to ask him additional questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for moderating this hour. It's great. We'll have a moderator shift to Dr. Betts. Good. 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 Okay. I have it. I have. <laughs> I have the thing running on three different systems at the same time. Okay. So um, welcome back from my side. Um, we have a a lot of more very interesting talks to come up for the last, let's say, fifth of the meeting. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to be the moderator of the next hour. As you can see, it, it darkens in Germany now. So, so we, we, um, we are already Sunday evening time. Um, and the first speaker um, of this hour is going to be um, one of the consultants from my department. Uh, it's Dr. Hoffmann. Um, she did her residency also at the Hamburg University Hospital, um, and she is a, a specialist in, uh, in rhinology, both conservative, including uh, allergology uh, specialist and, and, and also therapeutic, meaning operative, and she's going to give a talk on the role of biologics, brave in a world question mark. Thank you very much. My presentation is pre-recorded, so it should start any second from now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is great pleasure for me to be invited to speak in front of such an international audience today about the role of biologics and the important question, if it is a brave new world in rhinology. Let me start about my conflict of interest with Novartis and Sanofi for lectures, accommodation and travel expenses, as well as advisory activities. The outline of my presentation will be the following. First, I will introduce you to the different biologics, then the EPOS guidelines, after that the efficacy and who should be treated. And in the end, I would like to show you three different case reports from our clinic. There are different treatment options for patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Conservative options, surgical options, and since a couple of years, we have new options with biologics. I think it is very important to exhaust the conservative possibilities with either intranasal or oral corticosteroids, or in some cases, the treatment options with oral antibiotics. If you don't have any success with the conservative treatment, you can skip, of course, to the surgical part with endoscopic sinus surgery. 
on those pictures, you can see me and my friend, also an ENT doctor in another university hospital at the um, skull base course in Barcelona. And on the lower picture, it's me performing an, a navigation guided sinus surgery. In some of those cases, you don't really have success, although you have done a very good surgical, a, a very good surgery. And in those patients, you have new options, hopefully with biologics. There are five different possible biologics for chronic rhinus sinusitis with nasal polyps. First, there's dupilumab. Dupilumab acts by blocking the alpha chain of the interleukin-4 receptor, and thus two key cytokines of the Th2 immune response, interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. Dupilumab is injected every two weeks subcutaneously with a dose of 300 milligram, and it has been approved 2019. The second one is omalizumab. It is a recombined humanized uh, monoclonal antibody against IgE. And as an anti-antibody, it binds and neutralizes the IgE type antibodies responsible for triggering the allergic reaction. It is injected every two to four weeks subcutaneously, depending on the total IgE and weight, either 75 up to 600 milligram. And it has been approved 2020 in Germany. The interleukin-5 um, antibody is uh, mepolizumab and is humanized monoclonal antibody. It recognizes and blocks interleukin-5, a signaling protein of the immune system. It is injected every four weeks, subcutaneously, 100 milligram, and there is only the phase three study. Then you have benralizumab. It is also a monoclonal antibody. It is directed against the alpha chain of the interleukin-5 receptor CD125. It is injected every four weeks, some, some cases every eight weeks, subcutaneously 30 milligrams and also in a phase three study. And the last one is Reslizumab, injected every four weeks IV, and there is no phase three study. Reslizumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody against interleukin-5. So what about the approval for chronic rhinus sinusitis with nasal polyps? I tried to find out with um, Novartis and Sanofi about the different countries. So dupilumab is approved in Europe, in Germany, and Finland in 2019, Italy, Austria, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Russia in 2020. In the US, also 2019, in Canada and Brazil, 2020, and in Asia and different countries also in 2020. Omalizumab is being approved in uh, um, Europe in 2020, as well as in the USA. And in Brazil and Costa Rica, it has just been approved in January 2021. For the re reimbursement, it is similar in the listed countries, as I was told by Novartis and Sanofi, but in most countries, patients are still admitted to bigger centers for the evaluation and prescription. So which patient should we consider for biological treatment? The EPOS guidelines show the following criteria and the following kind of um, treatment options. So the presence of bilateral polyps in a patient who had sinus surgery to indicate a biological treatment for them, you have to require three criteria, And those are the followings. Either the evidence of type two inflammation with the tissue ears of over 10 per high power field or blood eosinophiles of over 250 or the total IgE over 100. Then you have the need for systemic corticosteroids or you have a contraindication to systemic corticosteroids with over two courses per year or long-term low-dose steroids. Then the third criteria is the significantly impaired quality of life, meaning you have a SNOT score um, over 40. The fourth one is the significant loss of smell with an anosmic smell test. 
and you have a diagnosis of comorbid asthma, asthma needing regular inhaled corticosteroids. So three of those you definitely have to require to fulfill the indications for biological treatment. Defining the response to biological treatment. Usually you see the, you start with the biological treatment and you see those patients after 16 weeks and then you evaluate. Is there excellent response, moderate response, poor response or no response? And just depending on the response, either you continue the treatment or you discontinue the treatment. So how is the efficacy and the risk of biological treatment in um, those patients? The data from clinical trials in um, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps are four large phase three studies. They all have a very similar study design. They have a high number of participants. And here on the right side, you can see both um, studies, the one is um, the first one is the one um, with dupilumab, and the second one here is the one with um, omalizumab. They both show statistically, statistically significant reduction of the nasal polyp score and the nasal symptoms in all studies. On the other side, I tried to find out about the efficacy and risk of surgery and the revision rates. There is a big meta-analysis of 45 studies with 34,220 patients after sinus surgery for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. The observation period were, were 89.6 months, so about seven and a half years. And revision surgery was performed in almost 20% of those patients. So to look at the patients, who had to have revision surgeries. Most of the patients had AFRS or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. Some had asthma. If you see 22.6% uh, um, of the revision surgery patients with asthma versus only 8% in non-asthmatic. And 26.4% um, had previous polypectomy, so the history of revision surgery. So I just would like to show you that, um, of course, on the one side, the uh, studies show very interesting uh, results for biologics. And um, as a surgeon, you still think, well, surgery is the perfect option for my patient. But of course, in those patients, you also see often that you have to perform revision surgery. So the next slide, I will show you how we do it in our hospital. First, we will take the medical history and the examination. Then we do the basic diagnostics and we do the endoscopic recording of the NPS score. Then we do the olfactometry with the sniffing sticks, the lung function diagnostics, and then labor laboratory testings with differential blood count, total IgE and ECP. And in those patients who had um, previous surgery, we also do the pathologic counting um, uh, for the uh, EOS per high power field. Then the patients have to fill out questionnaires and um, we do the staging of the um, CRS VNP. So the VAS score, the SNOT score, the AT ACT score, and um, the Lund McKay score. So now I would like to present you the three patient cases. The first patient is a 55 year old female. She presented at um, our hospital um, from an, um, with five previous um, endoscopic sinus surgeries for a chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. She has an asthma, which is reasonably well controlled, inert. The desensitization was stopped because of GI problems and lack of clinical effects. The medication were intranasal corticosteroids, ICS, LABA, and Montelukast. So the nasal endoscopy showed an MPS score of eight. The SNOT 22 was 101. 
And the total IGE was only 13.2. The ECP 53, the FE4 one was 68% and she didn't smell at all. Here on the right side, you can see the um, CT scan of um, her sinuses and you see everything was totally filled with polyps. So she had a, a lump McKay score of 24. In this case, we decided we will do revision surgery. Also, um, this patient was already, um, uh, we, they already performed um, surgery five times before. Here on those pictures, I would like to show you how the nose looked inside. So it was fully plucked with nasal polyps. You couldn't really go through, you didn't see anything. And even if you looked through the mouse, you could see in the nasopharynx already polyps. And the patient was really in a bad shape. And she said, well, this is not really a good life right now for me. So I performed um, navigation guided revision surgery and tried to open up all the, the correct ways to the sinuses and um, help the patient um, getting much better. But the post-operative control showed after three months, she already had again an NPS score of four and an olfactometry of zero uh, out of 12. For a short term, she was better, but this really didn't last very long. And this is what she told me um, when she showed up the first time at our outpatient clinic, that after those last surgeries, she didn't really have a long time period of feeling better. So in this case, we decided, well, we have to start with a biologic and we start with dupilumab every two weeks. The current findings in this patient are an NPS of one, an FFO one of 88, a SNOT of 22, only of six, and an olfactometry of nine out of 12. So you can see this patient is really a lot better coming from a SNOT of 110 now down to six, and an olfactor of zero nine to, um, of, out of zero to nine now. Here I show you a video where you can see it doesn't look all perfect inside of the nose, but she is really happy and she, she doesn't complain about any problems right now. So what we learned from this case or how we might handle those cases in the future, probably in this case, I would start with a biologic and see how this patient responds to the biologic th therapy. Although she has a very high NPS score, but we might bypass revision surgery, which definitely has a risk of complications after five surgeries or our surgery should have been more aggressive. Those are the two questions uh, we address. But I think in the near future, if I see a patient like this again, I would probably start with some biologic first and see how um, she responds to the biologic. The second case is the 38 year old female patient. She had nine endoscopic sinus surgeries for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Her last surgery was in September, 2019. She has asthma, she has a NERD, also, her desensitization was stopped because of GI problems and lack of clinical effects. She has multiple allergies. Her um, medication is only intranasal corticosteroids. So her nasal endoscopic uh, endoscopy was not too bad, but it was still an NPS was four. Her snot was 83. Total IgE 1,369. ECP of 26 and FFR1 of 72 and olfactometry of eight out of eight out of 12. The lump McKay was 24. The therapy we decided is also dupilumab. Um, why dupilumab? Um, with a total IgE of 1,369, it is not really satisfying with Solaire because of the um, doses you have to give. I will show you later. Uh, an overview of um, Xolair and the treatment uh, depending on the total IgE. 
So this patient um, received dupilumab every two weeks. She is now in the treatment for about a year. And the current findings are an NPS of one, an FFO1 of 86. The SNOT um, is down to 44. Um, her olfactometry um, is improved and the total IgE is 569. She, um, I show you first the video when she first presented at our clinic. We can see there's a lot of mucus, um, the polyps are there. It's not really infected, but it's still, everything is very plugged up and lots of secretion. The patient was very happy um, for about a year. And um, in January, she presented again at our hospital and says, well, it's a little bit getting worse and I have pain, especially on the left side of my sinus. So that's the reason why I performed another um, DVT scan. And here you can see it looks much better, but there's still a little bit of blockage um, on the left um, um, etmoidal, uh, etmoidal sinus, as well as, as the frontal sinus. And um, maybe this is the problem. And I don't know if we will optimize that with continuing the treatment with dupilumab. But I told her we will continue for another three months and then we will see how she is feeling and um, if it's getting worse or if it is stable. Here on the video, I will show you how it looks now. It is much better, it's much less secretion but it's still not optimal. So what can we learn from this case? I'm not for sure yet. So if we should perform revision surgery or if we should just continue the treatment with dupilumab and what will ha really help the patient. So I would like to show you on this case, it, she was very, very happy for a year. And since a couple of months, it's getting a little worse again. So maybe um, dupilumab is not working anymore. Maybe we have to switch the biologic, see if another one is working, or we even have to do revision surgery in this patient again. And the last patient is a 29-year-old female patient. She has a medical history of five endoscopic sinus surgery for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. The last one was last year in July. She has no allergies. She only takes intranasal corticosteroids. Her nasal endoscopy showed an NPS of four. The snot was 56, total IgE 111, ECP 26. And um, from the last surgery in July, we have over a hundred years per high power field. And the FEV1 was 72, and her olfactometry was 4 out of 12. After that surgery, she presented very, very shortly with um, a picture of, oops, sorry, with a picture of um, that, as you can see. Lots of polyps again. Here I show you a video, how it looked inside of her nose. It's also lots of polyps, secretion, and she was not really happy. She told me she wants to, wanted to become pregnant very shortly in the next um, few years, so that I decided I prefer giving her Xolair um, because it is um, there are more studies about Xolair and pregnancy than with dupilumab. She gets Xolair every four weeks after this um, uh, doses. So here on the, um, you can see her um, uh, IgE on this side, the total IgE. And on this side, um, you look for the, the body weight. And then you, um, you can decide on um, this case, well, okay, she's weighing between 50 and 60 kilograms and she has an IgE of, for example, 300 to 400. And in those patients, you um, give her 450. If, um, if the IgE is a little less, it's only 300. And in her case, it's 300 milligrams and it's every four weeks. Those ones with higher IgEs, they get um, Xolair every two weeks. 
The patient is also quite happy. She has an NPS now of one, the snot is 32. Her FEV1 improved and also her olfactometry improved. Here's a video from the last visit where you can see the, uh, the polyps are getting less and the secretion is also improving. So not much secretion anymore. So who should be treated with biologics? Patients with severe and uncontrolled CRS VNP. Add on to continuous treatment with intranasal corticosteroids. And of course, you have to control the clinical effects of biologics. And if you don't really see an improvement, consider switching to a different biologic or rescue surgery if it's not effective. At one of the conferences I attended, I heard a very interesting quote. So when you hear a surgeon telling his number of performed cases divided by two, when he tells about his complication rate, rate multiplied by two. I thought that's quite interesting and um, probably also um, something to laugh about, but um, I still think you really have to think which patient should be treated with surgery and will benefit from that and which patient should get the treatment with biologics. So to conclude, um, I can only say biologics are definitely a new option in treating patients with severe uncontrolled chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. But always remember that a lot of patients are healed or at least have a long period without sinus problems with a good performed sinus surgery. So having that in mind, I was hopefully able to give you a good overview about the new possibilities in treating those patients. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now open for questions and answers. Thank Perfect. you, Dr. Hoffman. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hoffman. Um, it's funny to, to speak with you in English because <laughs> we see each other each day and talk in German. But um, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the topic has raised lots of questions. So supposedly it's a very, uh, it's a topic that interests a lot of us. Um, I will go through the questions as far as we get. Now there's eight questions. We won't probably make all of those, but you will have the time hopefully to answer the rest in the, in the breakout session. So um, the first, I guess, is, is pretty important. And um, uh, especially in, 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 in the current times, and it says, are there considerations of using biologics during the COVID pandemic? Um, very interesting question. And um, <clears throat> actually in our hospital, we talked with Zanofi and also um, with Novartis. And they all said it's totally okay to um, give their um, biologic to the patient. But um, lots of my patients from the um, clinic, they were afraid to come into the hospital. So I decided in this time, especially last year in March, April, that I will just send them their prescription um, via post or via mail. Uh, just to make them feel better and that they don't have to come in. Only for those who have been treated for more than three months. I believe there's even some sort of official uh, statement of, uh, of, of either German or European um, platform that, that, that comments on that topic saying that you should continue the treatment um, even, even in, the, in the current situation. Um, there's, there's one more question. How often do you see patients under therapy and what kind of examination do you regularly perform? Well, we see them first um, after one month. So they get two doses, one in the hospital and the second one two weeks later um, at home when it's dupilumab and when it's Solea four weeks later. Hmm. And then we see them after three months again. And then after six months, nine months and 12 months. And um, why that? Just because of the prescription they have to get every um, uh, three months a new prescription for the medication. And um, what is important which right now, we try that after one year, we send them back to the um, ENT doctors in their private offices. 
they're still afraid a little bit um, of the reimbursement and the regression. But I think um, as, uh, as it's getting now a longer time that it has been approved, and um, they're more into uh, prescribing also to the patient, the biologic. Mm. We are in very tight contact with the um, private practice ENT doctors. Yeah. There's more and more questions coming in. So you will have a good time later on in the breakout. Um, I, I, give, I give you one more and then we'll, then we'll swap over. Um, and I think the answer is probably one that, that the pharmaceutical companies love. Um, uh, the question is for how long you suggest biological treatment to continue? <laughs> yeah, um, of course, <laughs> um, everybody wants to hear from Zanofi and from uh, Novartis and um, that lifelong. But mm. as I showed in the second case, um, this patient, she was totally um, feeling better and she had a very um, well-defined progress. Um, uh, but after one year, maybe it's not working anymore. So we don't really have the long time experience, but right now, of course, I and um, they should have it um, for a very long time. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's a bit of a problem. Um, and I hope that at some point we'll find some, some uh, medication that will, that will solve the cause of the disease and not only the, the, the progression of disease that would be much better, but I guess, The, the the pharmaceutical industry will not really put a lot of uh, effort into finding that. Uh, okay, that's just a critical comment. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Hoffmann. Um, you have loads of questions to come um, and you will be accompanied um, by those that post these questions to the breakout room and I will introduce the next speaker. Um, thank I you. hope I pronounce his name right. It's, uh, it's Dr. Kai Thomason. Um, I have, if you remember, I don't know, I, I've been visiting and ob observing you, you working uh, one time, uh, I think seven or eight years ago in Copenhagen. And I, and I was really amazed at your work. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Kai Thomason is, is an autologist, neurotologist um, and, and lateral skull base surgeon. And, and also a cochlear implant surgeon. And um, he has a very ex extensive uh, surgical expertise uh, of, of several decades um, and published a lot on his, uh, on his uh, experiences. He has been uh, president of a lot of, or um, president of a lot of different societies on a European and also Danish scale. Um, and he is one of the leading experts on, um, on uh, tumors of the cere cerebellopontine angle. Um, and um, as each one of us as otolaryngologists all, uh, sometimes gets these patients um, and they ask what to do, um, you, you kind of tend to wait or you tend to, to, uh, to uh, recommend surgery or, um, or radiation therapy and, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the topic of your talk um, to give you an algorithm or to give us an algorithm for the for treatment options on um, vestibular schwannoma. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Betts. Um, uh, of course, I enjoyed your visit to Copenhagen some years ago, and uh, I'm also inspired by your work, uh, definitely. Uh, this is talk uh, coming up now um, will be pre-recorded, so uh, please enjoy, and, and then we we'll, we'll join up afterwards for for Q and A. So uh, thank you for joining uh, this talk this afternoon. My name is P.K. Thomason. I'm a senior skull plate surgeon and senior cochlear implant surgeon at the University Hospital in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I'm also a professor of neurotology at the University of Copenhagen. I'm going to talk to you for the next uh, 20 minutes or so on uh, treatment of vestibular sphenomas, which is uh, centralized in Copenhagen. So we handle all patients uh, diagnosed in in the state of Denmark currently inhabited by around 6 million people. 
As you can see on the screen here, I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-worker, Sunil Stangro, uh, who's done a lot of the work behind the data I'm going to show you here today. Um, so the schedule for today is, um, uh, firstly, um, we believe that the natural history uh, of the tumor uh, in sense of growth and hearing should be the reference for any active treatment that you may embark upon. Uh, what happens when you do uh, nothing of course, nothing is not nothing but observation and counseling of the patient uh, concerning uh, tumor growth and hearing. That should be the reference for any active treatment. Next, I'd like to compare that and hold that up against results of active treatment uh, at our center, but also results of active treatment uh, reported from other centers around the world. And lastly, uh, I'd like to present to you uh, our evidence-based treatment algorithm that we practice, practice in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. Firstly, uh, of course, uh, the situation concerning larger tumors is, is, is uh, uncontroversial uh, because of the symptoms that you can see up here. Um, there's no really discussion of, of uh, that these teen tumors need uh, active treatment from a diagnosis. However, if you have a small or medium-sized tumor, an intramesal tumor or a tumor in the CPA amount to like 15 or 20 millimeters and, and no uh, compression of, of the intracranial structures, you may choose to embark on active treatment based on growth control or hearing preservation. In order to do that, um, you should always compare to what happens if you do not embark on active treatment. In other words, uh, what is the natural history of disease? And you need to know that in order to justify any act active treatment. So for that, we have in Denmark, the Danish vestibular sonoma database, which is quite unique uh, in the world as it is a national database, meaning that we do, ha we do not have uh, uh, selected cases here. We don't have reference bias and, and so on. Um, all patients diagnosed in Denmark will be referred to our center. You can see the demographics uh, here. And today I'm going to present data up till 2011, um, comprising of uh, more than 3,100 patients, um, most of them extramatal, increasing numbers intramatal, um, mean age um, 58 years. To show you a little bit of diagnostic data from this uh, material, uh, we can document that over the years, uh, we see a still increasing incidence of, of sonomas, and, and that's been documented around the world as well. So more and more patients are coming to us with a vestibular sonoma. Um, of course, we look uh, at tumor size and different other clinical characteristics uh, for these patients in order to treat them as uh, evidence-based as we can. As you can see this uh, curve here, the yellow line is the mean tumor size. Uh, and you can see back in the day in the 70s, the mean tumor size was around 30 millimeters extramatal, whereas today the mean tumor size is around 10 millimeter extramatal. So we see a decreasing tumor size over the years meaning more and more patients come to us with a small tumor. And you can see from the bars that the small tumors are intramatal tumors, or, sorry for that, or tumors very small in the CPA. The giant and large tumors are represented by the black and red bars. And you can see fewer and fewer of these patients come to us uh, uh, over the years. So what about age of diagnosis? You can see again the yellow line uh, top uh, showing that uh, the mean age in the 70s was around 50 years of age. Now it's around 60 years of age. And the white and yellow bars demonstrate that people above 70 or about 60 years of age are an increasing group uh, among our patients. We also see, as you can see in this table, that patients younger than 30 or younger than 40 have a larger tumor at diagnosis than the older uh, patients. Uh, so you can see the mean tumor size for patients of 60 to 70 years is around 14 to 15 millimeters, whereas the younger patients have a tumor of more than 20 millimeters, which is kind of counterintuitive considering uh, what you may believe is the natural history that the tumor will grow 
the older the patient gets, but that's not the fact as you can see from this table. So what about hearing? Again, the yellow line is the mean speech discrimination loss at diagnosis. So the speech discrimination loss back in the 70s was around 60%, whereas today it's less than 40%. And you can see again from the bars, the green bar showing that more and more patient come to, patients come to us with a normal discrimination or a near normal discrimination, making the issue of hearing preservation more and more relevant in today's clinic. So just to sum up on diagnostic data from, from uh, this database, uh, we find that the number of uh, tumors is increasing, probably due to increased or improved access to MRI. We see that the tumor size is decreasing, probably due to earlier diagnosis. We see that the age of di diagnosis is increasing, and we seem to find two populations of tumors, young patients with large tumors and old patients with smaller tumors. Hearing-wise, Hearing is increasingly better at diagnosis, uh, meaning that the patient probably is less and less inclined to accept even a small hearing loss. So what about the natural history? Um, and for that, we extracted data from our database on waiting scan patients. So meaning patients upon diagnosis allocated to observation strategy and repeated MRI scans. And as you can see here, uh, more than 1,100 patients for whom we had two MRI scans for 1,000 and two audiometries for 930 patients with a mean observation time of five years. Of course, this observation time is very important when you consider um, documentation of growth in an observation strategy or documentation of what happens to hearing during observation. So this is, this is an essential number in that context. So what happens to the tumor after diagnosis? We follow repeated scans. And as you can see here, the yellow line represents intramural tumors at diagnosis and showing that percent accumulated with growth uh, amounts to around 20% and that growth occurs mainly within the first five years. So only 20% over mean of five years will grow into the CPA for intramural tumors. For the extramural tumors, you can see that the occurrence of growth is higher, but still only amounting to around one third. So only one third of extramural tumors will grow after diagnosis if you follow for a mean of five years. And you can also see here that almost all growth will occur within the first five years. So to sum up on growth, Around 20% 20 20 of intermetal tumors will grow into the CPA, whereas around one third of the extrametal tumors will do so. And growth occurs almost exclusively within the first five years after diagnosis. So we did uh, back in 2014 in the European Academy of Otology and Neurotology, a persistent position statement paper on stiblosomonomas and uh, an associated systematic review on tumor growth. And this is the list of publications on observed tumors. And the conclusion overall in this systematic review was that uh, one third of the patient will, patients will show growth of the tumor after a mean of 3.3 years of observation. So more or less the same figures as we see from the Danish material. What about hearing? As you know, uh, you may evaluate hearing in different ways. The oh &S system is one way to grade hearing, um, but we are leaning more towards the word recognition score, as this is what we believe is important in relation to treatment with hearing aid. So we consider above 50% uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, preservable hearing or a hearing that can be treated with a hearing aid, whereas more than 70% of discrimination is considered good hearing. So at diagnosis, more than half would have good hearing and around 70% will have serviceable hearing and around one third will have non-serviceable hearing. And during a mean of five years observation, patients with 
diagnostic good hearing will lose hearing, as you can see here, around 40% around will lose hearing, good hearing that is. Looking at discrimination score in different prognostic groups, um, we have curves looking like this. So the green curves will show you that the, if the discrimination loss is zero percent at diagnosis, the patient on an average will keep the hearing very good over the years. So at 10 years, 70% of the patient will have kept good hearing, class one hearing. Whereas if you have even the slightest discrimination loss, groups one to 10%, 11 to 20 and 20 to 30% at diagnosis, you will lose hearing more rapidly. So it seems that zero percent discrimination loss is a, is a special group, um, which we have not really found any explanation for uh, so far. But of course, this is important in relation to, to uh, active or non-active uh, uh, hearing preservation. So to sum up on hearing, uh, more than half of the patients today will have, will have a good hearing, a diagnosis, and more than half again will preserve that good hearing during a mean of five years observation. So these are the numbers you should compare to active treatment. Can you preserve more than 60% class one hearing during, let's say, radiation or after tumor surgery at five years? And again, if the patient has a normal discrimination at diagnosis, the, this, uh, the, the likelihood of good and long preservation of that hearing is high. Again, we did a systematic review on hearing preservation during observation. And uh, these are the papers uh, that were out there at that point of time. And the conclusion was that after five years of observation, around half the patients will preserve good or preservable hearing spontaneously. So what are the results of active treatment um, in comparison to observational uh, results? If you look in the literature, uh, you will find that uh, the aim of growth control, um, uh, of course, is, uh, is, is number one for both irradiation and surgery. And for irradiation, uh, reported growth control is between 80 and 95%. Again, of course, depending on period of observation. Growth control for surgery is, of course, 100% if you remove all the tumor, which is uh, the goal for, in, for most patients. Um, but the issue of growth of residual tumors um, left behind for, for different reasons, typically in order to preserve the facial nerve, uh, you can discuss uh, growth control in, in these cases. What about hearing preservation? Reported hearing preservations in reviews systematically performed uh, in, in the literature for surgery is, a, is between 20 to 85%, of course, depending uh, hugely on the material, uh, tumor size, and, and, and so on. Whereas the reported hearing preservation for radiotherapy is, again, widely ranged from 7 to 94%. If you pool all these data, you will find that the average hearing preservation is around half, which is more or less what you find when you observe the patients. A few studies have compared different uh, treatment strategies um, and, and studied by Lin from 2005, you can see the data here, different follow-up periods. And of course, the patients are selected into the different treatment groups, which will always make a comparison like this uh, biased uh, to an extensive degree. So we should all, always keep that in mind. Uh, radiotherapy at our center, you can see results up here. So these curves are showing the probability of hearing preservation in the control group and in the fractionated stereotactic uh, radiotherapy group. Uh, and as you can see, hearing is lost uh, following radiation uh, at a rapid speed for the first couple of years and then almost exclusively during the, the following years, up to 10 years, um, no hearing is, is left. Of course, again, these uh, patients are subject to bias as the radiated patients uh, typically have larger or growing tumors, whereas this is not the case for the control patients. And again, this is uh, the problem 
uh, always at stake um, that bias of groups uh, are at play. So to conclude on hearing preservation in active treatment, we can say that observations, as you saw on the curves before, preserve hearing at least as good as surgery or radiotherapy within the time frame of, of uh, about four to 10 years. So based on that, we believe that active treatment of small and medium-sized tumors should await documented growth, especially if the discrimination loss is zero, because you are unlikely to uh, perform and have better results than the observation strategy when you do radiotherapy surgery and uh, surgery, um, uh, uh, proper surgery, or so to speak. So what about, about the facial nerve? We haven't talked about that. Um, uh, and uh, at, at what diagnostic size do we believe we should uh, offer the patient uh, immediate surgery? Well, uh, we use uh, for that purpose, the facial nerve results uh, after one year from translab surgery as, uh, as a, a guideline for that. So you can see here, um, House Brackman grade one and two are the green bars. And as you can see the tumor sizes uh, at, at the X axis, you can see that for intermetal tumors, you would have one year post-op more than 90% of good facial nerve function. And the good facial nerve function will be achieved until the tumor reach around 20 millimeters extramatal. And that's typically the size when the tumor reaches the brainstem. And then the results decline and you have the yellow bars arriving, uh, meaning that the patient has house Brackman five to, to six. So if you should embark upon surgery, you should better get in there before the tumor reaches a size of around 20 millimeter, millimeter extramatal and before it, it reaches the brainstem. So uh, what about observation um, and the facial nerve? What if uh, a patient is, is observed, the tumor will grow, and then you are performing surgery subsequently. Then the tumor is larger than it was, and does this have a price concerning the facial nerve? Uh, this uh, figure shows you that if you embark upon the operation strategy primarily, so these are patients primarily operated, with a tumor size of less than 20 millimeter diagnosis, you would have a good facial nerve result of 86% and a poor of around 1%. For the group of patients primarily observed and then operated, the number is around 80%. And this is statistically significant. So it can have a price if the tumor grows during observation in relation to the facial nerve. But if we look at the overall strategy for all observed patients, the number is 96%. So overall, for all primarily uh, observed patients, uh, you will find a better facial nerve preservation than for the group of primarily operated patients. So as a strategy, the results are better for observation. So to conclude on the facial nerve, um, we believe that the tumor should be operated before reaching around 20 millimeter extramatal. And uh, we believe that in initial observation, as you saw, um, leads to better overall facial nerve results. So now we arrived at our treatment algorithm, which looks like this in our Copenhagen center. So if you're diagnosed with a tumor, which is less than 20 millimeter extramatal, we will wait and scan after six or 12 months. So if the tumor is extramatal diagnosis, we will scan at six months. If it's intramatal diagnosis at 12 months. If growth occurs, we will offer, um, if the discrimination is more than 50%, hearing preservation surgery. If the discrimination is less than 50%, non-hearing preservation surgery, translab, or radiotherapy. If uh, no growth occurs after the first scan, we will continue to scan uh, after two, three, four, five years, so every year, and after five years, every other year, and after 10 years, every fifth year. As we saw from the growth occurrence 
curves. Growth very rarely occurs after the fifth year. And you can discuss whether or not you should follow the patient for more than, let's say, 15 years, because the risk of growth following that is almost zero. So if the tumor is more than 20 millimeter extramural, typically meaning that the tumor is approaching the brainstem and the discrimination is good, again, we offer hearing preservation surgery. And if the discrimination is poor, we offer non-hearing preservation surgery. So that's the, what we believe is as best possible an evidence-based treatment algorithm uh, as we practice this in, in, in Denmark. So thank you all for listening today. For the final slide here will show you take-home uh, messages, um, which uh, would be that one-third of tumors do not exhibit growth after diagnosis. On average, hearing is preserved equally well between observation and active treatment meaning that observation is a risk-free option. And based on that, we believe that active treatment should await documented tumor growth. And finally, uh, we believe that from the facial nerve results, uh, primary surgery should be advised when the tumor is around 20 millimeter or more extramural reaching the brainstem. So thank you for listening today. Thank you very much. Um, a great talk, um, especially because you have such a such a vast amount of uh, of observed and and treated tumors that um, that there's no no comparative uh, group in the world, I guess that that can comment uh, uh, with uh, with an expertise in the same on the same scale. Um, so I. I have one question myself, and there's a few questions coming up. Um, we have five minutes, which is good, before we have to hand on to the next, uh, to the next moderator and the next talk. Um, my question would be, do you see a role for cochlear implantation um, in patients that lose their hearing due to, due to surgery um, of, of uh, vestibular schwannoma? And, and where in your algorithm would you fit that in? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, we have been performing and other centers have done that as well. Um, when you do translab surgery, mm -hmm. and you may preserve the cochlear nerve. Of course, you lose the acoustic hearing, but if you have a preserved cochlear nerve, you, you may do a cochlear implantation at the same session or later on. And the results of those uh, cochlear implantations in these patients are um, reviewed to be a benefit for around two thirds. So one third would not gain from that cochlear implant, one third would have a good result and one third would have a, a medium result. Okay. And, and so that's uh, operated patients uh, trans lab. If you fail hearing preservation surgery, uh, you, will, you would have the same results. You may also implant on an observed patient or a, a, an irradiated patient, and those results are equally surprisingly good. So actually cochlear implant has changed the game for these patients uh, based on the fact that single-sided deafness is an indication in, in a number of centers around the world. Uh, okay. of course, this is especially the case if the patient has poor contralateral hearing. Mm. But even for single sided patients, this, this is a new option. Yeah, okay. Especially in NF2 patients, you think? Yes, definitely, because they usually have a hearing problem contralateral. Mm. Okay, that's, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's one question from probably someone from the United States, um, and, and it goes as follows. Um, as you know, studies from the United States have shown about 50% growth over time. Why do you think there's a difference between US data and Danish data? Well, I think the obvious answer is uh, selection bias. Uh, and I think that's the main value of, of our data, that, that it's a national data set. So we have no selection bias of patients. Uh, I think that's, that's the major reason. Of course, you may discuss how you determine tumor growth. 
um, would you have one millimeter or two millimeter or, or which criteria would you have for growth or would you use volume based estimation or linear measurement uh, estimation and we are, are fairly conservative as it has been shown that the inter-individual error of measurement is up to two millimeters so we say you should see a growth of more than two millimeters to be able to determine surely that it is growth and not error of measurement. But again, um, uh, if you look at volume based uh, estimates for tumor growth, you find higher numbers. Yeah. At the end, uh, you should consider what is clinically relevant. Um, should you base your treatment only on growth or should you base your treatment on what is clinically relevant or what is dangerous to the patient if the tumor grows? Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting question also uh, in relation to the size of the tumor in itself. Should we treat all growing tumors uh, or should we say if the tumor is very small and growing, we could leave it. And if the tumor is larger and it's growing, we should actively treat. So mm -hmm. that's, that's an ongoing debate, I guess. Yeah, that's true. One, one last question for Q&A here before we, um, we would like to ask you to go to the breakout session and, um, uh, and answer the rest of the questions. Why is radiation not an option for uh, more than 20 millimeters extra meatal growth? Well, at our center, that's, that's more or less the limit because uh, the tumors uh, would, would typically be very close to the brainstem and have an, an intimate relation to the brainstem over quite a, an area, yeah. meaning that the brainstem is at risk when you radiate. Um, okay. And, and it's, that, that is probably different from center to center, how, how large you would uh, dare to do the radiation. Um, in our center, they started out quite uh, boldly, but now uh, they are more conservative as they see damage to the brainstem if they radiate a tumor of, of, of a size of 20 millimeter plus. But it depends again on what are the conditions in the CPA? Yeah. What are, is the space sufficient? Uh, is it very uh, intimate related to the, to the brainstem? So I don't think you should take those numbers at 20 millimeters all too rigorously. Um, okay. It depends again on the patients. Okay, thanks so much. Um, we will have to continue. So if you would be so kind, Dr. Kaye Thomason, to click on the, on the Zoom link that was just provided in the chat and go to the breakout session and you will, uh, you will probably be asked some more interesting questions. Thanks a lot for your talk. It was great to hear from you. Um, and we all enjoyed that a lot. Um, we will continue with the next session. And I hear the moderator is Dr. Zong. But um, the first speaker uh, is going to be introduced by, uh, by Dr. Wong. You're still muted, I guess. Greens, uh, Christian, <laughs> like you, and uh, in multiple places. Uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, Hosam Foda. Uh, Dr. Foda uh, was going to actually be the keynote speaker at the rhinoplast, the greatest rhinoplasty meeting ever that was canceled by COVID uh, in, in uh, uh, Orlando. Uh, so we have him here today. Uh, doc, Dr. Foto is a uh, specialist with the open structure technique. He's quite unique in that uh, he does not use rib uh, as much as the rest of us uh, uh, sometimes do. And he's an absolute magician with the use of auricular cartilage where he can do things that I don't think anyone else can do with auricular cartilage with an amazing outcomes. And Dr. Foda is a professor uh, at uh, Alexandria. Uh, he trained there as well. He also uh, had a, a seminal two-year fellowship uh, in Texas and, and had worked closely with, with Russell Crydell. Um, Dr. Foda, I, I should also mention, is going to be also having and hosting uh, an Egyptian rhinology rhinoplasty meeting uh, next week. So those of you that are interested, I'm sure he'll have some information on that. Uh, Dr. Foda, welcome. Hi, Brian. Hello. Pleasure. We can hear you. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Great. Should I share my screen? Um, if you're going to do live, please share your screen. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction.
And here we go. So my screen is on, right? Absolutely. Okay, thanks for the invitation and I'm honored really to be part of this elite group of rhinoplastic surgeons in your meeting. And ancient Egyptians were always obsessed with structure, whether pyramids, temples, wherever you go, there are huge structures. And the structuring materials they used had th these three options, whether mud brick, stones, or granites. And regarding the structure and material options we have in the nose, we have septal cartilage and ear cartilage and rib cartilage. Septal cartilage, of course, is our first choice because it's already in the field and you can find a lot of cartilage in the septum if the patient wasn't operated before. And when I go for septal cartilage, I try my best to get this piece of cartilage from right on top of the maxillary and palatine crest, because this is the most thick part of the septal cartilage. So it can give you excellent tip support in cases of missing caudal septum. Now, my second choice is ear cartilage. And you can get ear cartilage either anteriorly, you do a curvilinear incision on the antihelical fold, and then I cut my cartilage one or two millimeters below the skin incision. So this piece of cartilage will support the scar, it would look better. And then you dissect the cartilage posteriorly, separate it, and leave at least half a centimeter here to support the posterior canal wall. And I like to take the whole perichondrium with me. If I'm going through a posterior approach, I go through a post-auricular incision above the post-auricular sulcus, and I dissect my way. And with your middle finger, you can feel exactly where the antihelical fold is. And behind the groove of the antihelical fold, you make your cut in order not to deform the external ear. And if you cut the skin, your finger will also be injured. So that's a warning sign. Keep your finger in the conca and remove the whole conca. Again, that's the amount of cartilage you can get from both ears, which is a huge amount of cartilage you can build the dorsum and the tip support with. My third option is rib cartilage and we all know the advantages and disadvantages of rib cartilage. It can give you enormous amount of cartilage to build everything with, but there is the risk of warping. And the risk of warping exists in any rib cartilage case. And of course, scarring. I see horrible scars from the harvest of rib cartilage, although I have good friends of mine who take the rib cartilage through only one or two centimeter scars. So what are you gonna do? And what are the areas that need structuring in revisions? The nasal dorsum, the nasal tip, and the ailer lobule. These are the three main areas that need to be structured. To augment the nasal dorsum, you can, get, you can augment it with solid cartilage, either from the ear or from the rib. I will concentrate on the ear, or you can do diced cartilage wrapped in fascia, or free diced cartilage, or you can use implants and fillers. These are the options of your dorsal augmentation. Of course, you have to avoid all kinds of foreign materials like solid implants and permanent fillers or even absorbable fillers. I'll, see, I'll show you a lot of complications from fillers. This is an infected case from just hyaluronic acid. This is a permanent filler, which is bioalkamide, it forms a granulomatous reaction in the nose. So you have to remove all this granulomatous tissue and then build everything again. This is HA, which is easily extracted because it's encapsulated. So you can just suck it out. But again, it is not risk-free. You can see this patient was injected by HA and he got embolization and skin loss. So there is no safe injection or filler material in the nose. If you decide on using a solid implant like this rib, carved rib, it gives excellent augmentation. 
if it stays straight, the result would be perfect. But sometimes it displays and sometimes it gets deformed, which we call warping. And you can see, even with ear cartilage, if you use a solid piece of ear cartilage on the bony dorsum, it can give the deformity because with time it curls and you can see the borders of the cartilage. So I use solid ear cartilage only in the cartilaginous part of the nasal dorsum, like in this case of cartilaginous saddle, it can give excellent augmentation and the borders will blend with the surrounding tissue. So there will be no demarcation lines. Again, cartilaginous saddles, excellent augmentation with solid ear cartilage. Now the other option is wrapping diced cartilage in fascia. So you can dice the cartilage and wrap it in temporalis fascia or rectus abdominis fascia, whatever you prefer. And this is the end product. And you, you remove the rib and replace it by a DCF graft. And the DCF will never warp. This is a DCF that I took out after three years. And you can open up the fascia and you can see every bit of cartilage holding together by fibrous tissue. All the diced pieces are viable and the wrapping temporalis fascia is again viable. So this graft is there to stay. It won't get resorbed. Free diced cartilage is another option that I use a lot these days. I can use my Aufrecht retractor as a template and I will fill it up with these diced cartilage pieces and then I compact them and then I need some material to hold these pieces together. I used fresh blood drawn from the, the patient. And then I will test my implant if it, for, for the clotting. Usually it takes two to five minutes for the implant to clot. And then you get one chance of introducing it in. Otherwise, all these pieces will be spread on the operating table. So. You raise the flap, you introduce your offrich deep enough till it reaches the radix, and then you drop this composite graft, which is blood and diced cartilage. You come out with not one piece of cartilage, and that's the last step of your operation. So you have to close, and all this is diced cartilage in blood. Now, this is the 12 month follow-up of the patient, and you can see she's a revision case, and she has excellent augmentation of her nasal dorsum and good dorsal lines just by diced cartilage. You can see the difference between the pre and post-op. Another revision case is with, a, with an over-resected dorsum, and that's one and a half year after diced cartilage in blood with, again, good augmentation. And that's a three-year follow-up using the same technique of diced cartilage with, mixed with blood. Now, the internal nasal valve is another area where I use ear cartilage to augment. In revision cases, again, with collapsing or weak upper lateral cartilages, I can easily use these ear cartilages to get that spring effect to keep the middle third of the nose supported. The key thing is to reach down to the pyriform fossa and then suture the medial end. And that's the patient before and after. And you can see the middle third is wider and the spring action of the cartilage will give excellent functional improvement for the patient. The nasal tip, when it needs restructuring, the commonest problems that we meet in the multiply revised noses are either tip contour irregularities or a depressed droopy tip that loses its support. So when it comes to the tip contour irregularities, it is usually secondary to weak cartilages that, that were not supported enough. 
So the healing forces will pull the cartilage in every possible direction and it will give you all kinds of tip contour irregularities like in these cases or revision cases with tip contour irregularities. To classify these irregularities, there are either deep fissures on each side of the nasal tip or deep facet, which is a depressed area, which we commonly find in the soft tissue triangle, or a pinch tip, which is so narrow, following vertical dome divisions, or a bossa formation, which is a knob or a, a sharply angulated dome pulled away from the midline, whether to the right or to the left. Now, this is a patient with tip contour irregularity. You can see the infratip redundancy, the deep facets on each side of the nasal tip. I took ear cartilage again, covered that with a camouflage layer, which is from the perichondrium of the ear again. And that's the result at one year. You can see that the patient has a smoother looking tip no sharp edges, no deep facets, simply no operated look. Another case, totally deformed tip with contour irregularities. You can see how smooth and more symmetric the tip can be made just by using a double layer ear cartilage to support the nasal tip and a cap graft used uh, forms of ear cartilage again. Even the columella got more straight and more central. All kinds of tip contour irregularities in multiply operated cases. You can make them look much better just by using ear cartilage and perichondrium to cover that ear cartilage. Now, soft tissue triangle deformities can spoil any rhinoplasty, and the commonest risk factor is this wider vertical domal angle. This is the horizontal domal angle that we all know. But this is the vertical domal angle between the intermediate crust and the lateral crust. It can get wider by a vertically oriented lateral crust, or it can get wider by a hanging middle crust, which is a hanging infratip lobule. So we can use grafts in this area, solid grafts, either a simple graft or an extended graft, or we can use diced cartilage and inject it in this area. And you can see here the diced cartilage prepared and being injected at the end of surgery in the soft tissue triangle when we have a facet or a depression in this area. After that, you can either put surgery cell or take a 6-0 micro repeat suture to close this part of the marginal incision. And that's the effect of the diced cartilage in the soft tissue triangle area. It would fill it out. It will give a smoother contour, rounded soft triangles, look much better than the deep facets of the soft triangle. The bossa formation is another tip contour irregularity. You can see the bossa after revision cases, sharply angulated domes, which is pulled away from the midline. You have to undermine the cartilage totally from the vestibular skin and from the overlying dorsal skin. And then you put a strong midline support and suture everything to it and then you can add a camouflage graft. This is one kind of camouflage graft that I like. I will semi-crush the cartilage. I will leave part non-crushed, and then part semi-crushed, and then part fully crushed. So that's the way I go. So the solid piece, which was not crushed, I will use to fix the graft with. And then the rest will camouflage the domes and will overlap everything. Here, the stem of the graft is non-crushed, so I can easily suture it. And then I will turn the crushed part, the semi-crushed part, and the fully crushed part all over the domes. After equalizing the domes, 
using suturing techniques. So that way I will be able to correct most of the bossa formation, like in this case, just by supporting the midline, suturing the domes to it and putting a camouflage graft. She came from Germany with this recurring bossa twice. Again, a stronger, wider, and well-supported tip is much better than a weaker and narrower and deformed tip. The patient has to understand that. A very big bossa after three rhinoplasties, and you can see the repair using suturing techniques and grafting, camouflage grafting of the nasal tip. Now, if I failed to correct it using suturing and camouflage, like in this case, she had multiple surgeries and every time the bossa returned and the deflection. So, and the cartilages and domes are really useless. I put a double layer ear cartilage graft, as you can see, and then I will sacrifice everything. I will vertically divide, divide these useless domes. The asymmetry is too big to correct using suturing techniques alone. So I will sacrifice the domes, suture everything to my double layer ear cartilage graft. And then I will cover that with another ear cartilage cap graft, as you see. So all my structure is made out of ear. And sometimes I leave it extended to support. That's the pre and post up on the table. And that's the patient at one year. Again, the tip is central and it won't go anywhere, right or left. Now, when the alar cartilages are over resected, there's a chance that there will be supraalar pinching, alar collapse, or alar notching. You don't want to open the case and find one or two millimeter wet of lateral crura because that's the patient when they come to breathe. Unilaterally collapsed. Unilaterally collapsed. So in these cases, you have to use lateral crural grafts. And again, ear is an excellent source for lateral crural strut grafts, as you see. You can suture it to the remains of the lateral crust, and that's the patient one year later after having two failed rhinoplasties. You can see the, 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 the lateral crust is well supported. Again, a collapsed right lateral crust before and after ear reconstruction, and you can see the support and the symmetry achieved. Bilateral pinching, the concavity of the lateral crust is very manifested after two rhinoplasties. Here you can find flat and straight ala. And the transition between the ala lobule and the tip has been more smoothened by the ear cartilage grafts. Ailer notching is another problem following over resection of the ailer cartilage, you can use ailer notching grafts in mild cases like this. Again, moderate cases, it may work, but sometimes the patient refuses to have surgery and it, that's the only indication when I put a drop of hyaluronic acid. Yeah, and you can see on the spot, the improvement in the ailer rim, it would bring it down significantly. But again, that's not risk-free. This is a patient who had hyaluronic acid. It's not my patient, but that's the way I saw her. Another patient with hyaluronic acid. So embolization is a big risk. Now notching can happen with deficient soft tissue. So you can see that the inner lining is retracted. So cartilage grafting alone, ailer rim graft alone will never fix that. So I will go for a composite graft in these cases. And that's an excellent site to take the composite graft from, just under the inferior crust of the antihelix. I mark it, I take my cartilage and skin, I close it up, and that's the patient, how the scar looks. It is very well hidden in the shadow of the antihelix. But it can improve these cases of retracted ala that much. It's a huge improvement. 
It can't be corrected just by cartilage. It needs cartilage and skin. She had five rhinoplasties before, and you can see the left side is significantly notched. That's, again, skin and cartilage, a composite ear cartilage graft that gives you that amount of improvement and symmetry. The last thing is the loss of tip support. You can test it on the table, and you can find that the whole caudal septum is weak. The medial crura are too buckled. The caudal septum inside is useless. It is very flimsy. So you have to replace all that with a big caudal septum replacement graft. You can get it from the septum if you're lucky. And that's the, the caudal septum replacement graft. Suture everything to it. And that's the amount of improvement you get in support and projection and opening of the nasolabial angle. If you didn't find it in the septum, I go straight to the ear and I will double layer that piece of cartilage. I leave the perichondrium intact on one side. It will make your job easier to fold the cartilage on itself to form like a double layer sandwich graft. And then you will fix them using multiple sutures. I use PDS for that, 5.0 PDS. And this is the product that I will use to support my nasal tip. And that's the patient at one year. And this is the patient at 16 years. So you can see that the ear cartilage support is good in long term. And this is a patient with a septal abscess, a total loss of his caudal septum. And you can see at two years after ear reconstruction. 